encyclical letter qui pluribus on faith and religion by pope pius the ninth qui pluribus on faith and religion november ninth eighteen forty six the encyclical letter of our lord by divine providence pope pius the ninth to all patriarchs primates archbishops and bishops venerable brethren health and apostolic benediction we who during many years past were striving together with you venerable brethren to fulfil to the best of our powers the episcopal charge that charge so full of labour so full of solicitude and to feed that part of the lord's flock committed to our care in the mountains of israel amid the streams and fruitful pastures have been in consequence of the death of our illustrious predecessor gregory the sixteenth whose memory and whose illustrious and glorious deeds written in letters of gold on the records of the church posterity will always admire quite contrary to all our thoughts and expectations and with considerable alarm and trepidation by the hidden designs of divine providence raised to the chief pontificate for indeed if the charge of the apostolic ministry is justly esteemed and even to be esteemed one of danger and importance more particularly is it as a matter of dread in these most difficult times for the christian republic hence fully conscious of our own weakness and contemplating the most weighty duties of the supreme apostleship particularly in the present critical state of affairs we should have wholly given up ourselves to sad sorrowing and tears had we not placed our hope in god our salvation who never deserts those hoping in him and who in order to display the strength of his power chooses even the weakliest for the government of his church that all may more and more learn that it is god himself who rules and defends his church by his admirable providence our consolation is that we have as companions and helpers you venerable brethren who called to share our solicitude endeavor with every care and earnestness to fulfill your ministry and to fight the good fight hence when first though undeservedly placed in this sublime seat of the prince of the apostles we received that important charge bestowed in the person of blessed peter by the eternal prince of pastors of feeding and ruling not only the lambs namely the universal christian people but also the sheep that is the bishops nothing was more sought for or desired by us than that we might address you all with the deepest feeling of affectionate charity wherefore scarcely have we according to the usage and custom of our predecessors taken possession of the supreme pontificate in our basilica of st john lateran than we address unto you without delay this epistle in order to inflame your profound piety so that with even greater alacrity vigilance and earnestness keeping the watches of the night over the flock committed to your care and with the strength and constancy of bishops fighting against that most hideous enemy of the human race strenuously like good soldiers of jesus christ you may set up a wall for the house of israel none of you venerable brethren but must be aware that in this our deplorable age a fierce and formidable war is waged against every portion of catholicity by those men who linked in nefarious companionship not enduring sound doctrine and turning their ears from the truth dig out from the darkness every monstrous shape of opinion and endeavor with all their might to exaggerate and disseminate them amongst the people we shudder indeed with horror and are bitterly affected with sorrow when we reflect on all the monstrosities of error and the various and multiform arts snares and machinations of mischief by which these haters of the truth and of the light and most skilful artificers of fraud labor to quench in the minds of all men every aspiration after piety justice and honesty to corrupt morals to confound all rights human and divine and to render asunder to undermine nay if such a thing were ever possible to overturn from their foundation both the catholic religion and civil society for you know venerable brethren that these deadly enemies of the christian name 
miserably hurried on by the blind force of a frenetic impiety rush forward with such a rash daring of thought that with almost unheard of audacity opening their mouths in blasphemies against god they blush not openly and publicly to teach that the solemn sacred mysteries of our religion are fables and mere inventions of men that the doctrine of the catholic church is opposed to the good and advantage of the human society they even tremble not to deny even christ himself and god and the more easily to delude the people and particularly to deceive the unwary and hurry the inexperienced along with them into error they assert that to themselves alone are no the ways of prosperity and arrogate without hesitation to themselves the title of philosophers as though philosophy whose whole scope is the investigation of nature's truth should reject that which god the merciful author of all nature had with singular beneficence and mercy deigned to manifest to men in order that they might attain true safety and happiness hence with a preposterous and most fallacious species of arguing they cease not to appeal to human reason and to extol it at the expense of christ's most holy faith audaciously setting forth that it is opposed to human reason than which conduct nothing certainly more insane nothing more impious nothing in fine more repugnant to reason itself can be fashioned or thought of for although faith be above reason no real disagreement however no hostility between them can ever be discovered since they both flow from one and the same fountain of immutable and eternal truth the most excellent and mighty god and so render assistance to each other that right reason demonstrates protects and defends the truth of faith whilst faith frees reason from all errors and wonderfully enlightens confirms and perfects it by the knowledge of divine things nor is the fallacy venerable brethren less of those enemies of divine revelation who extolling with loud-sounding praises the progress or march of human things would with clearly rash and sacrilegious daring thrust into the catholic religion as if that religion were not the work of god but of man or some philosophical discovery that could be perfected by human means on men thus miserably mad the reproach of tertullian to the philosophers of his day falls with particular fittingness that they the philosophers had published a stoic a platonic and a dialectic christianity and certainly since our most holy religion was not invented by man but invented in mercy by god to man every one must without difficulty see that religion in fact must derive all its force from the authority of the same god speaking nor can in any wise be derived from or ever perfected by human reason it behooves human reason indeed diligently to inquire into the fact of divine revelation that it may be clear that god has spoken and that to him that according to the very wise teaching of the apostle he may render a reasonable obedience for who is ignorant who can be ignorant that implicit faith is to be given to god when he speaks and that nothing can be more consistent with right reason than a firm consent and adhesion to those things which shall be proved to have been revealed by a god who can neither deceive nor be deceived but how numerous how wonderful how splendid are the arguments by which human reason should most lucidly be convinced that the religion of christ is divine and that every principle of our dogmas has taken its root from the lord of the heavens on high and moreover that nothing more certain more secure more holy or which is founded on firmer principles exists to wit this faith the instructress of life the expeller of all vices the fruitful parent and nurse of all virtues confirmed by the birth life death resurrection wisdom wonders and prophecies of christ jesus her author and finisher radiant on every side with the light of heavenly doctrine and laden with the treasures of heavenly riches illustrious and distinctly marked by the predications of so many prophets the splendor of so many miracles the constancy of so many martyrs 
the glory of so many saints proclaiming the saving laws of christ gaining day by day more strength from the most cruel persecution themselves hath the cross her only banner journeyed by land and sea the whole earth having beaten down the falsehood of idolatry scattered the darkness of error triumphed over enemies of every kind she has enlightened all people all nations however savagely barbarous however diversified by disposition manners laws and institutions with the light of divine knowledge and announcing peace and good tidings has brought them under the most sweet yoke of christ all which shine forth on every side with such a splendor of wisdom and power that every mind and thought may easily understand that the christian faith is the work of god therefore human reason from these most splendid and equally solid arguments clearly and distinctly recognizing that god is the author of this same faith can go no farther but throwing utterly aside every doubt and difficulty is bound to yield every obedience to faith knowing with certainty that whatever faith proposes to men to be believed and done was delivered by god himself hence too plainly appears in what error they continue who abusing their reasoning powers and esteeming the words of god as human production dare rashly to interpret it when god himself has appointed as living authority to teach the true and legitimate sense of his heavenly revelation to establish it to settle away all controversies on matters of faith and morals with an infallible decision so that the faithful may not be carried about by every wind of the wickedness of men to the circumventing of error which living and infallible authority exists only in that church which built by christ our lord on peter the head the chief and pastor of the whole church whose faith he promised should never fail has ever her legitimate pontiffs deducing their origin without intermission from peter himself placed in his chair heirs and possessors of the same doctrine dignity honor and power and since where peter is there is the church and peter speaks by the roman pontiff and ever lives and exercises judgment in his successors and gives forth the truth of faith to those seeking it therefore the divine words are clearly to be received in that sense which this roman chair of blessed peter the mother and mistress of all churches hath always preserved whole and inviolate and has ever taught to the faithful showing to all the path of safety and the doctrine of uncorrupted truth for this is the chief of churches from which the unity of the priesthood hath arisen this is the centre and metropolis of piety wherein is the entire and perfect solidity of the christian religion in which the primacy of the apostolic chair hath ever flourished to which on account of its preeminent dignity it is necessary that all churches that is to say the faithful wheresoever found should repair with which whosoever gathereth not scattereth we therefore who by the inscrutable judgment of god have been seated in this chair of truth appeal with earnestness in the lord to your eminent piety venerable brethren that with all solicitude and zeal you may assiduously exert yourselves to admonish and exhort the faithful committed to your care to the end that firmly adhering to these principles they may never suffer themselves to be deceived or led away into error by those men who having become abominable by their pursuits under the pretense of human progress labor to undermine faith impiously to subject faith to reason and to overthrow the revealed word of god who hesitate not to offer the highest insult and outrage to god himself who hath deigned by his holy religion most graciously to provide for the good of men here and their salvation hereafter you are already well acquainted venerable brethren with other monsters of error and the frauds with which the children of the present age strive bitterly to beset the catholic religion and the divine authority of the church to oppose its laws and to trample on the rights of the sacred as well as of the civil power to this point tend those guilty conspiracies against this roman chair of the blessed peter 
on which Christ laid the irremovable foundations of his church. To this point tend the operations of those secret societies emerging from their native darkness for the ruin and devastation of the common weal, as well as sacred and social, who have been again and again condemned with anathema by the Roman pontiffs, our predecessors, in their apostolic letters, which we, in the plenitude of our apostolic power, confirm and command to be most strictly observed. This also is the tendency and design of those insidious Bible societies, which, renewing the crafts of the ancient heretics, cease not to obtrude upon all kinds of men, even the least instructed, gratuitously and at immense expense, copies in vast numbers of the books of the sacred scriptures translated against the holiest rules of the church into various vulgar tongues, and very often with the most perverse and erroneous interpretations, to the end that divine tradition, the doctrine of the fathers and the authority of the Catholic Church being rejected, every man may interpret the revelations of the Almighty according to his own private judgment, and perverting their sense, fall into the most dangerous errors. Which societies, Amulus of his predecessor, Gregory the Sixteenth of blessed memory, to whose place we have been permitted to succeed without his merits, reproved by his apostolic letter, and we desire equally to condemn. Still, to the same point tends that horrible system, extremely repugnant even to the light of natural reason, of indifference to any kind of religion, by which these impostors, abolishing all distinction between truth and falsehood, between honesty and baseness, pretend to secure eternal salvation to men of any form of worship whatsoever, as if it were possible that there should be any participation of justice with iniquity, any association of light with darkness, any agreement between Christ and Belial. To this point tends that infamous conspiracy against the sacred celibacy of the clergy, which, O oh shame, has been encouraged even by some ecclesiastics, who, miserably forgetful of their proper dignity, have suffered themselves to be overcome and drawn aside by the seductions and the blandishments of illicit pleasure. To this point tends that perverse theory of education, especially in philosophy, which in a most pitiable manner deceives and corrupts ingenuous youth, and commends to it the gall of the dragon in the chalice of Babylon. To this point tends the shameful doctrine, so especially adverse to natural right, of what is called communism, a doctrine which, if once admitted, the rights of all men, their property, their privileges, nay, the social system itself, even from its foundation, would be overthrown. Again, to this same point tend the darkly hidden snares of those who, with the outside of the sheep, but ravening wolves within, under the false and fraudulent pretense of a purer piety, of severer virtue, and with an appearance of humility enter in, mildly take, softly bind, secretly slay and deter men from the observance of any religious worship, and kill and tear to pieces the sheep of the Lord. Lastly, to this point tends, omitting other things which are well observed by and fully known to you, that most foul plague of books and pamphlets, flying everywhere and inculcating sin, which books, being ably written and full of fallacies and artfulness, are spread abroad throughout all parts, among Christian people, at enormous expense, and everywhere disseminate pestiferous doctrines, depraving the minds and souls, especially of the incautious, and working the greatest possible injuries to religion. From this overflow of errors, and the unbridled license of thinking, speaking, and writing, public manners are deteriorated, the most holy religion of Christ despised, the majesty of the divine worship scorned, the power of this apostolic see is thwarted, the authority of the church opposed and reduced to a vile servitude, the rights of bishops trampled underfoot, the sanctity of marriage violated, the influence of all power melted away 
and with so many other evils to the christian commonwealth as well as to the civil state that we are compelled venerable brethren to weep over them and mingle our tears with yours therefore in such vicissitudes of religious affairs and in such critical periods we being earnestly solicitous for the safety of the whole flock of the lord divinely committed to our care shall certainly not leave untried or unattempted any duty of our apostolic ministry by which with all our strength we may seek counsel for the good of the whole christian family but at the same time we earnestly in the lord appeal to your eminent piety and prudence venerable brethren that with help from heaven you may with us boldly defend the cause of god and of his holy church as becomes the place you hold and the dignity with which you are invested that it becomes you to fight valiantly you will understand as you are not ignorant with how many and how great wounds the stainless spouse of christ is pierced and with how fierce an assault of bitter enemies she is beset you know especially to defend and preserve the catholic faith with episcopal strength and firmness and to watch with unceasing care that the flock committed to you may be retained in that faith firmly and immovably which unless one preserves whole and uncorrupted without doubt he shall perish eternally in order therefore to preserve and protect this faith by the discharge of your pastoral duties apply yourselves diligently and without ceasing to instruct in it all men to confirm those who waver to convince those who gainsay it to strengthen the weak in faith never overlooking or enduring anything which may appear even in the slightest degree to violate the purity of the faith with no less energy of mind you should encourage in all things union with this catholic church beyond which there is no salvation and obedience towards this chair of st peter whereon the whole superstructure of our holy religion rests as on a secure foundation and with equal constancy watch over the keeping of the most holy laws of the church by which indeed virtue religion and piety do best increase and flourish and as it is great piety to lay bare the lurking places of the wicked and in them to overcome the devil himself whom they serve we entreat and admonish you that with all diligence and labor you expose to the faithful the multiform snares deceptions errors frauds and machinations of evil men and that you diligently turn them away from pestiferous books and strenuously exhort them that flying away as from the face of a serpent from the sects and the associations of the impious they may most carefully avoid all things that are hurtful to the integrity of faith religion and morals for this purpose let it never happen that you desist from preaching the gospel for by that means the christian people becoming daily more instructed in the precepts of the most holy christian law may increase in the knowledge of god avoid evil and do good and walk in the way of the lord and as you know that your ministry is the ministry of christ who declared himself meek and humble of heart and who came to call not the just but sinners leaving to us an example that we might follow in his footsteps do not fail in the spirit of lenity and meekness with fatherly admonition and advice to correct reprove entreat or rebuke in all gentleness with patience and doctrine those whom you find breaking the commandments of the lord and straying from the paths of truth and justice as benevolence is often more efficacious in correction than authority entreaty more than menace and charity more than power this also venerable brothers strive with all your energies to accomplish that the faithful may cultivate charity seek peace zealously perform the duties of charity and peace so that all dissensions enmity strife and envyings being destroyed all may delight in mutual charity and being perfectly of one mind and one feeling they may feel and speak and know the same things in christ jesus our lord 
apply yourselves to inculcate on the christian people the due obedience and subjection toward princes and powers teaching according to the admonition of the apostle that there is no power except it be of god and that to resist power of god's ordination is to draw down condemnation on themselves and therefore the precept to obey the powers that be can never now by any individual be violated without crime unless indeed the thing commanded be opposed to the laws of god and the church now as there is nothing which more incites others to piety and constantly disposes them to the worship of god than the life and example of those who dedicate themselves to the divine ministry and as the priests are so does it often happen the people are also you will in your singular wisdom perceive venerable brothers that it will behoove you to use great care and zeal that in the clergy a gravity of manners integrity of life holiness and learning may shine out and ecclesiastical discipline be strictly preserved as prescribed by the canons of the church and where it has lapsed may be restored to pristine splendor therefore as you very well know it becomes you to be wary that according to the precept of the apostle you may not hastily or lightly impose hands on any one and that you initiate into holy orders or admit to the administration of the sacred ministries those only who strictly and carefully examined and proved appear adorned with all virtues and regarded with approval by the wise may become to your diocese both of use and ornament and who declining all things which are forbidden to the clergy and lending themselves to reading exhortation and teaching may be an example to the faithful in word deed in charity faith and chastity may win reverence from all men and help to form the people's minds and inflame and excite to the love of the christian religion for it is better as benedict the fourteenth our predecessor of blessed memory said to have fewer ministers but those honest suitable and useful than a larger number of men who for the edification of the body of christ which is the church might be of no avail you are not ignorant that you ought with even greater care to inquire concerning the morals and the science of those to whom are committed the direction of souls that they as faithful dispensers of the treasures of god's grace may continually apply themselves to support and assist the people confided to them by the administration of the sacraments the preaching of the divine word and the example of good works instilling into them the precepts of the gospel and leading them into the paths of salvation you know that a clergy being ignorant or negligent of their duties the morals of the people also instantly fall away christian discipline is relaxed the practice of religion abused and all the vices easily glide into that church lest that the word of god which full of life and power and sharper than a two-edged sword was established for the salvation of souls should become unfruitful through the ministers cease not venerable brothers to demand of the preachers of the divine word that being themselves deeply penetrated with that same divine word that while well considering in their own souls the gravity of their office they may exercise their evangelic ministry not in the persuasive words of human wisdom not with the parade and vanity of ambitious eloquence but with the assistance of the spirit and the virtue from on high that rightly treating of the word of truth and preaching not their own selves but christ crucified they may announce to the people in clear and intelligible language yet in a style full of dignity the dogmas and precepts of our holy religion according to the catholic church and the fathers so that by detailed explanations of individual duties all may be turned from crime and want to piety and thus the faithful fed and nourished by the word of god may abstain from all vices practice all virtues escape eternal punishment and attain to heavenly glory in your episcopal solicitude assiduously warn all ecclesiastics 
and exhort them to consider seriously the ministry which they have received from God, so that they exactly fulfill its obligations, that they may have at heart supremely the glories of God's house, that they give themselves up unceasingly to prayer and the recitation of the canonical hours conformably to the precept of the church, with a view to obtain divine assistance for the accomplishment of their important duties of appeasing God and rendering him propitious to the Christian people. As you are not ignorant, venerable brothers, that the education of clerks is the only means of procuring good ministers for the church, and that it exercises great influence throughout the whole course of life, continue to use all your effects that young clerks may be formed, even from their tender years, to piety and solid virtue, to a knowledge of letters, to the study of the sciences, and above all, of sacred science having nothing so much at heart as to establish seminaries for clerks according to the precepts of the fathers of Trent, where they do not exist, to increase and enlarge, if need be, those that are, to give them excellent superiors and masters, and to watch over them incessantly till young clerks be educated in the fear of the Lord, in the love of ecclesiastical discipline, may be there informed to the knowledge of the sacred sciences according to the Catholic doctrine, and without any fear of error, taught the traditions of the Church and the writings of the Holy Fathers, instructed in ceremonies and sacred rites, you may add to them kind, skillful, and courageous workmen, who, animated with the ecclesiastical spirit, and formed by fitting studies, may in time cultivate the field of the Lord and diligently fight his battles. Moreover, understanding as you do, that nothing tends more to support and preserve the dignity and holiness of the priesthood than the pious institution of spiritual exercises, encourage with all your influence this salutary work. Cease not to exhort all those who have been called to the heritage of the Lord to withdraw themselves into some place proper for these exercises, so that, being freed from the distraction of external affairs and exclusively devoted to meditation on internal and divine truths, they may purify themselves from the stains contracted amid the dust of the world, steep themselves in the ecclesiastical spirit, lay aside the old man and his works, and clothe themselves with the new man, created in holiness and justice. If we have spoken at length on the subject of the education and discipline of the clergy, regret it not, for you know that there is a multitude of men who, disgusted with the variety, inconstancy, and multiplicity of errors, feel the necessity of embracing our holy religion, and, with the blessing of God, they will decide the more easily on embracing the precepts and practices of this religion when they see that its clergy are distinguished from other men by the piety and purity of their life, the repute of their wisdom, and the example set by them of all the virtues. Finally, most dear brethren, we have the consoling conviction that, kindled as you are with an ardent charity towards God and man, inflamed with great love of the church, enriched with all but angelic virtues, gifted with episcopal courage and prudence, all animated with one holy desire, walking in the footsteps of and imitating, as becomes bishops, him whose ambassadors you are, Jesus Christ, the model of all pastors, become, through your union, the form and rule of the flock, enlightening with the rays of your holiness the clergy and the faithful, having bowels of mercy, compassionating the lot of those who wander into the darkness of ignorance and error. We have, we say, the consoling conviction that you are disposed, after the example of the shepherd in the gospel, to go eagerly in search of the sheep which is lost to bear it with fatherly tenderness upon your shoulders, to bring it back to the flock, and that you will spare neither care nor counsel, nor labor to fulfill religiously the duties of the pastoral charge, to put in safety through the rage, the attacks, the ambuscades of ravishing wolves, the sheep that were bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, confided to your care, and who are all very dear to us, to turn them from the poisons of error, to lead them into fat pastures, 
and bring them by your care your exertions and example to the gates of eternal salvation advance with all your power venerable brothers the glory of god and of the church and by your activity zeal vigilance and harmony endeavor that all errors being dissipated and vices rooted out faith religion piety and virtue may increase from day to day in all places and that all the faithful renouncing the works of darkness conduct themselves in a manner worthy of children of light seeking in all things the good pleasure of god and laboring to do all kinds of good works in the midst of so many grave embarrassments difficulties and inseparable dangers above all at this present time of your episcopal charge be not beaten down with fear but seek strength in the lord and confiding in the power of his grace think that from the height of heaven he has fixed his eyes on those that struggle for the glory of his name that he applauds those who venture nobly that he aids those who fight and crowns those who conquer as we love you all very dearly in the bowels of jesus christ and desire nothing so much as to help you with our love our counsels and our power and to labor with you for the glory of god the defense and propagation of the catholic faith and the salvation of those souls for whom we are ready to sacrifice if necessary our own life come then we conjure you venerable brethren come with open hearts and entire confidence to the see of the blessed prince of the apostles the centre of catholic unity and fount of episcopacy whence the episcopate itself and all authority of that name was drawn come to us whenever you think that you have need of the help or protection of our authority and that of this holy see we confidently hope that our dear sons in jesus christ the princes recollecting in their wisdom and piety that the regal power was given them not only for the government of the world but especially for the defense of the church and that we maintain at one and the same time the cause of the church that of their kingdoms and of their salvation by which they enjoy in peace their authority over their provinces that they will favor by their support and authority the vows and desires that we form in common and that they will defend the liberty and prosperity of the church in order that the right hand of christ may defend their empires to obtain the happy accomplishment of these wishes let us go with confidence venerable brothers to the throne of grace and all penetrated with a deep feeling of humility address unceasingly to the father of mercies and god of all consolation the most urgent prayers that by the merits of his only son he may deign to spread over our weakness the abundance of his heavenly gifts that he will overthrow our enemies by his powerful virtue that he will make the faith flourish everywhere with truth and piety devotion and peace and that dissipating all errors and all oppositions the church may enjoy her much desired liberty and that there will be but one flock and one shepherd and that the most merciful god may more readily hear our prayers and grant our desires let us have recourse to the intercession of the most holy mother of god the immaculate virgin mary our most sweet mother our mediatrix our advocate our firmest hope the source of our confidence and whose protection is most powerful and most efficacious with god let us invoke also the prince of the apostles to whom christ gave the keys of the kingdom of heaven whom he chose for the foundation stone of his church against which the gates of hell shall never prevail and his co-apostle paul and all the saints of heaven who already crowned possess the palm that they may shed down upon all christian people the treasures of divine mercy finally as the presage of these heavenly gifts and in testimony of our great love towards you receive the apostolic benediction which we give from the bottom of our heart to you our venerable brothers to all the ecclesiastics and all the faithful laity confided to your charge given at rome at the church of saint mary the greater on the ninth day of november in the year eighteen forty six in the first year of our pontificate end of encyclical letter qui pluribus on faith and religion by pope pius the ninth encyclical letter pre de cesores nostros 
on aid for ireland march twenty fifth eighteen forty seven by pope pius the ninth the encyclical letter of our most sacred lord by divine providence pope pius the ninth to all the patriarchs archbishops primates and bishops for imploring the divine help for the kingdom of ireland rome from the press of the sacred congregation the propaganda fide eighteen forty seven venerable brethren health and the apostolic benediction venerable brethren ye to whom the history of the church is matter of constant study and perfectly familiar well know that the roman pontiffs our predecessors have at times exhibited a most earnest and anxious care and bring aid to christian nations wheresoever there might be need of help neither are ye ignorant that that salutary and most exemplary zeal embraced not only spiritual benefits conferred on christian people but were applied also to the alleviating of any public calamity by which any nation of christendom might be at any time afflicted this fact is confirmed not only by the memorials of ancient and more recent ages but by our own memory and the memory of our fathers in whom indeed can it be more becoming in whom indeed is it more abound in duty to set before themselves this fatherly solicitude for all christians than whom the catholic faith teaches to be the fathers and doctors of all christendom in whom can it be more consistent to console unfortunate nations than in those who placed on the highest eminence of the church have proved themselves through length of days and by the trial of deeds to be moved by the charity of christ moved by this the illustrious example of our predecessors and at the same time by our own inclination since we first receive intelligence that the kingdom of ireland was visited with a very great dearth of bread corn and a most marked scarcity of other alimentary matters used as food by the people and that people to be oppressed at the same time with a most frightful complication of diseases originating in the scarcity of food we have continually considered in our mind how we might best supply as far as in us lay the necessary succour to these perishing people therefore it was that with this view in this our city we directed public prayers to be offered up to god exhorted thereto the roman clergy and people and all other persons resident at rome to give help to hibernia which being done the money partly offered freely by ourselves and partly collected as much as those times of need could supply might be sent as a subsidy to our venerable brothers the bishops in ireland that they might divide it according to the wants of the various places and the necessities of their citizens but at the present moment such letters are brought to us from ireland such things concerning the above related calamities even yet continuing in that island and indeed increasing in severity are daily announced to us that these things affect our mind with unspeakable sorrow and we again earnestly urge the supply of further help to this people for what ought we not to try to effect for the assistance of this nation struggling under such a grievous trial when we remember how great has always been and now is the veneration of the clergy and people of ireland towards the holy see how much the constancy of that people in the profession of the catholic religion has shown conspicuous even in the most perilous times with what great labors the clergy of ireland have promoted the propagation of the catholic religion in the remotest regions of the earth and with what exemplary piety and zeal for religion among the irish people st peter is honored in our humble person and his dignity is understood to use the words of leo the great as not wanting in his unworthy successor therefore having carefully weighed so grave a matter and some of our brethren the cardinals of the holy church having with concurring counsel fortified our opinion we have resolved venerable brothers to address this epistle to you in order that together with you we may be assisting to the necessities of the irish people we therefore authorize you that in all the dioceses or districts subject to your jurisdiction that as it was first done in the city of rome you cause to be offered for three days public prayers in your churches and other sacred places 
by which god the father of mercies being appeased may deliver the people of ireland from this great calamity and turn away so great a misfortune from it and in order that this desire may be more fully and usefully accomplished we accord an indulgence of seven years for every time to all those who shall be present at such prayers and to those who during the three days shall have been present at the prayers and who during the week of this triduel having been purified by the sacrament of penance shall receive the most holy sacrament of the eucharist we give our apostolical authority plenary indulgence next we recommend more strongly to your charity venerable brethren that by your exhortations you incite the people submitted to your jurisdiction to aid ireland with liberal alms we undoubtedly know that we have no need to remind you of the virtue of almsgiving nor of the abundant fruits which it produces in obtaining the pity of the very good and very great god you will find in the holy fathers of the church and especially in most of the sermons of saint leo the great learned and magnificent praises of almsgiving you have at present before you the admirable letter written by saint cyprian martyr bishop of carthage to the bishops of numitia a letter which contains a remarkable testimony of the singular zeal with which the people confided to his pastoral care came by abundant alms to the help of the suffering christians you may besides recall to mind the words of saint ambrose bishop of milan the beauty of wealth is not to reside in the money-bags of the rich but to serve as an element to the poor treasures shine with greater brilliancy when distributed to the infirm and indigent christians ought to know that they should employ money to seek not what is of them but what is of christ in order that in his turn christ may seek them for these motives and for the others that we have recalled to your benevolent minds we firmly hope that you will afford powerful help to the poor of whom we speak we might here terminate this letter but at the moment at which in deference to our intentions you are about to ordain public prayers we will not forget what inspires us day and night our preoccupation of every moment the welfare of all churches we have in fact incessantly before our eyes this cruel and terrible tempest which has risen against the universal church our mind trembles with dread in thinking how the enemy rises with malignity against the saint of saints and how odious his machinations are against the lord and against his christ therefore we recommend you and above all on the occasion of the public prayers to be ordained for ireland to engage the people submitted to your power to supplicate the lord at the same time in favor of all the church end of encyclical letter predecessores nostros on aid for ireland by pope pius the ninth encyclical letter ubi primum on discipline for religious by pope pius the ninth ubi primum on discipline for religious to all the generals abbots provincials and other superiors of the religious orders my dear children health and apostolic benediction scarcely had we been by the sacred design of divine providence elevated to the government of the universal church when among the principal solicitudes of our apostolic charge we regarded as one of the most important to extend to your pious communities the most affectionate sentiments of our paternal love to defend and protect them all by the efforts of our zeal and to contribute as far as in our power to their splendor and welfare instituted under the inspiration of the divine spirit by men of eminent holiness for the glory of god and the salvation of souls confirmed by the apostolic see they compose in their several forms that magnificent variety which invests the church with such great eclat and constitute those auxiliary troops chosen battalions of the soldiers of christ who have always been one of the finest ornaments and firmest bulwarks of religion and of the state called by a special grace of the deity to the profession of the counsels of evangelical wisdom estimating all things as dust compared with the knowledge of jesus christ looking down with an invincible heart upon all terrestrial things having in their view only those of heaven 
the men of these different orders have ever been occupied in excellent works in those glorious labors which have caused them to merit so well of the catholic church and civilized society no person in fact is ignorant or can be ignorant that the religious orders even from their first institution have been rendered illustrious by an almost innumerable multitude of men eminent by the universality of their knowledge the extent of their erudition the eclat of all their virtues by men who beaming with the most ardent love for god and their neighbor given as an example to the world to angels and to men placed all their delight in passing their nights and days in meditation and study searching into and examining divine things in subjecting their bodies to the mortification of jesus christ in propagating from the rising to the setting sun the faith and doctrine of the catholic church for it combating bravely and suffering joyfully all kinds of cruelties torments punishments and deaths bringing savage and barbarous nations from the darkness of their errors into the light of the gospel from the ferocity of their manners and the impurity of their vices to the practice of virtue and the manners of civilized society in cultivating defending and snatching from ruin letters the sciences and the arts in forming with the greatest care and from the most tender age the minds and hearts of young people to purity and good morals in nourishing them with the most pure and healthy doctrines in leading into the path of salvation those who had the misfortune to abandon it but this is not all there is no description of heroic charity even to the peril of life for which those devoted and benevolent men have not been distinguished captives prisoners sick poor there is no unfortunate or afflicted to whom they have not with the most tender love yielded all the succors of opportune benevolence there is no pain that they have not alleviated no tears that they have not wiped away no necessities which they have not ministered to in every mode behold why the fathers and doctors of the church have with so much justice by their praises raised to such a height those men devoted to evangelical perfection and opposed with so much determination those who attacked them and who carried their temerity so far as to denounce those sacred institutions as useless or dangerous to society behold why the roman pontiffs our predecessors always entertaining the greatest affection for the religious orders have never ceased to defend them to cover them with the patronage of the apostolical authority and bestow honors and privileges upon them well knowing what numerous advantages and what considerable benefits had at all times been conferred on the catholic world by their religious orders behold why those same pontiffs our predecessors have felt for this important portion of our lord's servants a solicitude so lively that hardly could they know that the enemy had secretly sown the tares in the midst of the wheat and that the young foxes attempted to tear up the fertile vines when immediately without any delay they made every effort to extirpate and destroy everything that could prevent the good seed from yielding fruits the most agreeable and abundant it was for this reason without any doubt that among all our predecessors clement the eighth urban the eighth innocent the tenth alexander the seventh clement the ninth innocent the eleventh innocent the twelfth clement the eleventh pius the seventh leo the twelfth of glorious memory did not cease by counsels the most salutary or by decrees and constitutions the most wise to employ all the efforts of the pontifical vigilance entirely to avert the evils which in the sad circumstances of affairs and of the time had crept into the religious communities and to maintain or restore regular discipline among them it is for this reason that we ourselves influenced by the most ardent love which we feel towards the religious orders have resolved walking in the illustrious footsteps of our predecessors and relying upon the wise decrees of the council of trent session twenty five of the regulars and religious to direct according to the duty of our supreme apostleship and with all the reflection of our heart our thoughts and our cares towards your religious communities to strengthen what may be weak to heal what may be ill to bind up what may be broken to place in the right way whatever may have left it to raise up that which may have fallen and in a manner to cause to revive everywhere to flourish and to prosper from day to day integrity of morals holiness of life the observance of regular discipline letters holy knowledge above all the laws peculiar to each order for although we rejoice greatly in the lord to see the vast number of the children of those sacred families applying themselves to their duty with all their strength 
fully remembering their holy vocation, giving brilliant example of all the virtues, and of every kind of knowledge, walking in the illustrious footsteps of their fathers, laboring in the ministry of salvation, spreading everywhere the good odor of Jesus Christ. Yet we have been afflicted to perceive some who, having forgotten their profession and their dignity, have so fallen away from the institution that they had embraced, to the great detriment of their own orders and of the faithful, that they present no longer more than the appearance in the exterior of piety, contradicting by their lives and manners the holiness, the name, and even the habit of the order which they professed. It is to you, therefore, well-beloved sons, who are the superiors of these orders, that we address this letter as a sincere testimony of our ardent wishes for you and your religious communities, in order that you may make known the design that we have formed to restore religious discipline. Our whole object in this undertaking is to adopt, with the divine aid, and to lead to a happy termination, the measures that may appear best calculated to establish and preserve in each religious family a strong, prosperous life, to secure the usefulness of the people, to extend the divine worship, and to advance more and more the glory of God. Our desire, the object of our zeal, is, above all, to be able to draw from the religious orders able and experienced laborers, as eminent for their piety as for their prudence, perfect men of God, formed to all kinds of good works, and that we may be able to apply them to the cultivation of our Lord's vineyard, to the propagation of the Catholic faith, and above all, among the heathens, and, in fine, to the gravest and most important business of the apostolic see. For this purpose, and in order to attain to its full extent the object of our most ardent desires, that object of so great importance for religion and for the religious orders themselves, walking in the footsteps of our predecessors, we have established a special congregation of our venerable brethren, the cardinals of the Holy Roman Church, which we have named the Congregation of the Religious State, de statu regularium ordinum, in order that in so great a work we may be aided by the singular wisdom, the consummate prudence, the ability and the experience in business of our venerable brethren. But you also, well-beloved sons, we call upon you to take part in this great work, we beseech you in the Lord, we exhort you, we pray you joyfully to mingle your labors with the solicitude of our zeal, that your order may resume its ancient dignity and the glory of its original splendor. Therefore, because of the place that you occupy, of the charge with which you are invested, make every effort in order that the religious men who are subject to you, meditating seriously upon the vocation which they have received, may walk worthy of it, and apply themselves always to fulfill faithfully before God the vows they once consecrated to him. See, then, with a vigilance which leaves nothing to be desired, that following the illustrious examples of their ancestors, observing holy discipline, flying resolutely from the pleasures of the world, its allurements and its cares, which they have renounced, they may be wholly and without interruption occupied in prayer, in the meditation of celestial things, in doctrine, in reading, in the salvation of souls, according to the institution of their order. Watch with the greatest care that mortified in the flesh, vivified in the spirit, they show themselves to the people of God, modest, humble, sober, meek, patient, just, irreproachable in their morals, of an ardent charity, of a wisdom which will do them honor, giving cause of offense to no one, but to all examples of good works, so as to astonish even their enemies at having no evil to speak of them. You know perfectly what holiness, what splendor of virtue, should shine in all those who, after having entirely renounced all the charms, all the pleasures, all the seductions, all the vanities of human things, have promised and made profession to adhere but to God alone, and to his worship, in order that the Christian people, looking upon them as a mirror without stain, may receive such precepts of piety, of religion, and all the virtues, that they may themselves walk with happiness and joy in the paths of the Lord. But as upon the prudent admission of novices, and upon their perfect preparation, entirely depend the stability and splendor of each sacred family, we exhort you above all things to examine, to form with the greatest care, the character, the mind, the manners of those who are to take a place in your order, and minutely to inquire what design, what spirit, what motive induced them to embrace a religious life. Once assured that in entering into religion they have no other object than the glory of God, 
the utility of the church, their own salvation, and that of others. Chiefly exert all your care and industry, so that during the time of their novitiate, they may be religiously formed according to the laws of your order, by excellent masters and molded as much as possible, to all the virtues and to the institutions of the regular life which they have embraced. And since the principal and most brilliant glory of the most religious orders has been the study and the assiduous cultivation of letters, the composition of so many learned and laborious works, the glory of divine and human knowledge, we exhort you, we impress you, to prepare with the greatest care and ability, according to the laws of your orders, a proper and select plan of study, and to use all your efforts that your subject apply themselves with perseverance to the belles lettres, and above all, to the grave study of the sacred writings, in order that, thus exciting pure doctrine, they may be able to acquit themselves with prudence and piety, both of the duties proper to their station and of the obligations of the sacred ministry. But as, above all, we wish that all those who combat in the camps of the Lord may glorify God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one unanimous voice, and that, formed in the same doctrines and in the same sentiments, they preserve with true solicitude the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, we pray of you, and we repeat our prayer with the utmost earnestness, that united by the strictest bonds of concord and charity, the most perfect agreement in mind and sentiment with our venerable brethren, the bishops and with the secular clergy, there may be nothing dearer to you in the work of the ministry than to associate your zeal, and to direct all your efforts to the edification of the body of Christ, always progressing to a better state. For, as there is for the regulars and seculars, and for their subjects exempt and non-exempt, but one universal church, out of which absolutely no person can be saved, as there is for all but one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, it is right that all, having but one body, should have but one will also, that as brethren they should be mutually attached to the bond of charity. Clement, Unic de Exces Prelat such well-beloved sons is the advice which we have thought it right to communicate to you in this letter that you may well appreciate the love we bear towards you and your religious communities and with what zeal we wish to maintain them in their utility their dignity and their splendor we doubt not on your side you will make it your glory in accordance with your virtue your prudence your piety the excellence of your religious sentiments and the unlimited devotion to your order to respond in the fullest degree to our wishes, our solicitude, and our counsels. In this firm confidence, then, and all the testimony of our love, and of our devotion to you and your order, as the pledge also of all the celestial gifts from the bottom of our hearts, and with the utmost tender regard, we give you, religious men, our beloved sons, the apostolic benediction. Given at Rome at St. Mary Marjorie on the 17th June, 1847 and the first year of our pontificate. End of encyclical letter Ubi Primum, Undisciplined for Religious, by Pope Pius IX. Read by Thaddeus Grable. Encyclical letter Ubi Primum, On the Immaculate Conception, by Pope Pius IX. Ubi Primum, on the Immaculate Conception. To the patriarchs, primates, archbishops, and bishops of the whole Catholic world, Pope Pius IX. Venerable brethren, health and apostolic benediction. From the first day, when raised without any merit of our own, but by a secret purpose of divine providence, to the supreme chair of the Prince of the Apostles, we took in hand the rudder of the whole Church. We were touched with the sovereign consolation, venerable brethren, when we knew in how marvelous a manner, under the pontificate of our predecessor Gregory the Sixteenth of venerable memory, there was awakened throughout the whole Catholic world the ardent desire of seeing it at length decreed by a solemn judgment of the Holy See, that the Most Holy Mother of God, who is also the tender mother of us all, the Immaculate Virgin Mary, was conceived without original sin. This most pious desire is clearly and manifestly attested and demonstrated 
by the incessant petitions presented as well to our predecessor as to ourselves wherein the most illustrious prelates the most venerable canonical chapters and the religious congregations especially the illustrious order of preaching friars have rivalled each other in soliciting that permission should be granted to add and pronounce aloud and publicly in the sacred liturgy and also in the preface of the mass of the conception of the blessed virgin the word immaculate to these instances our predecessor and we ourselves acceded with the utmost readiness it has further come to pass venerable brethren that a great number among you have not ceased addressing to our predecessor and to us letters wherein expressing their redoubled wishes and their lively solicitations they press us to resolve to define it as a doctrine of the catholic church that the conception of the blessed virgin mary was entirely immaculate and absolutely exempt from all stain of original sin moreover there have not been wanting in our time men eminent for their genius virtue piety and learning who in their learned and laborious writings have cast so brilliant a light upon this subject and most pious opinion that multitudes of persons are astonished that the church and the apostolic see have not yet decreed to the most holy virgin this honour which the common piety of the faithful so ardently desires to see attributed to her by a solemn judgment and by the authority of the same church and the same see assuredly these wishes have been singularly pleasing and full of consolation to us who from our most tender years have held nothing more dear nothing more precious than to honour the blessed virgin with a particular piety with a special veneration and with the most intimate devotion of our heart and to do all that seemed to us apt to contribute to her great glory and praise and to the extension of her worship thus from the commencement of our pontificate we have directed with an extreme interest our most serious cares and thoughts towards an object of such high importance and have not ceased to raise unto almighty god humble and fervent prayers that he may deign to illuminate our soul with the light of his heavenly grace and make us know the determination which we ought to make upon this subject we also repose all confidence in this that the blessed virgin who has been raised by the greatness of her merits above all the choirs of angels up to the throne of god who has crushed under the foot of her virtues the head of the old serpent and who placed between christ and the church full of graces and sweetness has ever rescued the christian people from the greatest calamities from the snares and from the attacks of all their enemies and has saved them from ruin will in like manner deign taking pity on us with that immense tenderness which is the habitual outpouring of her maternal heart to drive away from us by her instant and all-powerful protection before god the sad and lamentable misfortunes the cruel anguish the pains and necessities which we suffer to turn aside the scourges of divine wrath which afflict us by reason of our sins to appease and dissipate the frightful storms of evil with which the church is assailed on all sides to the unmeasured grief of our souls and in fine to change our sorrow into joy for you know perfectly venerable brethren that the foundation of our confidence is in the most holy virgin since it is in her that god has placed the plenitude of all good in such sort that if there be in us any hope if there be any spiritual health we know that it is from her that we receive it because such is the will of him who hath willed that we should have all by the instrumentality of mary we have consequently chosen some ecclesiastics distinguished by their piety and well versed in theological studies and at the same time a certain number of our venerable brethren the cardinals of the holy roman church illustrious for their virtue their religion their wisdom 
their prudence and for their knowledge of divine things and we have commissioned them carefully to examine this grave subject in all its relations according to their prudence and their learning and thereafter as soon as possible to lay before us their resolution herein we have thought fit to follow the illustrious footsteps of our predecessors and to imitate their example for this reason it is venerable brethren that we address to you these letters whereby we earnestly excite your distinguished piety and your episcopal solicitude and we exhort you each according to his prudence and his judgment to ordain and to cause to be recited each of you in his own diocese public prayers to obtain of the merciful father of light that he may deign to illuminate us with the superior brightness of his divine spirit and may inspire us with a breath from on high that in an affair of such great importance we may be able to take such a resolution as shall most contribute as well to the glory of his holy name as to the praise of the blessed virgin and the prophet of the church militant we have a lively wish that you should as soon as possible make known to us with what devotion your clergy and faithful people are animated towards the conception of the immaculate virgin and what desire they have to behold the apostolic see promulgate a decree in this matter we above all desire to know venerable brethren what are in this respect the wishes and feelings of your eminent wisdom and as we already permitted to the roman clergy to recite a certain office of the conception of the most holy virgin composed and printed very recently in place of the office which is found in the ordinary breviary we also accord to you venerable brethren the faculty of permitting all the clergy of your diocese if you judge it convenient to recite freely and lawfully the same office of the conception of the most holy virgin which is actually used by the roman clergy without your demanding this permission of us or of our sacred congregation of rites we make no doubt venerable brethren but that your singular piety towards the most blessed virgin will make you with the utmost diligence and the most lively interest comply with the desires we express to you and that you will hasten to transmit to us within a convenient time the answers which we require of you meanwhile receive as a pledge of all celestial favors and above all as a witness of our good will towards you the apostolic benediction which we give from the bottom of our heart to you venerable brethren as well as to all the clergy and all the faithful laity entrusted to your vigilance given at gaeta on the second day of february in the year eighteen forty nine in the third year of our pontificate end of encyclical letter ubi primum on the immaculate conception by pope pius the ninth encyclical letter nostis et nobiscum on the church in the papal states by pope pius the ninth nostis et nobiscum on the church in the papal states december eighth eighteen forty nine encyclic of our holy father pope pius the ninth to the archbishops and bishops of italy venerable brothers health and apostolical benediction you know and you see like ourselves venerable brothers by what perversity in these last times have prevailed certain abandoned men enemies of all truth of all justice of all honesty who whether by fraud and artifices of every description or openly and casting the dregs of their confusions like a raging sea its foam are striving to spread in all directions among the faithful people of italy unrestrained licentiousness of thought and word and of all daring and impious actions to ruin even in italy the catholic religion and if that could ever be to overturn it even to its foundations the whole plan of their diabolical design hath shewn itself in diverse places but especially in the well-beloved city the seat of our supreme pontificate where after having constrained us to quit it they have been able for some months to abandon themselves the more freely to all their madness then in the midst of a frightful and sacrilegious confusion of things divine and things human 
their rage ascended to such a point that despising the authority of the illustrious clergy of rome and of the prelates who by our order remained fearlessly at its head they did not suffer them even to continue in fear the sacred work of their ministry and that without piety for the wretched sick folk a prey to the anguish of death they removed from them all the succors of religion and constrained them to yield up their last sigh amid the blandishments of some wanton harlot although since then the city of rome and the other provinces of the pontifical states have been thanks to the mercy of god restored by the arms of the catholic nations to our temporal government although the wars and disorders which attended these events have in like manner ceased in the other countries of italy still these infamous enemies of god and man have not ceased and cease not their work of destruction they can no longer employ open force but they have recourse to other means some hidden under deceitful appearances others visible to every eye surrounded by such great difficulties holding the supreme charge of all the lord's flock and filled with the most lively affliction at the sight of the perils to which the churches of italy are particularly exposed it is for our infirmity venerable brothers in the midst of sorrows a great consolation to behold that pastoral zeal of which during the tempest that has just passed you have given so many proofs and which manifests itself yet daily by more and more striking proofs however the gravity of the occasion presses on us to rouse still more earnestly by our word and our exhortations according to the duty of our apostolic charge your fraternity called to share our solicitudes to fight with us and in unity the battles of the lord to prepare and to adopt with a single heart all the measures by which with god's blessing the evil already done in italy to our holy religion shall be repaired and the perils with which it is immediately threatened shall be prevented and repelled among the numberless frauds which the aforesaid enemies of the church are in the habit of using to render the catholic faith odious to the italians one of the most perfidious is that opinion which they do not blush to affirm and to noise abroad everywhere that the catholic religion is an obstacle to the glory the greatness and proficiency of the italian nation and that consequently in order to restore to the italian the splendor of the ancient times that is to say of the pagan times it is necessary to substitute in the place of the catholic religion to insinuate to propagate and to set afoot the teaching of the protestants and their conventicles one knows not in such assertions which is the most detestable the perfidy of their word or the impudence of their shameless falsehood the spiritual good whereby being withdrawn from the power of darkness we are transported into the light of god whereby grace justifying us we are made heirs of christ in the hope of eternal life this good of souls emanating from the holiness of the catholic religion is certainly of such a price that compared with this food all the glory and all the happiness of this world ought to be regarded as a mere nothing quid enem prodest omini si mundum universum meretur anime vere sue detrimentum patiatur aut quam dabit homo commutationem pro anima sua matthew chapter 16 verse 26 but far from the profession of the true faith having caused to the italian race the temporal losses which have been spoken of it is owing to the catholic religion that they did not fall at the breaking up of the roman empire into the same ruin as did the nations of assyria chaldea medea persia and macedonia no educated man in fact is ignorant that not only did the most holy religion of christ rescue italy from the clouds of those many and great errors that entirely overspread it but that furthermore in the midst of the ruin of the ancient empire and the invasions of the barbarians ravaging all europe we raised her in glory and greatness above all the nations of the world in such wise that by a singular benefit of god italy possessing in her bosom the sacred chair of peter has held by divine religion 
an empire more solid and more extensive than her old earthly dominion this singular privilege of possessing the apostolic see and of beholding by that very means the catholic religion taking the strongest root among the people of italy has been for that country the source of other and innumerable benefits for the most holy religion of christ the mistress of true wisdom the avenging protectress of humanity the fertile mother of all virtues turned aside the minds of the italians from that mournful thirst of glory which had led their ancestors to be perpetually making war to hold foreign nations under oppression to reduce according to the rights of war then prevalent an immense multitude of men into the hardest slavery and at the same time illuminating the italians with the rays of catholic truth she led them by a powerful impulse to the practice of justice and of mercy to the most splendid works of piety towards god and of beneficence towards mankind hence arose in the principal cities of italy so many holy basilicas and other monuments of the christian ages which were not the mournful work of a multitude reduced to slavery but which were freely raised by the zeal of a vivifying charity to which must be added the pious institutions of every description whether consecrated to the exercise of the religious life or to the education of youth to literature to arts to the sound cultivation of the sciences or lastly to the consolation of the sick and indigent such then is that holy religion which embraces under so many diverse titles the salvation the glory and the happiness of italy that religion which they would desire to make the people of italy throw aside we cannot restrain our tears venerable brothers when we see that there are to be found at this day some italians perverse enough abandoned enough to miserable illusions as not to dread applauding the depraved doctrines of the impious and conspiring with them for the ruin of italy but you are not ignorant venerable brothers that the principal authors of this detestable conspiracy have for their object to drive the people agitated by every wind of perverse doctrine to the overthrow of all order in human affairs and to deliver them up to the criminal systems of the newly invented socialism and communism now these men know and see by the long experience of many ages that they cannot hope for any approval from the catholic church which in the keeping of the deposit of the divine revelation never allows anything to be retrenched from or to be added to the truths propounded by the faith therefore they have formed the design of attracting the italian peoples to the opinions and to the conventicles of the protestants in which so they incessantly repeat in order to seduce them one ought to see nothing else but a different form of the same true christian religion where one can please god as well as in the catholic church meanwhile they know that nothing can be more useful to their impious cause than the first principle of the protestant opinions the principle of the free interpretation of the sacred scriptures according to the private judgment of each individual they are confident that after having first abused the false interpretation of the sacred writings to spread their errors they will the more easily as if in the name of god drive men onwards puffed up with the proud license of judging on divine subjects to call in question even the common principles of justice and virtue god forbid venerable brothers that that italy where the other nations have been accustomed to draw the pure waters of sound doctrine because the apostolic see has been established at rome becomes for them henceforth a stone of stumbling and of scandal god forbid that this cherished portion of the lord's vineyard be given over for a prey to wild beasts god forbid that the italian people having drunk madness from the poisoned cup of babylon should take up parasitical arms against the mother church as for us and you whom god in his secret judgment has reserved for these times of so great danger take we care not to fear the stratagems and attacks of those men who conspire against the faith of italy as if we had to conquer them by our own strength since christ is our counsel and our strength 
Christ, without whom we can do nothing, but by whom we can do everything. Labor, therefore, venerable brothers, watch with still greater vigilance over the flock which is entrusted to you, and use all your efforts to defend it from the ambushes and the attacks of ravening wolves. Communicate to each other your designs, continue as you have already begun to hold meetings between yourselves, to the end that having discovered by a united investigation the origin of our evils, and according to the diversity of places, the principal sources of the dangers, you may be able therein to discover, under the authority and guidance of the Holy See, the most prompt remedies, and that so, unanimously agreeing with us, you may, by God's help, and with all the vigor of the pastoral zeal, apply your cares and labors to render vain all the efforts, all the artifices, all the snares, and all the machinations of the enemies of the church. To arrive at this end, we must labor without ceasing, lest the people, too little instructed in the law of the Lord, deadened by the long license of their vices, but faintly perceive the snares which are being spread for them, and the wickedness of the errors which are proposed to them. We earnestly require of your pastoral zeal, venerable brothers, never to cease applying all your pains in order that the faithful who are entrusted to you may be instructed according to the intelligence of each, in the most holy dogmas and precepts of our religion, and that they may be at the same time warned and excited by all means to conform thereunto their life and manners. Influence for that end, the zeal of the ecclesiastics, of those of them especially that have the cure of souls, in order that, meditating profoundly on the ministry which they have received in the Lord, and having before their eyes the prescriptions of the Council of Trent, they may devote themselves with the greatest activity, according as the necessity of the times requires, to the instruction of the peoples, and may apply themselves to engrave in their hearts of all the sacred words, the counsels of salvation, making them know by brief and simple discourses the vices which they ought to fly in order to avoid eternal pain, the virtues which they ought to seek in order to obtain celestial glory. It is necessary to take care, in an especial manner, that the faithful themselves may have profoundly engraven upon their souls the dogma of our most holy religion on the necessity of the Catholic faith for the obtaining of salvation. For that end it will be of sovereign utility that in the public prayers the faithful, united with the clergy, render from time to time particular acts of thanksgiving to God for the inestimable benefit of the Catholic religion that they all of them hold fast to his infinite goodness, and that they beseech humbly the Father of mercies to deign to protect and preserve inviolate, in our countries, the profession of the same religion. You will, however, especially take care to administer to all the faithful, at a convenient time, the sacrament of confirmation, which, by a sovereign benefit of God, imparts the strength of a particular grace to confess with constancy the Catholic faith, even in the midst of the gravest perils. Nor are you ignorant that it is useful, for the same object, that the faithful, purified from the stains of their sins, expiated by a sincere detestation of them, and by the sacrament of penance, frequently receive with devotion the Most Holy Eucharist, which is the spiritual nourishment of souls the antidote which delivers us from daily faults and preserves us from mortal sins, the symbol of that only body of which Christ is the head and to which he has willed that we should be attached by that strong tie of faith, hope, and charity, so that we may be all that one body and that there may be no schisms among us. We doubt not but that the cures their vicars, and the other priests, who on certain days and especially at the season of fast, devote themselves to the ministry of preaching, will be eager to afford you their cooperation in all these things. However, it is necessary from time to time to assist their efforts by the extraordinary aids of spiritual exercises and holy missions, which when they are confided to capable men, are with the blessing of God very useful to warm the piety of the good to excite to a salutary penance sinners and men depraved by long habits of vice, to make the faithful people believe in the knowledge of God, 
to make them produce all sorts of good works and fortifying them with the abundant succor of celestial grace to inspire into them an invincible horror of the perverse doctrines of the enemies of the church for the rest in all these things your pains and those of your priests your fellow workers will be directed particularly to make the faithful conceive the greatest horror for these crimes which are committed to the great scandal of their neighbor for you know how in diverse places has multiplied the number of those who dare publicly to blaspheme the saints of heaven and even the most holy name of god or who are known as living in concubinage and sometimes joining incest thereto or who on holidays devote themselves to servile works their shops being open or who in the presence of mary despise the precepts of fasting and abstinence or who do not blush in the same manner to commit diverse other crimes god grant that at the voice of pure zeal the faithful people may represent to themselves and seriously consider the enormous gravity of sins of this kind and the most severe pains with which their author shall be punished as well for the special criminality of each act as for the spiritual danger which they make their brethren incur by the contagion of their bad example in it is written ve mundo a scandalis ve omini ili perquem scandalum venit matthew chapter eighteen verse seven among the diverse kinds of frauds by which the most crafty enemies of the church and of human society strive to lead the people astray that certainly stands among the foremost which they had prepared long ago in their nefarious designs in which they have discovered in the wicked use of the new system of bookmaking nove artis librarii to this therefore they direct all their attention that they may never cease publishing among the vulgar and multiplying impious pamphlets journals and flysheets full of falsehood calumnies and seductions nay using even the assistance of the bible societies which have been long ago condemned by this holy see they do not fear to scatter abroad the sacred scriptures translated contrary to the rules of the church into the vulgar tongue and so corrupted and by a detestable daring distort to a false sense and under the pretense of religion to recommend the reading thereof to the people hence according to your wisdom venerable brothers you very well understand with how great vigilance and solicitude you must labor in order that your faithful flocks may abhor the pestiferous reading of those books and that particularly in regard to the sacred scriptures they may remember that no man may so arrogate to himself as resting on his own prudence to presume to distort them to his own sense contrary to the sense in which holy mother church has held and doth hold them to whom indeed alone has it been commanded by christ the lord that she keep the deposit of the faith and judge concerning the true sense and interpretation of the divine oracles but to restrain the contagion of wicked books it will be highly useful venerable brothers that whoever about you are men of distinguished and sound learning should put forth other writings also of small bulk first of all of course approved of by you unto the edification of the faith and the salutary instruction of the people and it will be thenceforward your care that the same writings as also other books in like manner of incorrupt doctrine and approved utility written by others be circulated among the faithful according as the circumstances of places and persons shall suggest but all who labor with you for the defense of the faith will have especially an eye to this that they confirm defend and deeply fix in the minds of your faithful people that piety veneration and respect towards this supreme see of peter in which you venerable brothers so greatly excel let the faithful people remember that there here lives and presides in the person of his successor peter the prince of the apostles whose dignity faileth not even in his unworthy heir let them remember that christ the lord hath placed in this chair of peter the unshaken foundation of his church and that he gives to peter himself the keys of the kingdom of heaven and that he prayed therefore that this faith might fail not and commanded him to confirm his brethren therein so that the successor of st peter holds the primacy over the whole world and is the true vicar of christ and head of the whole church 
and father and doctor of all christians and it is assuredly in the maintenance of this communion of the nations with the roman pontiff and of their obedience to him that a short and compendious road is found to preserve them in the possession of the catholic faith for neither is it possible that any one should ever in any point whatever rebel against the catholic faith except he also throw aside the authority of the roman church in which is extant the unchangeable dictation informabili magisterium of the same faith founded by the divine redeemer and in which therefore has always been preserved that tradition which is derived from the apostles hence it is that not only the ancient heretics but even the protestants whose disunion in the rest of the principles is otherwise so great have had this always in common that they attacked the authority of the apostolic see which never at any time or by any art or endeavor have they been able to persuade to allow of even so much as one of their errors wherefore also the enemies of god and of human society at this day leave nothing unattempted to tear away the italian people from their obedience to us and to that same holy see supposing of course that then and then only may they possibly succeed in contaminating italy itself with the impiety of their doctrine and new systems and as regards these wicked doctrines and systems it is now known to all men that they chiefly have an eye to this that abusing the name of liberty and equality they may insinuate the ruinous inventions of communism and socialism among the common people but it is evident that the masters of communism or socialism themselves though acting by different ways and methods have at least this design in common that after having deceived the working classes and others chiefly of the lower ranks by their fallacies and deluded them with the promise of a happier condition they may agitate them with continual commotions and train them by degrees for greater crimes in order that hereafter they may be able to use their assistance to attack the rule of every superior authority to rob sack or invade the possessions first of the church and afterwards those of all others whomsoever to violate in fine all divine and human laws unto the destruction of the divine worship and the subversion of all the order of civil societies in this extreme danger of italy it is your office venerable brothers to strain every nerve of pastoral zeal that the faithful people may perceive that such like perverse principles and systems if they allow themselves to be deceived by them will end alike in their temporal and eternal ruin let therefore the faithful entrusted to your care be admonished that it pertains to the very nature of human society that all ought to obey the authority legitimately constituted in it and that nothing can be changed in the precepts of the lord which are proclaimed in the sacred scriptures on that subject for it is written subjecti estote omni umani creature propter deum sive regi quasi precellenti sive ducibus tomquam ab eo missis advindicam malefactorum laurum vero bonorum quia sic est voluntas dei ut benefacientes ob mutescere faciatis imprudentium ominum ignorantiam quasi liberi et non quasi velameo abentes malitiae libertatem sed sicut servi dei first peter chapter two verses thirteen and following and again omnis anima potestatibus sublimioribus subditasit non est enim potestas nisi adeo que autem sunt adeo ordinate sunt itaque qui resistit potestati dei ordinationi resistit qui autem resistunt ipsi sibi damnationem acquirunt romans chapter thirteen verse one and following let them know moreover that in like manner it belongs to the natural and therefore unchangeable condition of human affairs that even among those who are not in high authority still some prevail over others whether on account of different endowments of soul or body or on account of riches and external goods of that kind nor by any pretense of liberty and equality can it ever come to pass that it be lawful to attack or in any way whatsoever 
to violate the possessions or the rights of others under this head also do we find divine precepts everywhere inculcated in holy scripture whereby we are strictly prohibited not merely from seizing the property of others but even from coveting it but above all let the poor and all wretched men whatsoever remember how much they themselves owe to the catholic religion in which the doctrines of christ flourishes undefiled and is openly preached who has declared that he regards benefits bestowed on the poor or wretched as if they were done unto himself and he has willed to forewarn all men of the special account which in the day of judgment he will take of those same works of mercy whether in giving the rewards of eternal life to the faithful who have labored therein or in afflicting the punishment of eternal fire on those who have neglected them in consequence of which declaration of christ our lord and other most severe admonitions of his concerning the use of riches and the dangers of them which admonitions have been inviolably obeyed in the catholic church it has come to pass that in catholic nations the poor and wretched are placed in a much more tolerable condition than in any other nations whatsoever and they indeed would obtain in our italy yet more abundant succors if several institutions which had been provided by the piety of our ancestors for their consolation had not been lately destroyed or robbed in the repeated commotions of public affairs for the rest let our poor remember christ himself teaching them that there is no reason why they should be sad about their condition since in poverty itself there is prepared for them an easier way to obtain salvation if only they patiently bear their indigence and are poor not in outward circumstances only but in spirit for he saith beati paupere spiritu quonium ipsorum est regnum celorum matthew chapter five verse three let also the whole faithful people know that the ancient kings of pagan nations and those who ruled public affairs therein much more grievously and frequently abused their power and hence let them learn that it is to be accounted as one of the benefits arising from our most holy religion if fearing that most severe judgment which according to the warnings of religion will be held on those who rule and the eternal punishment destined for sins in which the mighty shall mightily suffer torments the princes of christian times exercise a more just and merciful government towards the people subject to them lastly let the faithful entrusted to your and our care acknowledge that the true and perfect liberty and equality of man is placed in keeping the christian law since almighty god who hath made the little and the great and who hath an equal care over all will not withdraw from judgment the person of any one and hath appointed a day in which he shall judge the world with equity in his only begotten son christ jesus who shall come in the glory of his father with his angels and then shall render to every one according to his works but if the same faithful despising the fatherly admonitions of their pastors and the above-mentioned commands of the christian law allow themselves to be deceived by the aforesaid promoters of the conspiracies of the day and choose to plot with them for the perverse system of socialism and communism let them know and seriously consider that they are treasuring up unto themselves with the divine judge treasures of vengeance against the day of anger nor that any temporal utility can in the meantime arise to the people from that conspiracy but rather new increases of miseries and calamities for it is not given unto man to found new societies and communities opposed to the natural condition of human affairs and therefore if such conspiracies were spread throughout italy no other issue could come of them than that the existing state of human affairs having been shaken and overthrown to its foundation by mutual attacks of citizens against citizens by usurpations and slaughters some few men at length enriched by the spoils of many should snatch the supreme dominion in the midst of the general ruin to turn aside the faithful people from the snares of the impious to maintain them in the profession of the catholic religion and to excite them to the works of true virtue the example and the lives of those who have devoted themselves to the sacred ministry has as you know a great power 
but o mournful fact that there are found ecclesiastics in italy in small numbers it is true who have passed into the ranks of the enemies of the church and who have not a little aided them in deceiving the faithful for you venerable brothers the fall of these men has been a new spur to urge you on to watch with a more and more active zeal in maintaining the discipline of the clergy and here being desirous according to our duty of taking preservative measures for the future we cannot refrain from again recommending you a point on which we have already insisted in our first encyclical letter to the bishops of the whole world and we remind you never lightly to lay your hands upon any one and to apply the most attentive care in the choices of the ecclesiastical warriors it is necessary that a long search a minute investigation should be made on this subject especially of those who desire to enter into holy orders it is necessary to assure yourselves that they are recommended by the gravity of their manners and by their zeal for the divine worship in such wise as to give you the certain hope that like burning lamps in the house of the lord they shall be able by their conduct and by their works to procure unto your flock spiritual edification and profit the church of god draws from monasteries when they are well conducted an immense utility and a great glory and the regular clergy afford to yourselves in your labors for the health of souls a precious succor which is the reason venerable brothers why we desire you first of all to assure on our part the religious families of each of your dioceses that in the midst of such great sorrow we have in a special manner felt the evils which several of them have had to suffer in these bad times and that the courageous patience the constancy and the love of virtue and of their religion of which a great number of religious have given the example has been to us a source of consolation so much the more lively because we have seen others of them forgetting the sanctity of their profession to the great scandal of good people and filling with bitterness our heart and the hearts of their brethren shamefully go astray in the second place you will exhort in our name the chiefs of those religious families and when necessary the superiors who are administering them to neglect none of the duties of their charge in order to render regular discipline where it is maintained more and more vigorous and flourishing and to re-establish it in all its integrity and all its force wherever it may have received some diminution these superiors will unceasingly both by admonitions representations and reproaches remind the religious of their houses that they ought seriously to consider by what vows they are bound towards god to apply themselves to keep what they have promised to him to observe inviolably the rules of their institute to abstain from all that is not compatible with their vocation to give themselves up wholly to the works which comprise charity towards god and our neighbors and the love of perfect virtue on all these subjects let the rulers of those orders vigilantly take care that the entrance to them be not open to any person except after a profound and scrupulous examination of his life his manners and his character and that no person be admitted therein to the religious profession except after having given in a novitiate made according to the rules proofs of a true vocation in such wise that no one may have good reason to presume that the novice does not embrace the religious life except to live unto god alone and to labor according to the rule of his institute for his own salvation and that of his neighbor on this point we desire and intend the observation of all that was commanded and prescribed for the good of religious families in the decrees published on january twenty fifth of last year by our congregation on the state of the regulars decrees clothed with the sanction of our apostolic authority after having thus spoken to you of the regular clergy we desire to recommend to your fraternity the instruction and education of clerk minors for the church can have little hope of finding worthy ministers except among those who from their youth and their first age have been according to the prescribed rules formed unto that holy ministry continue then venerable brothers to use all your resources to put forth all your efforts in order that the recruits of the sacred soldiery 
may be as much as possible received in the ecclesiastical seminaries from their earliest years and that ranged around the tabernacle of the lord they may grow and increase like a new plantation in innocence of life religion modesty the ecclesiastical spirit learning at the same time from chosen masters whose teaching shall be truly exempt from all danger of error letters the elementary and higher sciences but above all sacred letters and sciences but as you will not be able without difficulty to complete the education of all the clerks minors in the seminaries and as assuredly the younger portion of the laity ought besides to be also the object of your pastoral solicitude watch equally venerable brothers on all the other schools public and private and as much as in you lies employ your influence and use your efforts in order that in those schools the studies may be in all respects conformable to the rule of catholic doctrine and that the youth assembled therein receiving instructions in letters arts and sciences may have none but masters irreproachable in respect to religion and manners who teaching them also true virtue may place them in a position of perceiving the snares set by the impious of avoiding their miserable errors and of serving usefully and honorably christian society and civil society it is for this reason that you will claim the principal authority an authority wholly unfettered over the professors of the various branches of sacred study and over all things which belong to religion or which touch upon it nearly be vigilant that in nothing and for the sake of nothing but above all in nothing that touches the affairs of religion any books are used in the schools except those which are free from every suspicion of error warn those who have the charge of souls to be your vigilant cooperators in all that concerns the schools of children and of youth of the first age let not the schools be confided to any but masters and mistresses of approved virtue and in order to teach the elements of the christian faith to infants whether boys or girls let such books only be used as are approved of by the holy see on this point we cannot doubt but that the cures will be the first to give the example and that urged by your incessant exhortations they will apply themselves every day more and more to instruct infants in the elements of christian doctrine remembering that this is one of the gravest duties of the charge with which they are entrusted you ought in like manner to recall to them that in their instructions whether addressed to children or to the people they should never lose sight of the roman catechism published conformably to the decrees of the council of trent by order of pope pius v our predecessor of immortal memory and recommended to all pastors of souls by other sovereign pontiffs for example by clement the eighth as a means of all others the most proper to repel the deceits of perverse opinions to propagate and to establish in a solid manner true and sound doctrines you will not be astonished venerable brothers if we speak to you at some length on this subject your prudence assuredly has perceived that in these perilous times we ought we and you to make the greatest efforts to employ every means to strive with unshaken constancy to exercise a continual vigilance on everything which regards schools the instruction and education of children and young people of both sexes you know that in our days the enemies of religion and of human society urged by a truly diabolical spirit apply themselves by every means to pervert the understanding and hearts of young people from their earliest age in this object there is no means which they do not set at work there is no audacious enterprise which they do not attempt to withdraw entirely from the authority of the church and the vigilance of the pastors the schools and every establishment destined for the education of youth we have then the firm hope that our most dear sons in jesus christ all the princes of italy will aid your fraternity with their powerful patronage to the end that you may be able to discharge with more fruit the duties of your charge of which we have just reminded you no more do we doubt but that they have the will to protect the church and all her rights whether spiritual or temporal 
nothing is more conformable to the religion or the piety which they have inherited from their ancestors and with which they show themselves animated it cannot escape their wisdom that the first cause of all the evils with which we are overwhelmed is no other than the evil done to religion and to the catholic church in former times but above all at the epoch when the protestants appeared they see for example that the growing contempt of the authority of the holy pontiffs that the violations every day more numerous and unpunished of divine and ecclesiastical precepts have diminished in a proportionate degree the respect of the people for the civil power and opened to the actual enemies of public tranquillity a wider road to revolts and sedition they see in like manner that the oft renewed spectacle of the temporal goods of the church being invaded divided publicly sold although they belonged to her in virtue of a legitimate right of property and that the weakening in the popular mind of the feeling of respect for property is consecrated by a religious destination have had the effect of rendering a great number of men more accessible to the audacious assertions of the new socialism and of communism teaching that one may in the same manner seize on other properties and divide them or transform them in all other ways for the use of all they further see falling little by little on the civil power all the snares long ago multiplied with such perseverance to impede the pastors of the church from freely using their sacred authority they see finally that in the midst of the calamities which are oppressing us it is impossible to find a remedy of more prompt effect and greater efficiency than religion and the catholic church flourishing again and regaining her splendor throughout italy the catholic church which possesses as none can doubt the most proper means for succoring the diverse wants of man in all conditions and in fact to use here the words of saint augustine the catholic church embraces not only god himself but further love and charity for our neighbor in such wise that she has remedies for all the maladies to which souls are incident by reason of their sins she exercises and instructs infants in a manner appropriate to their age the young with strength the old with tranquillity each in a word according to what is required by the age not only of his body but of his mind she subjects the wife to her husband by a chaste and faithful obedience not to satisfy licentiousness but to propagate the human race and to preserve domestic society thus she makes the husband the head of the wife not that he may make that weaker sex his slave but that both of them may obey the laws of a sincere love she subjects sons to their parents in a kind of free servitude and the authority which she gives to parents over their children is a sort of compassionate lordship she unites brothers to brothers by a tie of religion stronger and closer than the tie of blood she draws together all the bonds of relationship and alliance by a mutual charity which respects the ties of nature and those which different wills have formed she teaches servants to attach themselves to their masters not so much by reason of the necessities of their condition as by the attraction of duty she makes masters gentle to their servants by the thought of their common master almighty god and makes them prefer the paths of persuasion to those of constraint she binds citizen to citizen nation to nation and all men with each other not only by the social bond but further by a sort of fraternity the fruit of the recollection of our first parents she instructs kings to have always in view the good of their subjects she warns the people to submit themselves to kings she teaches all with a solicitude which nothing can tire to whom honor is due to whom affection to whom respect to whom fear to whom consolation to whom admonition to whom exhortation to whom discipline to whom reprimand to whom punishment showing how all these things are not due to all but that to all charity is due and to none injustice it is then our duty and yours venerable brothers not to recoil before any labor to face all difficulties 
to employ all the force of our pastoral zeal to protect among the Italian people the worship of the Catholic religion, not only by opposing ourselves energetically to the efforts of the impious who are carrying on the conspiracy of tearing Italy herself from the bosom of the Church, but still more in laboring mightily to recall into the way of salvation those degenerate sons of Italy who have already had the weakness to allow themselves to be led astray. But every excellent good and every perfect gift comes from above. Let us therefore approach with confidence to the throne of grace, venerable brothers. Let us not cease to pray with supplication, to beseech by public and private prayers the heavenly Father of lights and mercies, that by the merits of his only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, turning his face from our sins, he may enlighten to his clemency all spirits and all hearts by virtue of his grace, that subduing rebellious wills, he may glorify Holy Church with new victories and new triumphs, and that in all Italy and in every land the people which serve him may increase in number and in merit. Let us also invoke the Most Holy Mother of God, the Immaculate Virgin Mary, who by her all-powerful patronage with God, obtaining all whatsoever she asks, cannot ask in vain. Let us invoke with her Peter, the Prince of the Apostles, Paul, his brother in the apostolate, and all the saints of heaven that God most merciful, appeased by their prayers, may turn from the faithful people the scourges of his anger, and accord in his goodness unto all those who bear the name of Christians, power by his grace, both to reject whatever is contrary to the holiness of that name, and to practice whatever is conformable thereunto. Lastly, venerable brothers, in testimony of our lively affection towards you, receive the apostolical benediction, which from the bottom of our heart we lovingly impart, both to you and to the clergy, and to the faithful people entrusted to your vigilance. End of encyclical letter, Nostis et Nubiscum, on the Church in the Papal States, December 8, 1849, by Pope Pius the Ninth. Encyclical letter, Exulta vit cor nostrum, on the effects of the Jubilee, by Pope Pius the Ninth. Encyclical letter of our Holy Father, Pope Pius the Ninth, ordering prayers and announcing a new Jubilee. So all the patriarchs, primates, archbishops, and bishops of the Catholic world, venerable brothers, health and apostolical benediction. It is for us no slight subject of sorrow to behold what a sad and lamentable spectacle is presented by our holy religion and civil society in these calamitous times. None among you, venerable brothers, is ignorant of the perfidious artifices, the monstrous doctrines, the conspiracies of every kind which the enemies of God and of the human race are setting at work to pervert all minds, to corrupt morals, to cause, if it were possible, religion to disappear from the face of the earth, to shatter all the bonds of civil society, and to destroy it to its very foundations. Hence the deplorable darkness which blinds so many minds, the vehement war which is waged against the whole Catholic religion and this apostolic chair, the implacable hatred which persecutes virtue and honesty, hence the most shameful vices which usurp the name of virtue, the unbridled license of thinking, corrupting, doing everything, and daring everything, the absolute impatience of all restraint, all power and all authority, the derision and contempt for the most sacred things, for the holiest laws, for the most excellent institutions, hence, above all, the deplorable corruption of thoughtless youth, the poisonous inundation of bad books, pamphlets, and journals profusely circulated, and propagating everywhere the principles of evil, hence the deadly venom of indifferentism and incredulity the seditious movements, the sacrilegious conspiracies, the mockery and outrage of all laws, human and divine. You are not ignorant either, venerable brethren, what anxiety, what uncertainty, what painful hesitation, 
what terror fills and agitates all minds particularly the minds of good men who believe with reason that public and private interests have reason to fear every misfortune when men wandering miserably from the laws of truth justice and religion in order to give themselves up to the detestable allurements of unbridled passions meditate every species of crime in the midst of so many dangers who does not see that all our hopes ought to rest solely in god our salvation that to him we ought continually to raise our fervent prayers in order that his propitious bounty may shed over all nations the riches of his mercy that he may illuminate every mind with the heavenly light of his grace that he may bring back into the path of justice those who are wandering that he may vouchsafe to turn towards him the rebellious wills of his enemies to infuse into every heart the love and fear of his holy name and inspire them to think always and to do always what is right what is true what is pure what is holy and since god is full of sweetness mildness and mercy since he is bounteous towards those who call upon him since he regards the prayers of the humble and loves especially to manifest his power by clemency and forgiveness let us approach venerable brethren the throne of grace with confidence in order to obtain mercy and find assistance in the time of need for he who asks receives he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it is opened let us in the first place render immortal thanksgiving to the god of goodness in joy let our lips praise his holy name since in many nations of the catholic world he deigns to work the wonders of his mercy let us come then with one mind animated with the sincerity of the same faith with the firmness of the same hope with the ardour of the same charity let us not cease a single moment to pray and supplicate god humbly and earnestly that he may rescue his holy church from every calamity that every day it may increase dilate and be exalted amongst all people in every region of the earth that thus it may purify the world from error conduct men with tenderness and generosity to the knowledge of truth and to the way of salvation that god being propitiated may turn away the scourges of his anger which we have deserved for our sins may assuage the stormy ocean and restore tranquillity may give to all that peace so much desired may save his people and blessing his inheritance may direct and conduct us to our heavenly country and that god may be made more accessible and give care to our prayers and hear our petitions let us raise our hearts and hands to his most holy mother the immaculate virgin mary we could not find protection more powerful or more effectual with god she is to us the most tender of mothers our firmest reliance and the very spring of our hopes since she asks nothing which she does not obtain, and her prayer isn't ever refused. Let us also implore, in the first place, the intercession of the Prince of Apostles, to whom Jesus Christ himself has given the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whom he has established as the foundation stone of his church, against which the gates of hell will never be able to prevail. Let us then pray to Paul, the companion of his apostleship, let us pray to the patron of each city and country and to all the blessed that our most merciful lord may shed upon us in abundance and munificence the gifts of his bounty moreover venerable brethren while we ordain here public prayers in our holy city we invite you by these letters that you unite yourselves with the people committed to your care with us in the community of petitions we invoke with all our zeal your fervent devotion and your piety in order that in your respective dioceses you may prescribe also public prayers with the object of imploring the divine mercy and in order that the faithful may enter with greater ardour and earnestness on the prayers which you shall appoint we have resolved to open anew the celestial treasures of the church under the form of a jubilee as will be clearly indicated to you by other letters which accompany these we entertain this firm hope 
venerable brothers, that there are angels of peace who, holding in their hands censers of gold, will offer on the golden altar our humble prayers and those of the whole church, in order that the Lord himself, receiving them favorably, and hearing our petitions, yours and those of all the faithful, will dissipate all the darkness of error, offer the menacing tempest of so many misfortunes, stretch out a succoring hand to Christian and civil society, and grant that all may have the same faith in their hearts, the same piety in their works, the same love for religion, virtue, truth, and justice, the same zeal for peace, the same attachment to the bonds of charity, and that thus throughout the entire world the reign of his only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, may be every day more and more augmented, strengthened, and exalted. Finally, as an anticipatory pledge of every celestial gift, and as a testimony of our ardent love for you, receive our apostolic benediction, which, from the bottom of our heart, we give you with love to you, venerable brethren, to all the clergy, and to all the faithful confided to your care. Given at Rome, at St. Peter's, the 21st day of November, 1851, and of our pontificate the sixth, Pius the Ninth, Pope. End of Encyclical Letter, Exultavit Cor Nostrum, on the Effects of the Jubilee, by Pope Pius the Ninth. Encyclical Letter, Inter Multiplices, Pleading for Unity of Spirit, March 21st, 1853, by Pope Pius the Ninth. To our well-beloved sons, the cardinals, and to our venerable brethren, the archbishops and bishops of France, Pope Pius the Ninth, well-beloved sons and venerable brethren, salutation and apostolical benediction. In the midst of the multiplied sorrows, with which we are overwhelmed on all sides, in the care of all the churches which have been confided to us, notwithstanding our unworthiness, by an impenetrable design of divine providence, and in these obdurate times, in which the number is too great of those of whom the Apostle has said, for there shall be a time when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires they will heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and will indeed turn away their hearing from the truth, but will be turned unto fables. But evil men and seducers shall grow worse and worse, erring and driving into error. We experience the greatest joy when we turn our eyes and our mind towards that French nation which so many great names have illustrated, and which has merited so well of us. It is with a supreme consolation for our paternal heart that we see in that nation, by the grace of God, the Catholic religion and its saving doctrine, increasing day by day, flourishing and predominating, and with what care and what zeal you, our dear sons and venerable brothers, called to partake in our solicitude, endeavor to fulfill your ministry, and to watch over the safety and the salvation of the dear flock of which you have the charge. This consolation is singularly augmented by the respectful letters which you have written to us, and which have made more and more known to us with what filial piety, with what love, with what ardor, you glory in being devoted to us and to that chair of Peter, the center of Catholic truth and unity, chief, mother, and mistress of all the churches, to which all obedience and all honor are due, to which, because of its primacy, all the churches must join, the whole church, that is to say, the faithful, 
who are on all parts of the earth. We do not feel less satisfaction in learning that you, always calling to mind your grave episcopal functions and your duties, display all your cares as pastors and all your vigilance to have the priests of your diocese walk each day more worthily in the ways of their vocation. Give to the people the example of every virtue, and fulfill exactly the charges of their ministry, in order that the faithful who are confided to your care, being each day more abundantly nourished with the words of faith, and strengthened by the abundance of grace, may increase in the knowledge of God, and be confirmed in the way which conducts to life, and that the unfortunates who err may re-enter into the way of salvation. We know, and it is still for our heart, a sweet consolation, with what eagerness you have received our desires and our opinions, and have applied yourselves to hold provincial councils that you might guard, intact and entire, in your diocese, the deposit of the faith, in order that you might transmit sound doctrine to augment the honour of divine worship, to strengthen the institution and discipline of the clergy, to elevate and support everywhere, by a happy progress, the propriety of morals, virtue, religion, piety. We feel also a lively joy at seeing, in a great number of your dioceses, where particular circumstances do not put any obstacle to it, the liturgy of the Roman Church has been re-established according to our wishes, thanks to your eager zeal. That re-establishment has been so much the more agreeable to us that we knew that in a great many of the dioceses of France, on account of the vicissitude of the times, they had not preserved what our holy predecessor, Pius V, had prescribed with prudence and wisdom in his apostolic letters of the 7th of the Ides of July, 1568, commencing thus, Quod a nobis postulat. But in reminding you of all these things, to the great happiness of our mind, and to the praise of your order, well-beloved sons and venerable brethren, we cannot, however, disguise the great grief and anxiety which overwhelm us at this moment when we see what dissensions the old enemy strives to excite among you, to shake and weaken the concord of your minds. It is therefore in fulfilment of the duty of our apostolic ministry, and with that profound charity which we have for you and for this faithful people, we write you these letters, in which we address ourselves to you, beloved sons and venerable brethren, and at the same time we warn you, we exhort and supplicate you, to oppose with the firmness which distinguishes you, and banish entirely the dissensions which this old enemy endeavours to excite, bringing yourselves together in the bonds of charity, unanimous in your sentiments, and striving with all humility and meekness to preserve in all things unity of spirit in the bonds of peace. By this wisdom you will show that each of you knows how much the sacerdotal and faithful concord of minds, wills, and feelings is necessary for the prosperity of the Church and the eternal salvation of men. And if ever you have felt it a duty to maintain amongst you that harmony of minds and of wills, it is now above all when by the will of our dearest son in jesus christ 
Napoleon, Emperor of the French, and by the care of his government, the Catholic Church, tranquil and protected, enjoys amongst you a perfect peace. This happy state of things in that empire, and the condition of the times, should excite you more warmly to unite yourselves in the same spirit of conduct and in the same means, in order that the divine religion of Jesus Christ, its doctrine, purity of its morals, and piety, should strike everywhere in France its deep roots, that the youth should more easily find there a better and purer education, and that thereby may be arrested and broken those hostile attempts which now manifest themselves through the intrigues of those who were, and still are, the constant enemies of the Church and of Jesus Christ. This, therefore, well-beloved sons and venerable brethren, we ask of you more and more, and with all possible earnestness, that in the cause of the Church, in defense of her holy doctrine and of her liberty, and in the accomplishment of all the other duties of your episcopal charge, you should have nothing more at heart than to show among you a perfect union, than to be united in the same ideas and in the same sentiments, consulting in all confidence us and this apostolical see on the questions of all kinds which may arise, in order to prevent thus any dissension, and, before all, comprehend how far the good education of the clergy concerns the prosperity of religion and of society, to the end that you may never cease, in a perfect union of mind, to devote to an affair of such great importance your cares and your reflections continue as you have hitherto done to spare no pains that the young students intended for the church may be formed early in your seminaries to every virtue to piety to the ecclesiastical spirit in order that they may grow up in humility without which we can never please god that they may be profoundly learned in human literature and the more severe branches of knowledge, particularly in the sacred sciences, that they may, without being exposed to any peril of error, not only learn the art of speaking with eloquence, of writing elegantly, by studying either the excellent works of the Holy Fathers or the writings of the most celebrated pagan writers, when they shall have been carefully expurgated, but still more, and above all, the knowledge, perfect and durable, of the theological doctrines, of ecclesiastical history, and of the sacred canons, drawn from the authors approved by the Holy See thus that illustrious clergy of france among whom are so many eminent men distinguished by their genius their piety their learning their ecclesiastical spirit and their respectful submission to the apostolical see will abound more and more in laborers courageous and skilful who adorned with all virtues fortified by the aid of a saving learning will be able in the course of time to help you to cultivate the vineyard of the lord to reply to opponents and not only strengthen the faithful of france in our most holy religion but also propagate that religion by holy expeditions to the distant and infidel nations as the same clergy have done hitherto 
to the great glory of its name, for the good of religion and for the salvation of souls. You are penetrated as we are with sorrow at the sight of so many books, pamphlets, and poisonous journals, which are circulated furiously and without intermission in all parts by the enemy of God and man, to corrupt the morals, overturn the foundations of faith, and destroy all the dogmas of our most holy religion. Never cease, therefore, dearly beloved sons and venerable brethren, to employ all your solicitude and all your episcopal vigilance, to remove unanimously with the greatest zeal the flock confided to your care from those pestilential pastures. Never cease to instruct, to defend, to fortify against that mass of error, by admonitions and by writings opportune and salutary. And here we cannot refrain from reminding you of the advice and the counsels by which four years ago we ardently exhorted the bishops of the whole Catholic world to neglect nothing in order to engage men remarkable by their talents and their sound doctrine writings calculated to enlighten the minds and to dissipate the darkness of the errors in vogue for that reason while endeavouring to remove from the faithful committed to your solicitude the mortal poison of bad books and bad journals be pleased also we ask of you most earnestly to extend all your benevolence and all your predilection to the men who animated by a catholic spirit and versed in letters and sciences consecrate their watchful labours to writing and publishing books and journals in order that the catholic doctrine may be propagated and defended the rites worthy of all the veneration of this holy see and its acts to have all their force opinions and sentiments contrary to the holy see and to its authority to disappear the obscurity of errors to be dispelled and the understandings to be flooded with the sweet light of truth your charity and your episcopal solicitude should therefore stimulate the ardour of those catholic writers who are animated with a good spirit so that they may continue to defend the cause of catholic truth with an attentive care and with knowledge and if in their writings it should happen to them to fail in any respect you ought to warn them with paternal words and with prudence moreover your wisdom is not ignorant that the bitterest enemies of the catholic religion have always directed although vainly the most violent attacks against that chair of this blessed prince of the apostles knowing very well that religion itself can never fall nor totter as long as this chair founded on a rock shall remain standing over which the haughty gates of hell shall never triumph and in which is entire and perfect the solidity of the christian religion wherefore dearly beloved sons and venerable brethren we ask with all our power conformably to the greatness of your faith in the church and to the ardour of your devotion to this chair of peter never to cease to apply with one heart and one mind all your cares all your vigilance all your labours to this particular point so that the faithful population of france avoiding the errors and the snares which perfidious men set for them 
may make it their glory to adhere firmly and with constancy to this apostolic see with a love and a devotion every day more filial and to obey it as it is right with the greatest respect in all the ardour of your episcopal vigilance therefore neglect nothing either in action or in words to redouble more and more the love and the veneration of the faithful for the holy see and that they may receive and accomplish with the most perfect obedience all that the holy see teaches establishes and decrees and here we cannot avoid expressing to you the great grief which we felt when amongst other dangerous writings lately published in france there reached us a pamphlet printed in french and edited in paris with the title sur la situation présente de l'église gallicain relativement au droit coutumier the author of which contradicts in the most manifest manner what we have recommended to you and inculcate with so much solicitude we have sent this book to our congregation of the index in order that it may reprove and condemn it before concluding this letter well-beloved sons and venerable brethren we express to you again how desirous we are that you should reject all those discussions and all those controversies which you know disturb peace wound charity and furnish the enemies of the church with the arms with which they combat and torment it above all therefore have at heart the preservation of peace among you and maintaining it among you all seriously calling to mind that you fulfil a mission in the name of him who is not a god of dissension but a god of peace who has never ceased to recommend and ordain peace to his disciples and to place it above all other considerations and in truth christ as you all know has put all the gifts and rewards of his promise in the preservation of peace if we are heirs of christ we shall dwell in the peace of christ if we are children of god we must be peaceful the children of god must be pacific mild of heart simple in their words united in affection faithful attached among themselves by the bonds of peace the conviction and assurance that we have of your virtue your religion and your piety do not permit us to doubt that you well-beloved sons and venerable brethren acquiesce with all your hearts in the paternal advice the desires and the demands that we address to you and that you will destroy to the root all the germs of dissension and thus complete our joy supporting one another with charity and patience united and labouring with concert for the faith of the gospel continuing with increased zeal as the sentinels of the flock committed to your solicitude accomplishing with care all the functions of your weighty charge even to the consummation of the saints in the edification of the body of jesus christ be well persuaded that nothing will be more agreeable to our heart than to do all in our power for your advantage and that of the faithful nevertheless in the humiliation of our heart we pray to god and ask of him continually to bestow upon you with favour abundance of heavenly graces to bless your labours 
and your cares as pastors, so that the faithful confided to your vigilance may walk more and more agreeably to God in all things, fructifying daily in all good works. With the presage of this divine protection, and in testimony of the ardent charity with which we embrace you in the Lord, we give, with affection and from the bottom of our heart, the apostolical benediction to you, our dear sons and venerable brethren, to all the clergy, and to the faithful laity of your churches. Given at Rome, at St. Peter's, the 21st of March, in the year 1853, and 7th of our pontificate. Pope Pius IX End of Encyclical Letter Inter Multiplices Pleading for Unity of Spirit March 21st, 1853 By Pope Pius IX Encyclical Letter Neminem Vestrum on the persecution of the Armenians, February second, eighteen fifty four, by Pope Pius the Ninth, Letter of the Holy Father to the Armenians, to our venerable brothers, the Archbishop Primate and the bishops, to our well beloved sons, the clerics and the monks, and to all the faithful of the Catholic Armenian nation of the province of constantinople pius the ninth pope venerable brothers and well-beloved sons health and apostolical benediction you all know venerable brothers and well-beloved sons the paternal affection which the popes of old showed you in honouring your illustrious nation illustrious on so many titles and with what care, with what solicitude, they have sought to bring back that nation to Catholic unity. You are likewise not ignorant what fruit our predecessors gathered from so many and such incessant efforts, nor what was their joy when they had the happiness to see that a great number of Armenians having returned to the profession of Catholic unity, remained therein, firm and immovable. You know with what admirable virtue and what glory for their name the Armenian Catholics in unfortunate times have, even at the peril of their life, courageously suffered every sort of evils to defend and profess the catholic faith and unity love and zeal for which inflamed their hearts and with what perseverance this apostolic see has constantly given all the succours by which it was possible to provide in one way or another according to their own right for their necessities of every kind and particularly for their spiritual needs the episcopal hierarchy of the pastors long since re-established not being able to be maintained except in the countries most distant from the theatre of the persecution this holy see in its solicitude for the spiritual good of the armenians fixed at constantinople and in the neighbouring provinces where the bishops could not reside did not think itself permitted to neglect anything that could ensure their safety. For this reason, it applied itself in the most indefatigable manner, on the one hand, to form for your nation excellent priests, causing our Roman college to serve for this end, and, on the other hand, to excite in the minds of the young students especially of those who were directed by the religious congregations, the desire of laboring ardently for the spiritual good of your nation. You remember, venerable brothers and well-beloved sons, how, as soon as circumstances allowed of it, this apostolic see, established at Constantinople, 
an Armenian pastor invested with the episcopal dignity, and how, at a later period, the Catholic Armenians, having, thanks to the clemency of the sovereign emperor of the Turks, acquired liberty, which, by the union of souls, ought to cause religion to flourish and to give it a new vigor. An archiepiscopal and primatial see was erected for them in that same city, in order that they might have their own archbishop. Of all this, evidence is afforded by the apostolic letters of our predecessor Pius the Eighth every one is likewise aware of the indefatigable and special pains taken by our immediate predecessor gregory the sixteenth of happy memory to reconstitute that distinguished diocese and to secure more and more the advantage and prosperity of the catholic armenians for ourselves when by an incomprehensible disposal of god we were raised to this sublime chair of the prince of the apostles embracing in thought and heart the whole catholic world we turned with eagerness and love the efforts of our paternal solicitude towards this noble portion of the catholic armenian nation by the medium of our venerable brother innocent archbishop of sidon sent in quality of nuncio extraordinary to the sovereign emperor of the turks in order to express to that prince our sentiments of friendship and to convey to him at the same time our salutations we took care to recommend warmly to the powerful ottoman emperor the armenians and all the other oriental catholic nations which are found in his empire having it supremely at heart to provide for the greater good of your nation we charged our said brother to make the most scrupulous investigations on its existing state and to acquaint us with the results thereof in order that after having rightly weighed all things it might be possible for us to adopt the resolutions best adapted to obtain the spiritual advantage of your nation after that our brother in the accomplishment of the mission with which he was charged had given us all the information which he had collected with such care we approved of diverse decrees emanating from our venerable brothers the cardinals of the holy roman catholic church of the congregation of propaganda and among others that which disapproves of the society called national whence one reasonably foresaw the lamentable results which were therefrom in very great numbers to arise we afterwards published the apostolic letter by which we put into execution what our predecessor pius the eighth had resolved upon and we created five new bishoprics of the armenian rite among which was divided a great part of the old and vast diocese of constantinople we hoped by so many paternal cares to bring back to a flourishing and prosperous state the new armenian ecclesiastical province when we learned with the most lively sorrow that lamentable seeds of discord already thrown long ago by the enemy into the bosom of your nation were daily increasing and that there were not wanting people who in order to foment divisions took their text from these same measures adopted by this apostolic see to ensure your greater good this ever to be deplored dissension further assumes greater developments when each of the two parties by writings scattered among the people sets itself to discuss openly and in public the religious questions those writings drawn up in passionate and violent terms 
and containing propositions altogether contrary to Christian charity, were directly contrary to the preservation of mutual concord. They were published without the knowledge of this apostolic see and against its will, as according to our order this was declared by repeated letter of our congregation of propaganda. You all know what scandals have been the consequence thereof, to the great detriment of your nation, and with what eagerness we hastened to employ all our cares to put an end to these dissensions and these disputes, and to extirpate the germs thereof to the very root. It was for us a great consolation to behold our first efforts attain the desired end. Antony, your Archbishop of Constantinople, and Julian, Archbishop of Petra in Partibus Infidelium, our vicar apostolic for the faithful of the Latin rite, came to us, venerable brothers. After having set forth everything to us, they found themselves perfectly agreed and with our approbation they published what they had resolved upon in common and would to god that for the consolation of our paternal heart all the orders of your nation had with an equal eagerness seconded our desire in the things which our congregation of propaganda had taken care to recommend and to suggest would to god that all had received with confidence the orders and the commands which we had given solely for your common advantage we should not now have to deplore those great mischiefs and evils which have struck you which fill our soul with sorrow and of which your dissensions are the principal cause seeing that these disputes and other divisions had no end we ordered that our congregation of propaganda should obtain with the greatest possible care and celerity a profound knowledge of the questions whether ancient or new which agitate the armenian nation and that it should examine them and study them with all the attention and all the prudence which distinguish it in the successive reunions of our venerable brothers the cardinals of the holy roman church who form part of it full of solicitude for this affair we ourselves presided in one of these assemblies and after having taken the advice of these same cardinals we expressed our decision on the principal points of the above-mentioned questions, without neglecting during all that time to invoke, by assiduous and fervent prayers, God rich in mercy, that the aid of his almighty grace might render that efficacious which we were doing simply for the good of your souls not having anything more at heart than to secure your happiness and your tranquillity we have sought for all that could enable us to attain so salutary an end knowing that the evils of your nation have increased especially in consequence of the publication of the writings above mentioned and of their propagation among the people we ordered that after a special examination the principle of those writings should be prohibited and condemned and moreover we greatly disapprove of all the others which relate to this affair and which were published whether before or after those of which we have just spoken whatever be the language in which they are composed armenian vulgar armenian italian french or any other all those publications are adapted only to inspire a reciprocal hatred contrary in every point to christian charity we have moreover applied all our cares in order that in the seminary of constantinople the education of the clergy may become daily better 
and that in the religious houses a better order may be more and more observed we have ordered our congregation of propaganda to issue a decree adapted for obtaining this object and we command that this decree be scrupulously observed in all its parts to put an end to every controversy and every suspicion on the doctrines of the mckitterist monks resident at venice we will that you know that these monks have sent to us furnished with the requisite signatures an ample profession and declaration of the catholic doctrine and faith which have been for us the source of a very great consolation and which have abundantly fulfilled all our desires not only do they make professions with all their heart and in precise words to receive all the orders and all the decrees emanating or to emanate from the roman pontiffs and from the sacred congregations especially those which forbid communicating with the schismatics in sacred things but moreover they clearly and openly declare that a part of their nation the good and advantage of which their institute has principally and singly in view finds itself unhappily separated from the catholic apostolic and roman communion whereupon they declare that they embrace and regard as their brothers all those whom the holy roman and apostolic church recognizes for her sons and condemning the error of the schismatical armenians they confess that they are outside the true church of jesus christ resolved never to cease to pray to preach to employ themselves by their acts their writings and by their words to bring back those wanderers to the sole and only fold of jesus christ whereof the sole sovereign pastor the sole chief the sole centre is the roman pontiff successor of peter prince of the apostles we further notify to you that other suitable measures have been taken in order to cause all fear to cease regarding the colleges in which those monks educate the armenian faith lastly in order that the principal work commenced herein by our predecessors and accomplished by us may prosper thanks to the ordinary hierarchy of the bishops established among you for this object and in order that the election whether of the archbishop primate or of the sacred bishops his suffragans may be enabled to be made in an suitable manner we have ordered that our congregation of propaganda take the necessary measures and that communication thereof be made to that archbishop and those bishops all these things sufficiently show venerable brothers and well-beloved sons what is our solicitude for your spiritual good and with what ardour of paternal charity we love in the lord your armenian nation we now address to you the present letter addressing ourselves to all of you with affection and exhorting you admonishing you praying of you that as the elect of god you clothe yourselves with goodness with humility with modesty with patience and that united to each other by the close tie of concord and of charity you completely put an end to enmities to disputes to quarrels to angers to dissensions to keep peace and sanctity in all things to walk with one heart and one soul in the ways of perfection preserving with the greatest solicitude that unity of spirit which our lord jesus christ 
has so much praised and so strongly inculcated on us. We have confidence that your filial piety towards us and towards this holy see will lead you to show yourselves docile to our admonitions, to our exhortations, to our desires, and to our prayers so much the more because instructed by a sad experience you now recognize what calamities the division of minds has caused your illustrious nation which would always have been happy and prosperous if remaining all united and loving each other you had all walked in the love of god go over then in your mind the misfortunes which have smitten you in consequence of your disorders meditate seriously on that word every city or house divided against itself shall not stand have always present that warning of the apostle if you bite and devour one another take heed you be not consumed one of another let nothing for the future be more precious to you have nothing more at heart than to entertain among you with an altogether special care and zeal the christian union of souls the preservation of peace and of all things which secure it call to mind with what paternal solicitude our predecessor pius the eighth recommended it to you in the apostolic letter by which he instituted your archiepiscopal and primatial see and which he terminated with these words of another of our predecessors saint leo the great it is the harmony of all the parts of the body which constitutes thereof one whole of health and of beauty and that harmony cannot subsist except by the agreement of all those which form it but principally by the union of the priests salutary warnings which were given you anew by our predecessor gregory the sixteenth whose zeal neglected nothing to excite in you the desire of preserving a mutual concord and the union of souls we now address ourselves to you in particular venerable brothers bishops of this province of constantinople and we ardently conjure you in the lord to be united in everything to redouble zeal never to cease by your acts by your words and by your examples to exhort the faithful committed to your cares and to enkindle in their hearts the love of concord of charity repressing and crushing everything that might be a cause of discord applying yourselves in the union of souls of wills and of opinions to accomplish scrupulously all the duties so weighty of your episcopal ministry feed the flock of god which is among you taking care of it not by constraint but willingly according to god neither as lording it over the clergy but being made a pattern of the flock from the heart and in the first place spare no pains no counsel no fatigue in order that in your diocese may be preserved entire and incorruptible the deposit of our divine faith in order that the clergy may therein be holily brought up according to the best discipline formed with solicitude unto all the virtues and unto the ecclesiastical spirit and instructed especially in the sacred sciences in such a way as to avoid all danger of error to the end 
that the faithful, nourished daily more and more in the doctrine of the Catholic religion and of its holy precepts, may be fortified by the gift of the graces, may avoid evil, may practice good, may increase in the knowledge of God, may walk always more ardently in the ways of the Lord, may follow the path that leads to life, and to the end that honesty of manners, integrity of life, virtue, religion, and piety may daily grow, flourish, and reign in all souls. After the example of the Prince of Pastors, who was sweet and humble of heart, and who has left to us his examples, in order that we might imitate them, make it above all a point, venerable brothers, to act in a spirit of sweetness and gentleness towards the unhappy wanderers, in order to bring them back into the right road of justice and of truth. Following the precept of the Apostle, correct, entreat, rebuke with kindness, patience, and doctrine. For in order to correct, benevolence has often much more efficacy than severity, exhortation than menace, charity than authority. If sometimes you are reduced to use severity, where gentler remedies not having any effect, the gravity of the evil requires stronger ones, punish the delinquents conformably to what the sacred canons prescribe, uniting mercy to severity, zeal to gentleness, rigor to sweetness, as doth in a sovereign degree become the pastors of the church, who ought to show themselves to those who are committed to them as mothers in tenderness, as fathers in firmness. Our words are addressed also to you, well-beloved sons of all the orders of the secular and regular clergy, who, devoted to the sacred ministry, have chosen the Lord for your portion of heritage. Docile and obedient to your bishops, as is fitting, never forgetting the dignity of your vocation, strive by the gravity of your manners and the holiness of your life to inspire into the people a great love and a great respect for your order, and to secure more and more the increase of ecclesiastical edification. Avoiding with the greatest care the things which are forbidden to clerics, and which are in no way suitable to them, take heed never to do anything which may be to others a stone of stumbling, and apply yourselves to become patterns for all, in your words, in your conversations, by a true charity, by faith and chastity. When necessity or the obligations of the sacred ministry shall bring you into the houses of seculars, let all your actions recall the dignity and the greatness of the ecclesiastical character. Adorned with all virtues, breathe forth everywhere the good odor of Jesus Christ. And you, religious, have always before your eyes the decree of the 20th of August of last year, and take care to observe it in every point. Ecclesiastics, both of the one and of the other order of the clergy, never cease to pray assiduously to the Lord, to the end that he may pour forth over you and over the Christian people the abundance of the gifts 
of his heavenly grace. Cease not also ardently to give yourself up to study, above all to the study of the divine scriptures and of the sacred sciences, in order to be able to answer those who expect from your life the knowledge of the law, and to be able to instruct in the divine precepts those who are in ignorance or in error. Engaged not with your own interests, but with the interests of Jesus Christ, seek, well-beloved sons, to accomplish piously and holily the duties of your sacred ministry, and employ all your pains under the direction of your own bishop to secure the eternal salvation of the faithful, to promote more and more our most holy religion and its doctrine, to extirpate the seeds of discord, and to inspire into all the love of Christian concord and of peace. All wisdom comes from God. Let those, therefore, who possess knowledge not allow themselves to be puffed up with pride, but, rendering humble acts of thanksgiving to God most merciful, the author of all good, let them make their learning avail to the edification of their neighbor and to their own edification, considering seriously that God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble, and that those who have received the greatest gifts will also be judged more severely. Our predecessor, St. Gregory the Great, observes with much wisdom that the more gifts increase, the more the obligation of rendering account thereof extends itself, and that man ought to show himself so much the more humble and so much the more eager to serve God in the exercise of the functions which are confided to him, as the obligation of rendering account to God is more weighty and greater. Let no one among you give grounds for believing that he envies the other ecclesiastics, especially those of his order, the gifts which may turn to the spiritual advantage of the neighbor. We will now turn ourselves towards you all, well-beloved sons in Jesus Christ of the Catholic Armenian nation, who inhabit the ecclesiastical province of Constantinople, whatever may be your order, your age, your sex, your condition. We love you in the Lord with an altogether paternal love. And it is for this reason that we warn you and we entreat of you to put an end to all the existing irritations to all the disagreements, to all the quarrels, to all the dissensions. Let peace and concord reign among you, bearing with each other in all charity. Have it in a sovereign degree at heart to hold yourselves daily more firm in the profession of the Catholic religion, constantly and with your whole heart. To us, and to the chair of the blessed prince of the apostles, assiduously practising charity towards God and towards the neighbour, religiously accomplishing all the commandments of God and of the church, and doing all things solely for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be subject and obedient to your bishops whom the Holy Ghost has placed to govern the Church of God. The care of your salvation has been confided to them, and they will have one day to render a most severe account thereof to the eternal Prince of Pastors. It is for this reason they are bound to consecrate 
their vigils, their cares, and their toils, to guide you in the way of salvation, and by the true doctrine to fortify the weak, to reanimate the inconstant, to bring back the wanderers, and to distribute the word of life, the food of eternity. Let no one of you resist his own bishop. Let no one of you undertake in any sort to give the law to him. Above all, in the things which pertain to the episcopal ministry and to his authority. And you, who in this Catholic Armenian nation occupy among the others a rank distinguished by your condition, your offices, your authority, listen also to our words. To the splendor of rank and of dignities, join the splendor of virtue. Nothing could be more advantageous and more happy for your illustrious nation, for it is upon you that the Christian people model themselves. They follow your examples. We earnestly demand of you to be daily more ardent in the love of religion, to employ your zeal for the maintenance of concord, and not only never to undertake anything against the church or against your pastors, as those are accustomed to do who are separated from Catholic unity, but further to aid them by your counsels, by your cares, to the end that the Catholic Church may grow and prosper among you, and that all may be animated with the sentiments of respect, of devotion, and of docility, which they owe, whether to the authority of Peter and of his successors, the Roman pontiffs, divinely charged to feed, that is to say, to rule and to govern the universal church, or to the sacred and venerable authority of the bishops over their own flock, knowing that neither the one nor the other can in any manner be under the dependence and the subjection of any civil power whatsoever. Consider what glory you can acquire to yourselves, and what a reward you can assure to yourselves from God, who recompenses every good, if, conforming yourselves to our warnings, to our desires, to our exhortations, you employ yourselves with all your power in obtaining the advantage and the prosperity of our most holy religion. Before concluding this letter, to remove all doubt and all ambiguity, we think it opportune, venerable brothers and well-beloved sons, to touch on one point upon which the extreme diversity of sentiments has thrown confusion, and which is not one of the least causes of your dissensions. Those persons assuredly deserve much praise who desire the return to Catholic unity of that part of Armenia which is still buried in schism. This desire is conformable to the ardent wishes of Holy Mother Church, who ceases not for a single moment to pray God and to supplicate Him to bring back into His bosom all his dissident sons. It is conformable to the incessant efforts and to the zeal of this holy see, which has labored so much, and which labors with so much ardor and perseverance for this object. And we ourselves, as you are aware, from the commencement of our pontificate profiting by the occasion offered to us, by the journey of our nuncio, envoy to the illustrious emperor of the Turks, we addressed a letter to the Orientals, lovingly to engage them to return to the profession of Catholic unity. 
and would to God that your whole nation, yielding to the impulse of heavenly grace and abjuring its errors, returned in a spirit of union and of docility to the only fold of Christ, outside of which is found whoever is not united to this holy see of Peter, from which flow upon all the rites of venerable communion, to which is due all obedience and all honour, and to which, in virtue of the prerogative given by the sovereign principality, it is necessary that all the church attach itself, that is to say, all the faithful scattered over the earth. For us our unspeakable consolation, for the universal church an immense joy, would be the return of all your entire nation to Catholic unity. And this ought to make you comprehend, venerable brothers and well-beloved sons, that not only are we unable to approve of the conduct of those who use hard and bitter menaces towards the schismatics of your nation, and who have not the proper regards for them, but further that we are bound highly and unreservedly to disapprove of other persons who, instead of love and of benevolence, show nothing but antipathy and severity, even towards those who have quitted schism to re-enter into the bosom of Catholic unity. Nor can we any more endure that some persons, under pretext of promoting this unity, will not make any distinction among the errors of the schismatics, that, making no account of the care which the Holy See has taken in all ages to maintain the ancient and holy rites of the Oriental Church, they pretend to impose the minute observance of all that is now practised among the schismatics, and to cause to be abolished certain usages legitimately introduced into your Catholic nation, to manifest in a more solemn manner with what energy it repels heresy and schism, and maintains itself immovable in Catholic unity. These same men would desire, moreover, to abolish certain practices and certain ecclesiastical rules which ought to have been added to the doctrine of the ancient canons, experience demonstrating the necessity thereof. They forget that the Catholic Church differs from every point of schism and of heresy, which are dead things. For her, she is living. Her vigor loses not itself. Heaped up with the treasures of heavenly riches, mistress of truth, beacon of salvation, she is the mother and nurse of the holy works and of the admirable institutions which maintain and propagate religion, piety, beneficence, all the virtues, and by which she provides, in a marvellous manner, for the common advantage, for good order, for universal concord and prosperity. You cannot be ignorant that it is against the suggestions of men engaged in spreading abroad such opinions that our predecessor Gregory the Sixteenth directed the apostolic letter of february third eighteen thirty two inter gravissimas but what is strange and calculated to excite astonishment is that these same men who hold so obstinately to the rites make no scruple of departing in other articles from the canons of that same oriental church after all that our unwearied love for your Catholic Armenian nation 
has engaged us, venerable brothers and well-beloved sons, to acquaint you with, and to declare to you by this letter, in order to dissipate every kind of doubt and of uncertainty, we love to hope that God seconding the lively ardour of our desires, one shall see, rising again and reigning anew among you, that concord and that peace which can alone restore prosperity to your nation and in order that you may be able to recover that tranquillity so desirable and so salutary we impose by this letter a perpetual and absolute silence on the past questions and controversies severely forbidding every reclamation every discussion calculated to disturb peace among the faithful of armenia and also every qualification of heresy and of schism which people might use in regard to those who are in communion with our apostolic see and who enjoy its good will if it happens that any one transgresses our orders on this point which we hope will never occur if it happens that persons raise new suspicions a regular inquiry shall immediately be set on foot and the facts shall be set forth to our apostolic see the proper documents being forwarded to it conformably to the canons and as after all these admonitions and these declarations the disturbers would render themselves thenceforward very culpable to whatever condition they belong they shall not be able to flatter themselves that they shall escape in any way and under any pretext whatever from the just severity which shall be used in proceeding against them but the numerous testimonies of filial piety of respect and of love which on many occasions we have received on the part of diverse classes of your catholic armenian nation whether towards us or towards this holy apostolic see give us the well-founded hope that we shall receive from that same nation abundant subjects of consolation and of joy in this firm confidence we shall not cease to offer to the clemency of the father of mercies humble and fervent prayers that he may be pleased venerable brothers and well-beloved sons to heap prosperities upon you in order that the peace which surpasseth all understanding may keep your hearts and minds, and that the grace of God and the communication of the Holy Ghost may be with you all. As a pledge of the goods which we wish you, and of our ardent charity for you, we give unto you all, venerable brothers and well-beloved sons, our apostolic benediction in all the effusion of our heart. Given at Rome, at St. Peter's, February 2nd, 1854, the eighth year of our pontificate. Pope Pius IX. End of Encyclical Letter Neminem Vestrum On the Persecution of the Armenians February 2nd, 1854, by Pope Pius IX. Encyclical Letter Apostolicae Nostri Caritatis, Urging Prayers of Peace, by Pope Pius IX. To our venerable brothers, the patriarchs, primates, archbishops, bishops, and other ordinaries having grace and communion with the Apostolic See, Pius Pope IX venerable brothers health and apostolical benediction 
while contemplating the whole catholic world with the solicitude and affection of our apostolic charity we can scarcely give expression venerable brothers to the profound grief with which we are afflicted when we behold the christian and civil commonwealth oppressed and harassed on all sides with the most deplorable calamities of every kind to a lamentable extent for you well know how the christian nations are afflicted and scourged with the most cruel wars or with intestine disturbances or pestilential disease or mighty earthquakes or other great evils and this is even especially to be lamented that among so many evils and misfortunes which can never sufficiently be deplored the children of darkness who are wiser in their generation than the children of light struggle more and more every day with all kinds of diabolical frauds artifices and efforts to wage a most bitter war against the catholic church and salutary doctrine to pull down and destroy the authority of all legitimate power to corrupt and deprave the minds and intellect of all to propagate on all sides the deadly poison of indifferentism and incredulity to confuse all rights divine and human to stir up dissensions discords and the commotions of impious rebellion to encourage all kinds of depravity and the most cruel crimes and to leave nothing untried so that if it were possible our most holy religion might be obliterated from the midst of us and human society overturned from its foundation knowing well therefore in the midst of such imminent danger that by the singular kindness of a merciful god there has been given to us in prayer the means of obtaining all good things of which we stand in need and of averting the evils which we fear we have not failed to raise our eyes towards the lofty and holy mountain whence we hope to obtain aid and in the humility of our heart we do not cease with fervent and earnest prayer to implore and beseech almighty god rich in mercy that taking away warfare to the end of the earth and removing all dissensions he may bestow upon christian princes and their people peace concord and tranquillity and that he may especially grant to the princes themselves a most pious zeal always to guard and propagate catholic faith and doctrine in which the happiness of their people is principally compromised that he may rescue both princes and people from all the evils with which they were afflicted and gladden them with all true prosperity that he may bestow the gifts of his heavenly grace upon those who are in error so that they may return from the road of perdition to the paths of truth and justice and be converted to god in sincerity of heart but although we have already ordered prayers to implore the divine clemency to be offered in this our city nevertheless following the footsteps of our predecessors we have determined to have recourse to your prayers also and to those of the universal church we have therefore venerable brothers written to you this letter by which we again and again implore of your excellent and well-known piety that for the above-mentioned reasons you would with all care and diligence urge the faithful entrusted to your care that laying down the burthen of sin by means of true penance they may by prayer and fasting and almsgiving and other works of piety endeavor to appease the wrath of the lord provoked by the wickedness of men in your own piety and wisdom explain to the people how full of mercy is god to all who invoke him and how great is the power of prayer if we approach the lord without allowing the enemy of our salvation to come near us for to use the words of chrysostom prayer is the fountain the root and the mother of innumerable good things the force of prayer has overcome the power of fire curbed the fury of lions subdued wars as which strife calmed the tempest put demons to flight opened the gates of heaven broke the chains of death expelled disease repelled misfortunes strengthened tottering cities and removed the scourges of heaven the snares of men and all other evils 
but we earnestly desire venerable brothers that while fervent prayers are offered up to the most clement father of mercies for the above-named purpose you and your people would not cease to implore him supplicating with still more earnest according to the encyclical letter of the second day of february eighteen forty nine given to you at gaeta that by the light of his holy spirit he would propitiously deign to enlighten our mind that he may be able as soon as possible to decree concerning the conception of the most holy mother of god the immaculate virgin mary what may pertain to the greater glory of god himself and the praise of the same virgin the most loving mother of us all and now in order that the faithful and trusted to you may pray with more fervent charity and more abundant fruit we have determined to bring forth and give out those treasures of heavenly gifts the dispensation of which has been entrusted to us by the most high for which reason relying on the mercy of almighty god and on the authority of his blessed apostles peter and paul out of that power of binding and loosing which the lord has committed to us though unworthy we by this letter unto all and each of the faithful of your diocese of either sex who within the space of three months to be fixed by each of you and to be computed from the day which each of you shall have appointed having confessed their sins humbly and with a sincere detestation of them and having been expiated by sacramental absolution shall have reverently received the most holy sacrament of the eucharist and shall have devoutly visited either three churches pointed out by you or three times one of them and shall have there for some space of time offered up their pious prayers to god according to our intention and for the exaltation and prosperity of our holy mother the church and of the apostolic see for the extirpation of heresies for the peace and concord of christian princes and the peace and unity of the whole christian people and shall moreover within the same interval of time have fasted once and given some alms to the poor according to their devotion do concede and grant a plenary indulgence of all their sins in the form of a jubilee which indulgence may also be applied in the way of suffrage for the souls in purgatory and that this indulgence may also be gained by nuns and by other persons living perpetually in cloister and also by those who are in prison or are prevented by bodily infirmity or other impediment from performing any of the aforesaid works we give to confessors the faculty of commuting the same into other works of piety or of postponing them to another proximate time with the power also of dispensing with the communion of children who have not yet been admitted to their first communion wherefore we empower you on this occasion and during the aforesaid space of three months only to confer on the confessors of your diocese by our apostolic authority all those same faculties which were conferred by us in the jubilee conceded by our encyclical letter of the twenty first of november eighteen fifty one transmitted to you published and beginning ex aliis nostri always however with all those exceptions reserved by us in that letter moreover we give you the faculty of granting to the faithful of your diocese both laity and ecclesiastics secular and regular and of whatsoever institute the permission to choose for themselves for this purpose any priest as their confessor whether secular or regular of those who are approved and of giving the same permission to religious although exempt from the jurisdiction of the ordinary and to other women residing within cloisters act therefore venerable brothers as called to share in our solicitude and as being constituted watchmen on the walls of jerusalem cease not in union with us day and night in all prayer and entreaty with thanksgiving humbly and earnestly to cry to our lord god and implore his divine mercy that he may propitiously avert the scourges of his anger which we deserve for our sins and that he may clemently pour out the riches of his goodness upon all we have no manner of doubt but that you will most fully comply with these our desires and requests and we are quite certain that all especially ecclesiastics and religious men and nuns and also the faithful lady who living piously in christ 
walk worthily in the vocation to which they have been called will with the most ardent effort of piety address their suppliant prayers to god without intermission and that god may the more easily incline his ear to our prayers let us not omit venerable brothers to ask the suffrages of those who being already crowned have obtained the palm and in the first place and always let us invoke the mother of god the immaculate virgin mary than whom there is no more fit or more powerful intercessor with god and who is the mother of grace and mercy and let us next invoke the patronage of the holy apostles peter and paul and of all the saints who reign with christ in heaven but to you let nothing be of more interest or importance than assiduously to exhort admonish and encourage those entrusted to your care that they may continue immovable and with daily increasing stability in the profession of the catholic religion that they may most carefully avoid the snares fallacies and frauds of hostile men and more that they may walk with a more ready step in the paths of god's commandments and that they may most diligently keep themselves from sins from which flow all evils upon the human race wherefore cease not continually to inflame the zeal especially of parish priests that fulfilling their own duty sedulously and religiously they may never omit to imbue and instruct most accurately the christian people committed to them in the most holy rudiments and precepts of our divine faith to feed them diligently by the administration of the sacraments and to exhort them all in sound doctrine finally as a sign of all heavenly gifts and in testimony of our most ardent love receive our apostolic benediction which proceeding from our inmost heart we very lovingly bestow upon you venerable brothers and upon all the faithful clerics and lady entrusted to your vigilance given in rome at st peter's on the first day of august in the year eighteen fifty four in the ninth year of our pontificate pious pope the ninth end of encyclical letter apostolicae nostre caritatis urging prayers of peace by pope pius the ninth encyclical letter in a deus god the ineffable concerning the dogma of the immaculate conception by pope pius the ninth encyclical letter in a deus god the ineffable by pope pius the ninth pius bishop servant of the servants of god for the perpetual memory of the thing god the ineffable whose ways are mercy and truth whose will is omnipotence and whose wisdom with ease spans all space from end unto end and sweetly disposes all things foresaw from all eternity the most dire destruction which awaited the whole human race having its rise in the transgression of adam and determined with deep design for ages hidden within his own mind to complete by virtue of a mystery still more hidden through the incarnation of the word the first work of his goodness to the end that mankind after having been drawn into guilt by the foul cunning and fiendish artifice of the devil should not perish contrary to his creator's merciful design upon him and that what was likely to be lost in the case of the first adam should be restored with advantage on the part of the second from the beginning therefore and before all ages he made choice of and set in her proper place a mother for his only begotten son from whom he after being made flesh should be born in the blessed fullness of time and he continued his persevering regards for her in preference to all other creatures besides and to such a degree that in her alone he took complacency with the most exceeding good will wherefore he enriched her so wonderfully far and away beyond all the angelic spirits and all the saints with the plenitude of every celestial favor drawn down from the treasury of the divinity that she entirely free as she always was from every stain of sin and all beautiful and perfect presented such a full measure of innocence and sanctity 
that a greater than it under god is not understood and no one except god can ever in thought comprehend and in truth it was wholly becoming that she ever shining with the splendors of the most perfect saintliness should gleam with glory and free absolutely as she was from the stain of every original guilt should obtain the most decisive triumph over the old serpent a mother so venerable to whom god the father had ordained to give his only begotten son whom co-equal to himself begotten he loves from his heart and to give him in such a way that he would be by nature one and the same common son of god the father and of the virgin and of whom the son himself made choice to be substantially his mother and of whom the holy ghost wished and by his operation caused that he from whom himself proceeds should be conceived and born this original innocence of the august virgin which is itself closely combined with her admirable sanctity and her most exalted dignity of mother of god the catholic church which is ever instructed by the holy spirit and which is the pillar and the ground of truth possesses as the doctrine received from on high and included in the deposit of the revelation of heaven and this doctrine she has never ceased to explain to put forward and to cherish more and more every day as well by manifold arguments continuously and rigorously put as by deeds of magnificence for the church most plainly approved this doctrine growing as it has been in strength from time immemorial deeply rooted too in the breasts of the faithful and wonderfully propagated throughout the catholic world by the labors and zeal of her prelates on the occasion when she hesitated not to propose the conception of the same virgin to the public worship and veneration of the faithful by which illustrious act the church has in truth held up the conception of this virgin mary as singular wonderful and completely foreign to and far away removed from the original inception of the rest of mankind and in itself entirely holy and deserving of worship for the church is not wont to celebrate festival days in honor of any but of saints alone and on that account it has been her practice as well in the ecclesiastical offices as in the sacred liturgy to apply the very words in which the sacred scriptures speak of the uncreated wisdom and put forward his eternal origin and to adapt them to the first beginnings of the holy virgin beginnings which had been forecast and portrayed in one and the same decree with the incarnation of the divine wisdom although these truths received almost everywhere and put into practice by the faithful show with what zeal on this head the roman catholic church the mother and mistress of all churches has continued to teach this doctrine of the immaculate conception of the virgin yet the noble and magnificent deeds of this church are specially worthy of being mentioned in detail for the dignity of this very church and her authority are so great as in every way is due to her who is the centre of catholic truth and of unity the church in which alone religion has been inviolably preserved and from which as from the stock or parent tree all the other churches must needs receive the seeds and sap of holy faith on this account the same roman church had nothing more at heart than by every means and by agencies the most eloquent that could be devised to establish to protect promote and defend the doctrine as well as the religious reverence of the immaculate conception of the blessed virgin this fact the many important acts of the roman pontiffs our predecessors indeed most plainly and clearly show to the whole world men to whom in the person of the prince of the apostles were entrusted from heaven by christ our lord the supreme care and the power of feeding the lambs and the sheep and of confirming their brethren and of ruling and regulating the entire church our predecessors considered it in truth the source of exceeding great glory to institute by virtue of their apostolic authority the feast of the conception throughout the roman church and to heighten its importance and dignity by an appropriate office and two by a special appointed mass 
by which the singular prerogative of the virgin her complete exemption from every hereditary stain was in a most manifest manner affirmed they considered it also their greatest glory to promote by every means and to extend the public veneration already in practice at one time by granting indulgences again conceding permission to cities provinces and kingdoms to make choice as their patroness of the mother of god under the title of the immaculate conception or again approving confraternities congregations and religious institutions founded in honor of the immaculate conception or in bestowing merited eulogy on the piety of those who under the title of the immaculate conception erected monasteries hospitals altars temples or on those who should bind themselves by religious obligations of a vow to support with enduring firmness the doctrine of the immaculate conception of the mother of god in addition to this they were pleased exceedingly to decree that the festival of the conception should be held by the entire church in the same rank and of the same class as the festival of the nativity and also that the festival of the conception should be celebrated with an octave by the entire church and that it should be kept holy by all persons in the same way as those are kept which are holy days of obligation and that a pontifical chapel should be held each single year in our liberian pontifical basilica on the day held sacred in honor of the conception of the virgin in fine desiring to render firm each day more and more in the minds of the faithful this doctrine concerning the immaculate conception of the mother of god and to excite their piety and their zeal for the worship and veneration due to the virgin conceived without original stain they have granted with gladness and delight power to proclaim the immaculate conception of the virgin in the litanies of loreto and in the preface of the holy mass to the end that the rule of prayer might serve to establish thereby a rule of belief now we ourselves walking in the footsteps of our illustrious predecessors have not only approved and received these things which had been established before our time but mindful even of the precept of sixtus the fourth we have confirmed by the authority vested in us a proper office in honour of the immaculate conception and with great joy of mind we have moreover conceded its use to the entire church but since the things which belong to external veneration are clearly by an intimate connection coupled with the object of the same and that those cannot continue settled and stable if the object be fluctuating and floating in the region of doubt our predecessors the roman pontiffs wishing with all care to enlarge and to extend the public devotion in honour of the conception devoted themselves accordingly with all possible pains to declare its object and to inculcate the precise doctrine for they clearly and openly taught that it was in honour of the conception of the virgin the feast was held and they proscribed as false and entirely estranged from the spirit of the church the opinion of those who taught and affirmed that it was not the conception itself but the sanctification which was the object of external veneration proposed by the church nor did they think that greater mildness ought to be exercised towards those who for the purpose of subverting the doctrine concerning the immaculate conception of the virgin devised a difference between the first instant and moment and the second instant of conception and insisted that the conception indeed was the object celebrated but not viewed in relation to the first instant and moment the fact is our predecessors considered it a portion of their obligations to protect and defend with all possible zeal the feast itself of the conception of the blessed virgin and the conception for the first instant and moment as the real and true object of veneration hence the plainly decisive character of these words in which alexander the seventh one of our predecessors declared the clear meaning of the church truly ancient indeed is the piety of those faithful children of christ towards the virgin mary his most blessed mother who hold the opinion that her soul in the first instant of its creation and of its infusion into the body had been by a special grace and privilege of god and by virtue of the merits of her son jesus christ the redeemer of the human race preserved free from every stain of original sin 
and in this sense were accustomed to honor with solemn rite and to celebrate the festival of her conception and that above all was held by our predecessors a matter of the greatest importance to defend with all their zeal and energy the doctrine of the immaculate conception of the mother of god which they had kept safe from all tampering and had with every possible care protected really not only did they not tolerate in any way that the doctrine itself should in any wise be censured or controverted by any person but they went further still and by clear and manifest declarations repeated time after time proclaimed above board that the doctrine by which we profess the immaculate conception of the virgin is quite in accord with the worship practiced in holy church and that it should be as such regarded that it is an ancient doctrine and quite universal and of that class of teaching which the roman church has taken upon herself the responsibility to see fostered and defended and moreover that it was in every respect deserving of having a place in the sacred liturgy and in prayers of a solemn character they were not satisfied even with all this nay in order that the doctrine regarding the immaculate conception of the virgin should continue free from all attack they prohibited with the utmost rigor to have the opinion opposed to this teaching defended in public or in private and they manifested a wish to see it after so many as it were home thrusts entirely done away with and lest these clear and oft repeated declarations should appear futile they have thereto annexed a sanction all this our worthy predecessor alexander the seventh has comprised in the following words consider that the holy roman church celebrates in a solemn manner the feast of the conception of the spotless mary ever virgin and that of old she established a special and an appropriate office on that head and in accordance with the pious devout and laudable institution which then emanated from sixtus the fourth our predecessor moreover on our own part wishing after the example of the roman pontiffs our predecessors to favor this piety and devotion and the festival too and the worship rendered in conformity therewith and which from the days when that worship was first established and has undergone no change in the church of rome and wishing to guard this pious practice and religious respect which consists in honoring and by public worship celebrating the blessed virgin mary who through the prevenient grace of the holy ghost had been preserved free from original sin and desiring to preserve in the fold of jesus christ the unity of spirit in the bond of peace by repressing every cause of offence and delaying contentions and removing scandals we at the solicitation made on us and at the earnest entreaty of the forenamed bishops with the chapters of their churches and of king philip and of the kingdoms over which he holds sovereign sway renew the constitutions and decrees published by the roman pontiffs our predecessors and in an especial manner by sixtus the fourth pius the fifth and gregory the fifteenth in favor of that opinion which declares that the soul of the blessed virgin mary during her creation and at the moment of its infusion into the body was enriched with the grace of the holy ghost and was preserved free from original sin and also in favor of the festival and of the worship established in honor of the conception of the same virgin mary mother of god and rendered to her according to that pious opinion these we renew and under the censures and penalties decreed in the same constitutions we command that they be carried into effect and moreover all and each individual who shall persist in interpreting the forementioned constitutions or decrees in such a way as to undo the favor arising from them in regard to the opinion of the pious faithful and to the festival and to the worship paid in accordance with that opinion or those who shall have the daring to introduce as a subject of discussion this same opinion or the festival or the worship paid or who shall call into question these points in any manner directly or indirectly or under any pretext whatsoever even that of examining whether the opinion ought to be defined or not or even for the sake of explaining or interpreting the sacred scriptures or the holy fathers or doctors finally who shall have the boldness to express 
under any pretext or on any occasion at all by voice or pen or to preach discuss dispute determining thereby anything at all opposed to these practices or by asserting or bringing forward arguments against them or leaving without full and satisfactory answers objections put or discussing these subjects in any other conceivable way all and each of these we wish to subject to the penalties and censures put forward in the constitutions of sixtus the fourth and besides these penalties to which we wish those persons to be liable and to which we do actually by the present letters subject them it is our wish to deprive them of the faculties of exhorting lecturing in public teaching or commentating and besides that our wish is that in all appointments they are to have no elective voice either actively or passively and that eo ipso without any other declaration thereof they are deprived of these faculties not only this but they have without any further notification than the fact itself incurred the penalty of perpetual disability either to preach or to lecture in public to teach or to elucidate from all these penalties they cannot by any other than by ourselves or our successors the roman pontiffs be absolved or be dispensed in them moreover it is our will to subject these persons to other penalties likely to be inflicted in accordance with our own decision hereafter or with the decision of the same roman pontiffs our successors as we do hereby by the present letters subject to them renewing again the constitutions or the decrees just a little before alluded to of paul v and gregory the fifteenth as to the books in which a doubt is raised either with regard to the aforesaid opinion or to the legitimacy of the festival or to the veneration consequently owed or in which is written or put forward anything in any way contrary to those things above mentioned or which contain statements discourses treaties or disquisitions against the same and which have been issued since the above highly valued decree of paul v or in any manner hereafter to be issued these we prohibit under the penalties and censures contained in the index of books condemned and moreover we wish and ordain that by the very act they be held as expressly prohibited and indeed all the world knows with what zeal this doctrine of the immaculate conception of the virgin mother of god has been handed down asserted and defended as well as by those religious orders which are looked up to as the most respectable as by the most celebrated theologians of the schools and the doctors who excel most in the science of divine things all are in like manner aware how solicitously the bishops were even in ecclesiastical assemblies desirous of professing as well publicly as privately that the most holy virgin mother of god through prevision of the merits of our lord and saviour jesus christ had never been subjected to original sin but had been entirely preserved from the stain with which we are all born to all which it is necessary to add the most important and by far the weightiest authority that of the very council of trent on the occasion of publishing its dogmatic decree in which according to the testimony of the sacred scriptures of the holy fathers and of the most approved councils it is established and defined that all men are born stained with original guilt nevertheless the same holy council declares in the most solemn manner that it was not their intention to include in the ample comprehension of that definition the blessed and immaculate virgin mary mother of god by this declaration the fathers of the council of trent have made it sufficiently understood taking the circumstances and the time into consideration that the blessed virgin was free from original sin and have also clearly signified that neither from the divine writings nor from tradition nor yet from the authority of the popes can anything fairly be advanced in any way contradictory of this prerogative of the virgin and indeed as a matter of fact this doctrine of the immaculate conception of the most blessed virgin mary has ever existed in the church it has every other day been more and more brought into light rendered clear and established by the deepest religious sense of the church by her teaching in the schools her zeal knowledge and wisdom 
it has been propagated in a wonderful manner amongst all the races and nations of the catholic world and the church has regarded it as a sacred deposit received from the ancient fathers and stamped with the glorious impress of revealed doctrine of this the monuments of antiquity which are deserving of all respect and credit in the eastern as well as the western church bear the strongest testimony for the church of christ the sedulous guardian and defender of the dogmas entrusted to her keeping never changes never takes anything from or adds anything to the ancient records but with all possible carefulness dealing in their regard with trustworthy and wise consideration she makes it her study to polish and perfect whatever in ancient times sprouted into shape or which the faith of the fathers planted so that the ancient dogmas of the doctrine which came from heaven may receive evidence light distinctness of form yet retain fullness completeness and character and that their nature may be developed each in its own order without being changed and they may continue on in the same dogma in the same sense and in the same meaning indeed the holy fathers and ecclesiastical writers thoroughly schooled in the language of heaven had nothing more at heart in the books which they wrote and published for the purpose of explaining the sacred scriptures vindicating dogmas and instructing the faithful than to praise beyond measure and exult in manifold and magnificent ways the perfect sanctity of the virgin her dignity and complete immunity from every stain of sin and the splendid victory she had obtained over the foulest foe of the human race it is in this way they have acted in explaining the words in which god in the very infancy of the world alluded to the remedies which he had in his fatherly fondness prepared for restoring mankind to their lost inheritance words by which he not only confounded the shamelessness of the deceiving serpent but also raised in a wonderful manner the hopes of our race when he said i will put enmity between thee and the woman between thy seed and her seed they have taught that in this divine declaration was clearly and plainly showed forth the merciful redeemer of the human race namely jesus christ the only begotten son of god and that his most blessed mother the virgin mary was specially spoken of and that at the same time the antagonism of both the one and the other against the devil was pointedly put forward as the self-same wherefore as christ the mediator between god and man has by assuming human nature blotted out the handwriting of the decree of condemnation against us and as conqueror fastened it to the cross so in like manner the most holy virgin linked to him in the closest and most indissoluble bonds in union with him and through him waging eternal hostilities against the poisonous serpent and over him obtaining a most signal triumph completely crushed his head under her immaculate heel this wonderful and singular triumph which the virgin achieved her innocence so far and away surpassing that of all others her purity sanctity and entire freedom from every stain of sin and the indescribable abundance and magnificence of all the graces virtues and privileges which heaven can bestow were perceived by the same fathers under various figures and forms in the ark of noah which fitted out by god's own command came off perfectly safe and sound from the common shipwreck in which the whole world was overwhelmed also in that ladder which jacob saw reach from earth up to heaven on the steps of which the angels of god were ascending and descending and on the top of which the lord himself was leaning in that bush too which on holy ground moses beheld quite in a blaze yet was not for all that consumed amidst the crackling flames of the fire nor did it in the remotest degree suffer the slightest injury nay on the contrary it was seen to grow beautifully green and to bud forth blossoms in that tower which no power could capture placed in the face of the foe from which were suspended a thousand shields and all the armor of the brave they beheld a figure of mary in that enclosed garden which never yet felt the invader's touch 
nor suffered to be sullied by any snares of secret plotters planning an approach they beheld the peerless purity of the virgin and in the infulgent city of god whose foundations even are placed in the sacred mountains as well as in god's most august temple which beaming with divine splendor is full of the glory of the lord in those and in a great many other similes entirely of this character the traditional teaching of the fathers shows that the most exalted dignity of the mother of god and her immaculate innocence and her holiness which was never liable to the slightest taint had been with prominent significancy beforehand portrayed in order to describe as it were this accumulation of divine gifts and the original perfect state of the virgin of whom was born jesus the same fathers and writers turning to account the magnificent titles pronounced by the prophets have styled the august virgin in no other language than as the pure dove the holy jerusalem the exalted throne of god the ark and abode of holiness which eternal wisdom built for himself and the queen who abounding in all that is delightful and leaning on her beloved came forth from the mouth of the most high entirely perfect beauteous and thoroughly dear to god and never defiled by the slightest stain but when the fathers and the ecclesiastical writers themselves pondered in the depth of their soul and mind the words which the angel gabriel addressed to the blessed virgin on the occasion when he announced to her the most sublime dignity of mother of god and that she was in god's own name and by his order declared to be full of grace they have taught that by this singular and solemn salutation never heard of in regard to any other is plainly shown that the mother of god has been the abode of all divine graces has been completely adorned with all the marks of affection and love of the divine spirit nay that she is a treasury almost infinite replete with these favors an abyss that cannot be fathomed so far holy that she was never under a curse that she alone along with her son was sharer of continual benediction and that she merited to hear from the lips of saint elizabeth inspired by the holy ghost the words blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb from all this is plainly perceived the opinion of the same holy fathers and writers not less brilliant than unanimous that the most glorious virgin for whom he who is powerful has effected great things shone forth with such a plenitude of celestial gifts and such an abundance of grace and with such purity as to stand forth a miracle which could not be described coming from the hands of god nay the centre and sum of all other miracles a mother worthy even of god himself and taking into account the condition of created nature that she approached as far as possible the nearest of all other beings as well angelic as human to god himself and that she soars far above the highest possible praise than can be bestowed upon her and moreover that on this account in order to prove properly the original innocence of the mother of god and her justice they not only compared her often and often with eve while a virgin and innocent and undefiled and before she had been led astray through the deadly plotting of the most malicious serpent but they have even in language and sentiment wonderful and varied pronounced her superior for eve by lamentably yielding to the serpent fell from her original innocence and became his slave but the most blessed virgin continuously increasing the original gift without at any time lending a willing ear to the serpent undermined from the very foundation his strength and power by that virtue with which she was endued from on high on this account the holy fathers and ecclesiastical writers have never ceased to apply to the mother of god titles such as these one lily among thorns two earth free from a single taint virginal unsullied pure ever blessed having not the slightest connection with the contagious influence of sin and out of which was formed the second adam three the faultless bright 
balmy beauteous bower of innocence immortal life and abounding joys planted by god's own hand and protected from all the wiles of the wicked venomous serpent four the incorruptible wood which the worm of sin never corroded five the fountain ever pure and sealed by the protecting power of the holy ghost six the temple of god himself seven the treasure of immortality eight nay the one and only daughter not of death but of life nine the offshoot which sprung not from anger but from favor and although germinating from an unsound and corrupt root continued always by the special providence of god and contrary to the uniform and settled laws of fallen nature to flourish and bloom but as if all these titles splendid in the extreme though they are were not enough they promulgated to the world in defined and appropriate propositions that whenever the subject of sin is introduced there can be no question at all put in regard to the blessed virgin mary on whom grace in greater abundance was bestowed than sufficed to destroy fully and effectively the malice of sin in all its bearings then again they published their belief that the most blessed virgin mary was the mother who repaired all the losses inflicted by her first parents that she is the mother of life to all their posterity that from all eternity she was the chosen one that she was fitted out by the most high specially for himself that her coming was foretold by god himself on the occasion when he said to the serpent i will put enmities between thee and the woman without any doubt she crushed the empoisoned head of that same serpent and it is for this reason that they have supported the teaching that the same most blessed virgin mary was safe and sound from the infection of any sin and free from its contagion in every way in body and soul and intellect and that she was always basking in the light of god's presence and united with him in everlasting companionship that she never was a moment abiding in darkness but always radiant in light and that therefore she had manifestly been a fit abode for christ not on account of the loveliness of her bodily form but of the grace and beauty which from the beginning adorned her soul next after these declarations come the most exalted and ennobling expressions by which in speaking of the conception of the virgin they have given testimony that nature made way for grace and stood aghast not feeling itself able to go forward for the fact was about to take place that the virgin mother of god should not be conceived in the womb of anna until grace in her regard was to produce its fruit for indeed it was only meet that she should be conceived a first begotten of whom was to be conceived the first begotten before all creatures they testified that the flesh of the virgin derived from adam did not inherit adam's stains and for that reason that the most blessed virgin mary was a habitation created by god himself fashioned by the holy ghost and of real purple material which the new or second besseleel wrought in gold and ornamented with embroidery charming in variety and that the same blessed virgin was deservedly honored as the being who was the first special work of god in existence and who escaped the fiery darts of the fiend and that all lovely by nature and entirely unconscious of any stain she came like the morning star into the world all splendid and sparkling in her immaculate conception for it was not becoming that such a vessel of election should be wounded by injuries such as befell others since she was so far and away different from others and was one with them not in the fault but in the nature which adam transmitted nay more it was exceedingly becoming that as the only begotten had in heaven a father whom the seraphim proclaimed thrice holy so he should have on earth a mother who would never be dimmed in the splendor of her sanctity and this teaching took such possession of the minds and souls of those who have gone before us in the faith that a singular and entirely wonderful form of expression established by usage prevailed amongst them 
by which they oftentimes addressed the mother of god in terms such as these immaculate and in every respect immaculate innocent and the most perfectly innocent undefiled and completely undefiled holy and entirely removed from all contamination of sin all pure all inviolate nay the model itself it may be said of purity and innocence more beauteous than beauty itself more graceful than gracefulness more holy than holiness that she alone was holy and most pure in mind and body as she soared above integrity and virginity and wholly constituted the abode of all the graces of the holy ghost and with the exception of god alone she is superior to all created beings fairer and more beauteous and more holy than even the cherubim and seraphim and the entire host of angels so great is she that to proclaim her praises fully the tongues of the heavenly hosts and of all mankind on earth are entirely inadequate no one is ignorant that this usual form of styling her was almost instinctively introduced into the old writings of the sacred liturgy and into the offices of the church that it is emblazoned on every page and that it holds preeminently a dominant place in them the mother of god is invoked and her praises pronounced under the titles undefiled dove of beauty itself rose ever blooming absolutely pure always immaculate ever blessed and she is celebrated as innocence itself which never received the slightest stain and the second eve who brought forth the immanuel it is no wonder therefore if the pastors of the church and the faithful people have made it a matter to glory in to profess every day more and more the doctrine concerning the immaculate conception of the virgin mother of god a doctrine according to the judgments of the fathers clearly expressed in the divine scriptures and transmitted to us upon the strongest authority bearing the impress and sanction of their names put forward and publicly adopted in practice as is shown by the number of well-known monuments from times of old worthy of veneration proposed to the faithful in accordance with the gravest and most solemn decision of the church and established with so much piety religious practice and love so that nothing was to them sweeter nothing dearer than with the most ardent feelings to honour to venerate to invoke and publicly proclaim everywhere the virgin mother of god to have been conceived without stain of original sin wherefore all along from times of old bishops ecclesiastics the religious orders and even emperors themselves and kings have earnestly implored of this holy see that the immaculate conception of the most holy mother of god might be defined as a dogma of catholic faith in our own time these demands have been renewed and they have been in an especial manner made on our predecessor of happy memory gregory the sixteenth and on ourselves both by bishops by the secular and regular clergy as well as by sovereign princes and the peoples professing the faith we therefore to the unwanted delight of our inmost soul having a thorough knowledge of all these facts and pondering seriously on them have while we were yet only after being elevated though unworthy by the secret design of divine providence to this exalted chair of peter and while we had scarcely undertaken the control of the government of the whole church had nothing certainly more at heart for a long time past than agreeably to the deepest veneration piety and affection all along from our tender years towards the most holy virgin mary mother of god to accomplish all that had been in contemplation by the church to effect to the end that the honour of the most blessed virgin mary might be increased and her prerogatives might be seen conspicuous in a richer flood of light wishing moreover to apply the process best calculated to bring the subject in every way to maturity we established a special congregation of our venerable brethren the cardinals of the holy roman church illustrious for their counsel and knowledge in divinity and we have made choice of men as well regular as secular who were thoroughly trained in theological learning that they might with the greatest care weigh well all these points which regard the immaculate conception of the blessed virgin mary 
and that they should most carefully weigh every view and lay their special decision before us and although from the several petitions received entreating to define at length and at last the doctrine of the immaculate conception of the virgin the mind and feeling of very many of the bishops became thoroughly known to us nevertheless we sent an encyclical letter dated gaeta second of february eighteen forty nine to all our venerable brethren the bishops of the catholic world that after pouring forth prayers to god they would even in writing make known to us what the piety and devotion of their respective faithful flocks were towards the immaculate conception of the mother of god and what opinion especially the bishops themselves entertained regarding the dogmatic definition which was to be passed or what they would graciously wish on the occasion so that we might publish in the most solemn manner at all possible our final supreme decision it is with no ordinary consolation we felt ourselves moved when the replies from our venerable brethren arrived for with an incredible degree of gladness delight and earnestness they in penning their replies confirmed anew not only their own singular devotion and settled sentiments but those also of their respective clergy and of the faithful committed to their charge towards the immaculate conception of the most blessed virgin and united as if in the same object of petition they of one accord earnestly entreated us that the immaculate conception of the glorious virgin should be pronounced by our supreme decision and authority a dogma of faith nor surely has our heart with less joy been filled the while when our own venerable brethren the cardinals of the holy roman church members of the congregation of which mention has just above been made and with them the consulting theologians already spoken of chosen by ourselves demanded of us with the same earnest desire and the same zeal after a full examine made with all diligence the final settling the question of the immaculate conception of the mother of god after this we adhering to the mode of proceeding adopted by our illustrious predecessors and desiring to carry it out correctly and according to prescribed forms ordered and have held a consistory we addressed an allocution to our venerable brethren the cardinals of the holy roman church and we have with the greatest possible satisfaction of soul heard them implore that we might be pleased to promulgate the dogmatic definition concerning the immaculate conception of the virgin mother of god accordingly we have the fullest confidence in god that the time specially opportune has at length arrived for defining the immaculate conception of the most holy mary mother of god this the divine records tradition worthy of all credit the uniform sense and teaching of the church the singular accord of catholic bishops and the faithful and the memorable acts of our own predecessors and their constitutions show forth in a wonderful manner and make publicly known after thoroughly weighing everything with the greatest diligence and after pouring forth fervent prayers to god we have come to the determination that there will not be any longer any hesitation on our part to sanction and define by our supreme judgment the immaculate conception of the glorious virgin and this to satisfy the pious desires of the catholic world and our own devotion towards the most holy virgin and at the same time to contribute in her person to the greater honour of her glorious only begotten son our lord jesus christ for to the son's glory redounds whatever honour and praise is bestowed on the mother wherefore after we poured forth in all humility and with fasting our own and the public prayers of the church without intermission to god the father through his son that he would be pleased to direct and to confirm our mind with the strength of the holy ghost and after having implored the protecting favour of the whole court of heaven and having with sighs petitioned the paraclete spirit and thus while under his inspiring influence we by the authority of our lord jesus christ of the blessed apostles peter and paul and by that invested in us do to the honour of the holy and undivided trinity for the glory and adornment of the virgin mother of god for the exaltation of the catholic faith and the advancement of the christian religion declare and pronounce and define that the doctrine which holds that the blessed virgin mary in the first instant of her conception has been by a special grace and privilege of almighty god 
and in view of the merits of jesus christ the savior of the human race preserved and exempted from every stain of original sin is revealed by god and consequently is to be believed firmly and inviolably by all the faithful wherefore if any persons should have the presumption which god forbid of thinking in their hearts contrary to what has been in this respect defined by us let them be made aware and let them further know that they are by their own decision condemned that they have suffered shipwreck of the faith and have fallen away from the unity of the church and that moreover by their own act in itself they subject themselves to the penalties imposed by the law if they should either by word written or oral or by any other external sign attempt to give outward expression to the erroneous views they form in their hearts in truth our mouth is overflowing with gladness and our tongue exults with joy and we return and shall ever return the most humble and fervent thanks to our lord jesus christ because by a singular kindness he has granted to us although so undeserving to offer and to decree this honor and this glory and homage to his most blessed mother we trust with the firmest hope and most assured confidence that the most blessed virgin herself who all beautiful and immaculate has crushed the venomous head of the most cruel serpent and brought salvation to the world who is the source of praise to prophets and apostles the honor of martyrs the joy and crown of all the saints who is the safest refuge for all who are in peril the most trusty aid and with her only begotten son the most powerful mediatrix and reconciler of the world and the most distinguished glory and ornament of holy church and its firmest support who always destroyed all heresies and rescued the faithful people and nations from the direst calamities of every kind and snatched ourselves even out of so many perils rushing in upon us will be pleased to effect by her all-powerful protection that our holy mother the catholic church may triumph over all difficulties destroy all errors and may day after day become stronger more flourishing amid all nations and places and may her rule flourish from sea to sea and from the river to the bounds of the earth and that she may enjoy all manner of peace tranquillity and liberty that the accused may obtain pardon the sick health the weak strength the afflicted solace and all who are in danger help and all who are going astray may throw off their darkness of mind and return to the path of truth and justice and may there be only one sheepfold and one shepherd let all our dear children of the catholic church hear these words from us and let them with increased zeal in the ways of piety devotion and love continue to honor invoke and petition the most blessed virgin mary mother of god conceived without sin and in all dangers difficulties necessities and in occasions of doubt and trial let them with all confidence have recourse to this sweetest mother of mercy and grace for nothing is to be feared nothing to be despaired of when she leads the way when she guides our course when she is favorably disposed when she stretches her protecting hand she who bears the heart of a mother towards us and in treating the business of our salvation has a feeling of solicitude for the whole human race she is constituted the queen even of heaven and of earth by our lord and she stands exalted above all the choirs of angels and the ranks of saints at the right hand of her only begotten son our lord jesus christ and she with the entreaties of a mother most powerfully pleads our cause she obtains too whatever she asks and she cannot be disappointed finally in order that this dogmatic decree pronounced by us on the immaculate conception of the most blessed virgin mary may be brought to the knowledge of the entire church we have expressed our wish that this apostolic letter be promulgated for the perpetual memory of the event ordering that the very same credit which would be paid to the present letter apostolic if it were presented or shown be by all parties paid to all transcripts or copies even printed ones that have attached to them the signature of a public notary 
and have been guarded by the seal of a person in ecclesiastical authority no man therefore is at liberty to tamper with the text of our declaration decision and definition or by any rash attempt to oppose or contradict it if any one should presume to attempt any such thing let him understand that he is going to incur the displeasure of almighty god and of the blessed apostles peter and paul given at rome in st peter's the year after the birth of our lord one thousand eight hundred and fifty four the sixth of the ides of december the ninth year of our pontificate pope pius the ninth end of encyclical letter in a fabulous deus guard the ineffable concerning the dogma of the immaculate conception by pope pius the ninth encyclical letter amentissimi redemptoris on priests and the care of souls by pope pius the ninth amentissimi redemptoris on priests and the care of souls may third eighteen fifty eight pope pius the ninth to all the patriarchs primates archbishops bishops and other ordinaries of the places in communication with the apostolic see venerable brethren health and apostolic benediction the goodness and charity of our most dearly beloved redeemer jesus christ only son of god towards mankind has been so great that you know venerable brethren having taken human nature he desired not only to suffer for our salvation the most frightful torments and the horrible death of the cross but still more reascending to heaven at the right hand of the father to dwell meanwhile with us in the august sacrament of his body and of his blood and in the excess of his love to make it our food and our nourishment for the purpose of being also our sustenance and our strength by the presence of his divinity the most assured safeguard of spiritual life and not content with this signal and altogether divine proof of charity adding benefits to benefits and spreading over us the richness of his love he has wished to give us the full certainty that those whom he has loved he loved to the end it is on that account declaring himself the eternal priest according to the order of melchizedek he has instituted in perpetuity his priesthood in the catholic church and decreed that the sacrifice which he offered once by the effusion of his precious blood on the altar of the cross to redeem the entire human race to deliver it from the yoke of sin and from slavery of the devil and to pacify all things in the heavens and on the earth shall be permanent unto the consummation of ages ordaining that this sacrifice in which there is no change except in the manner of offering it shall be made and offered each day by the ministry of the priests in order to sow among men the fruits sovereignly salutary and sovereignly fruitful of his passion thus in the unbloody sacrifice of the mass accomplished by the noble ministry of the priests is offered this same victim the source of life who has reconciled us to god the father and who having all virtue to merit to appease to obtain and to satisfy repairs in us the ruins of death by the mystery of the only son arisen from the dead the only son dies no more and death shall no more have any power over him he lives by himself an immortal and incorruptible life and it is he who is immolated for us in this mystery of the sacred oblation as confessed by st gregory the great in his dialogues such is the pure oblation that no unworthiness no perversity in those who offer it can ever sully and which by the mouth of malachi the lord has predicted that to the glory of his name become great among the nations it shall be offered in its purity in every place from the rising to the setting of the sun malachi chapter one this oblation of an unspeakable fecundity embraces the present and the future life by it giving us the grace and gift of penance god who is appeased remits even the most enormous crimes and sins and although grievously offended by our prevarications he passes from anger to mercy from a just severity to clemency 
by it are equally remitted the temporal penalties due for the expiation of our faults by it are relieved the souls of those who are dead in union with christ without having been fully purified by it also we receive those temporal goods which are not an obstacle to the goods of a superior order by it is rendered to the saints and above all to the immaculate most holy mary mother of god the greatest honor and worship that she can receive it is therefore that conformably to the traditions of the apostles we offer the divine sacrifice of the mass for the common peace of the churches for the good order of the world for emperors for warriors for those who are united to us for those who labor under sickness for those who are oppressed with grief for those in general who are in want and for the dead detained in purgatory believing that the greatest succor which those souls can receive is that which is here given them when we pray for them at the moment that the holy and formidable victim is immolated before us as taught by saint cyril of jerusalem in his catholic mystagogy there is nothing then greater more holy more divine than the unbloody sacrifice of the mass by which the same body the same blood the same jesus christ our god and lord is offered and immolated on the altar for the salvation of all by the priests and it is for that reason that the holy mother the church which is in possession of this treasure so great of her divine spouse has never ceased to employ all her care all her zeal all her vigilance in order that this grand mystery may be accomplished by the priests with the greatest interior purity of the heart and in order that it might be celebrated with all the becoming appurtenances of worship according to the rules laid down by the ritual and the sacred ceremonies in order that the grandeur and the majesty of the mystery itself may shine in the exterior appearance and that thus the faithful may be excited to the contemplation of the divine things contained and hidden in so venerable a sacrifice it is with the same ardor and the same solicitude that this pious mother addressing herself to those faithful children never ceases to bring to their minds to exhort them to inflame their zeal to bring them frequently to this divine sacrifice with all the piety all the respect and all the devotion which it deserves ordaining that all are absolutely held to assist at it on feast days of obligation attending to it with a religious attention of eyes and of heart in order that they may be happily enabled to obtain by the virtue of the mercy of god the abundance of all gifts now it is in favor of mankind that every pontiff taken from among men is constituted in those things that appertain to god in order to offer for their sins gifts and sacrifices it is then your wisdom knows well venerable brethren the duty of pastors to apply the most holy sacrifice of the mass for the people of whom they have the charge according to the doctrine of the council of trent this obligation involves a divine precept this council teaches in effect in terms the most profound and the most grave that by the divine precept it is commanded to all those to whom the care of souls is confided to know their flock and to offer the sacrifice for them you also know the encyclical letter dated the nineteenth of august seventeen forty four of our predecessor benedict the fourteenth of happy memory in which speaking at full length and wisely of this obligation explaining more in detail and confirming the sense of the fathers of trent in order to erase all doubts and do away with all controversies he declares plainly and openly and enacts that the parish priests parochos and all others having the cure of souls ought to offer the sacrifice of the mass for those who are confided to them every sunday and on every feast of obligation he adds that this obligation extends for the days in which he himself diminishing the number of feasts of obligation in certain dioceses had given permission for servile work still maintaining for them the obligation of assisting on those days at the holy sacrifice by the returns on the state and the situation of your diocese which with the care worthy of all praise and well has it filled our heart with satisfaction you addressed us venerable brethren 
us and the apostolic see how you discharged the duty of your charge we see with great joy the pastors of souls scrupulously fulfilling the obligation of which we have just spoken and not neglecting to celebrate the sacrifice of the mass for the people confided to them on sunday and on the other days which continue to be days of obligation but we also know that in a certain number of localities this duty has ceased to be fulfilled by parish priests on days which ought to be observed as feasts of obligation according to the constitution of our predecessor urban the eighth of happy memory and for which the holy see submitting to the various demands of the first pastors and taking into considerations the reasons and the motives which they have explained has not only permitted in reducing the number of feasts of obligation that the people may attend to servile work but it has been granted to them that they may be dispensed with from hearing the holy mass since these indulgences emanating from the holy see were published the parish priests of different countries believe themselves also relieved from the obligation of offering the holy sacrifice for their parishioners on the days of the suppressed feasts and have ceased completely to fulfil this duty thence there has been established in those countries among the parish priests the practice of not celebrating at all on the above-named days the holy sacrifice of the mass for the people and this custom has not wanted apologists and defenders full of an extreme solicitude for the entire spiritual flock which the lord himself has confided to us and lively afflicted at the loss of the great spiritual advantages which result from this omission to the faithful of those countries we have resolved to regulate a matter of such great importance we remembering above all that the apostolic see has always taught that the parish priests ought to celebrate the holy sacrifice for their parishioners even on the days of suppressed feasts although in fact the roman pontiffs our predecessors having regard to the pressing solicitations of the first pastors to the different and numerous wants of the faithful people and to the grave motives resulting from the interests of the times and of the places had judged it right to reduce the number of the feasts of obligation and consented at the same time that the work might freely attend on those days to serve all works without being obliged to assist at the holy sacrifice nevertheless these same pontiffs our predecessors in granting these indulgences have desired that the law should be fully and faithfully observed which enacts that there should be nothing of innovation in the churches in all that appertains to the regular order and the right of the divine offices and that all should be continued to be done absolutely as before from the time of the constitution of urban the eighth of which we have spoken was still in vigour and which prescribed that the feasts should be observed as of obligation from thence the parish priests could easily comprehend that they were never by any means freed from the obligation of offering on those days for the people the sacrifice of the mass which is the most important part of divine worship and they ought above all to observe that the pontifical rescripts should be understood altogether in the sense which they offer themselves and that they must be interpreted in the strictest sense let us add that the holy see consulted in many particular cases on the duties of pastors has never omitted to reply by the different congregations whether it be that of the council whether it be that of the propaganda whether it be that of the holy rites as also by the sacred penitentiary and ever and always has it declared that the parish priests continue under the obligation of saying mass for the parishioners even on the days which have ceased to be counted among the number of feasts of obligation after having weighed and examined these things with maturity and after having taken the counsel of many of our venerable brothers the cardinals of the sacred congregation of rites who compose the congregation charged with causing to be respected and with interpreting the decrees of the council of trent we have judged it right venerable brethren to write you this encyclical letter in order to trace out for your guidance a sure rule and to fix for you a law which must be observed with care and vigilance by all parish priests it is therefore that we declare by these presents we enact and decree that all parish priests and also all others who have a charge of souls should offer and apply the most holy sacrifice of the mass for the people who are confided to them 
not only on all the sundays and other days which obligation obliges them to preserve but also on the days which the holy see has consented to retrench from the number of feasts of obligation and which have been transferred as all those who have charge of souls should be aware since the time of the constitution of urban the eighth was fully in vigour before the feast days of obligation were diminished in number and transferred we only accept one case that in which the divine office shall have been transferred with the solemnity to the day of sunday then the one only mass shall be applied for the people by the parish priest provided that the mass which is the principal part of the divine office ought to be deemed transferred with the office itself wishing also in the love by which our paternal heart is animated with a view to the tranquillity of the pastors who ceding to the custom that was introduced have omitted to apply their mass for the people on the days indicated and in virtue of our apostolic authority we fully absolve those parish priests from all anterior omissions and as among those who have charge of souls there are those who have obtained from the holy see a particular indulgence for reduction we agree that they should continue to enjoy the benefit of the indulgence on the conditions which are herein expressed and as long as they fill the office of parish priests in the parishes which they administer and govern at present in giving these decisions and in using this indulgence we have every reason to hope venerable brethren that the parish priests animated more than ever with zeal and charity will hasten to satisfy with as much care as piety the obligation of applying the mass for the people and that they will seriously reflect on the abundance of the spiritual graces at first then on the multitude of the gifts which the application of the divine and unbloody sacrifice causes to flow so largely on the people confided to their care but we are not unaware that particular cases may be presented which on account of facts and circumstances there is reason to grant to parish priests a dispensation of this obligation we wish that you should know that it is to our congregation of council alone that all should repair to obtain these kinds of indulgences we do not accept any but the persons who depend on our congregation of the propaganda on which we have conferred the same powers in this regard we entertain no doubt at all venerable brethren that in the solicitude of your episcopal zeal you will hasten to cause it to be known without delay to all and to each of the parish priests of your diocese that by our present letters and in virtue of our supreme authority we confirm and declare anew we wish command and ordain touching the obligation in which they are to apply the holy sacrifice of the mass for those who are confided to them we are equally persuaded that you will carry the greatest amount of watchfulness to those who have the charge of souls to acquit themselves with care of this part of their duty and that they will observe with exactness what we have regulated and laid down by these letters we desire also that a copy of these letters shall be preserved in perpetuity in the archives of your episcopal courts and as you very well know venerable brothers that the most holy sacrifice of the mass is a great source of enlightenment for the faithful never cease to call attention to and to exhort the parish priests principally the preachers of the divine word and all those who are charged with instructing the christian people that they have to expound and explain to the faithful with all the care and zeal possible the necessity the greatness and efficacy the end and the fruits of this holy and adorable sacrifice that they may impress and excite the faithful to assist at it frequently they shall be able with faith religion and becoming piety in order that they may call down on themselves the divine mercy and all the good things of which they stand in need do not cease to make use of all the means in your power in order that the priests of your diocese should distinguish themselves by this integrity and gravity of manners by this innocence and this perpetual holiness of life which becomes well those who alone have the power of consecrating the divine host and of celebrating the holy and dreadful sacrifice desire them frequently to call the attention of and to impress on all those who are congregated in the sacred priesthood in order that thinking seriously on the ministry which they have received in the lord they may be faithful to it and that having always present in spirit 
the heavenly power and the dignity with which they are clothed they may shine by the brightness of all the virtue that thus by the merit of holy doctrine they may devote themselves entirely to the service of worship to divine things and the salvation of souls offering themselves as a living and holy host to the lord and that carrying always in their body the mortification of jesus they may worthily offer to god with pure hearts and hands the host of salvation for their own salvation and for that of the entire world in fine nothing is more agreeable to us venerable brothers than to take advantage of this occasion to express to you and to renew towards you the testimony of the lively affection which we bear towards you and the lord and also to encourage you to continue with still greater ardor to fulfill with courage all the duties of your pastoral charge and to watch with still greater zeal over the salvation and preservation of your own dear flocks be assured that we are always ready to take our nearest heart of hearts all that we shall judge to be proper to contribute to your utility and to that of your diocese in the meanwhile receive as the pledge of all the gifts of heaven and in testimony of our lively affection towards you the apostolic benediction which we give from the bottom of our hearts to you venerable brothers to all the clergy and to the faithful laity confided to your care given at rome near st peter's the third day of may eighteen fifty eight the twelfth year of our pontificate end of encyclical letter amantissimi redemptoris on priests and the care of souls may third eighteen fifty eight encyclical letter qui nuper on the pontifical states by pope pius the ninth encyclical letter of our most holy lord pious by divine providence pope ninth of the name to all patriarchs primates archbishops bishops and other local ordinaries who are in grace and communion with the apostolic see pius the ninth pope venerable brethren health and apostolic benediction the sedition against legitimate sovereigns which lately broke out over italy even in regions bordering on the pontifical territory has pervaded some of our provinces like the flame of a conflagration these provinces excited both by that disastrous example and goaded by foreign incentives have withdrawn themselves from our paternal rule and though indeed with few adherents they demand to be subject to that italian government which for these late years hath borne itself as the enemy of the church and of its legitimate ministers while we both reprobate and grieve over the deeds of this rebellion by which a portion only of the people in these disturbed provinces reply so unjustly to our paternal pains and care and while we openly proclaim that its civil rule is a thing necessary to this holy see that it may exercise without any impediment its sacred power for the good of religion which civil rule the most crafty enemies of the church of christ are endeavouring to wrest from it we address to you venerable brethren these presents that we may find some solace for our grief and on this occasion we exhort you too that according to your proved piety and distinguished zeal in favour of the holy see and its liberty you will be careful to do what we read that moses prescribed of old to the high priest of the hebrews book of numbers chapter sixteen take the thurible and drawing fire from the altar put incense thereon going quickly to the people to pray for them for the anger of the lord has gone forth already and the plague rages also we exhort you that you may pour forth your prayers like those holy brethren moses and aaron who prone on their faces said most mighty god of the spirits of all flesh shall thy wrath rage against all for the sins of some book of numbers chapter sixteen for this venerable brethren we send you these presents from which we derive no little consolation because we trust that you will correspond both with our wishes and our cares 
but this we profess openly that we clad with virtue from on high which god will send unto our weakness being implored by the prayers of the faithful will endure any danger and any affliction rather than desert in any way our apostolic office or admit anything against the sanctity of the oath by which we bound ourselves when god so willing it we though unworthy ascended this supreme chair of the prince of the apostles the citadel and bulwark of the catholic faith beseeching for you venerable brethren in the discharge of your pastoral duty all joy and happiness we most lovingly grant to you and to your flock the apostolic benediction a pledge of heavenly beatitude given at rome at st peter's on the eighteenth day of june in the year eighteen fifty nine the eleventh year of our pontificate end of encyclical letter qui nuper on the pontifical states by pope pius the ninth recording by algy pug encyclical letter nullis certe weobis on the need for civil sovereignty by pope pius the ninth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org encyclical letter of our holy father pope pius the ninth to our venerable brethren the patriarchs primates archbishops bishops and other local ordinaries in grace and communion with the holy see venerable brethren health and apostolic benediction we have no words venerable brethren to express to you what consolation and what joy amid our most severe distress we have derived from the singular and wondrous fidelity affection and respect towards us and this apostolic see which has been shown by you and those committed to you as well as from your glorious unanimity courage zeal and constancy in protecting the rights of the said sea and defending the cause of justice for as soon as by our encyclical letters addressed to you on the eighteenth day of june of the year last past and afterwards by our two consistorial allocutions he became acquainted to your exceeding grief with the very grave evils under which both church and state were suffering in italy and learned the nefarious outbreaks and outrages of rebellion against the legitimate sovereigns of italy and against our and this holy see's sacred and legitimate sovereignty you immediately attended to our wishes and our cares and hastened without any delay and with all zeal to order public prayers in your diocese moreover not only in your most dutiful and affectionate epistles addressed to us but in pastoral letters and other religious and learned publications raising your episcopal voice to the great glory of your name and order and boldly asserting the cause of justice and of our holy religion you vehemently denounced the sacrilegious assaults made against the temporal sovereignty of the roman church and defending with great constancy this sovereignty you made it your glory to profess and teach that it was given to the roman pontiff by a special purpose of that divine providence which rules and governs all things in order that he being never subject to any civil power might exercise the supreme office of the apostolic ministry divinely committed to him by christ our lord himself with the most complete freedom and without any hindrance over the universal world imbued with your doctrines and roused by your bright example the children of the catholic church our best beloved have made and are making every endeavour to testify to us the same sentiments from every part of the catholic world we have received almost innumerable letters both from ecclesiastics and from laymen of every rank degree and condition some of them signed by hundreds of thousands of catholics in which they clearly declare their filial devotion and veneration towards us and vehemently denouncing the rebellion and outrages committed in some of our provinces protest that the patrimony of the blessed peter 
must be preserved whole and entire and inviolate and must be defended against every wrong moreover many of them have wisely and learnedly maintained the same in appropriate publications these noble declarations of yours and of the faithful which well deserve to be honoured with all praise and acknowledgment and to be inscribed with golden letters in the annals of the catholic church have so moved us that we could not refrain from joyfully exclaiming blessed be god the father of our lord jesus christ the father of mercies and god of all consolation who comforts us in all our tribulations for amid the very grievous afflictions under which we are suffering nothing could be more agreeable or more delightful than to behold with what united and beautiful zeal for the defence of the rights of this holy see all of you venerable brethren are quickened and fired and with what a hearty spirit the faithful entrusted to your charge share in your feelings you will easily understand by yourselves how our fatherly good will both towards you and them grows and strengthens as by best right it should but while our grief was being soothed by your and the faithful's wondrous zeal and love for us and for this holy see a new cause of sorrow came from elsewhere wherefore we write these letters to you in order that in a matter of such moment you above all others may have the fullest knowledge of the feelings of our soul lately as many of you know there was published in the paris journal called the moniteur an epistle of the emperor of the french in answer to a letter from us in which we earnestly entreated his imperial majesty that by his most powerful patronage in the paris congress he would preserve whole and inviolate our and the holy see's temporal dominions and free them from a nefarious rebellion in this his letter the exalted emperor after reminding us of certain advice which he had lately offered to us concerning the rebel provinces of our pontifical dominion recommends us to consent to renounce the possession of these provinces it being his opinion that by these means only can the present troubles be healed every one of you venerable brethren clearly understands that the thought of our most grave duty made it impossible for us to remain silent when we received a letter of this kind wherefore without delay we hastened to write back to the said emperor freely and openly declaring in the apostolic freedom of our soul that in no wise could we consent to his advice because regard being had to our dignity and that of this holy see to our sacred character and the rights of the said see which belong not to the succession of any royal family but to all catholics it was attended by insurmountable difficulties also at the same time we declared that we could not yield up that which was not ours and that we clearly understood that the victory which he wished us to grant to the rebels of the emilia would be a spur to the native and foreign disturbers of the other provinces to make the like attempts when they saw the success attained by the rebels and among other things we declared to the said emperor that we could not abdicate the said provinces of our pontifical dominion in the emilia without violating the solemn oaths by which we are bound without giving rise to complaints and disturbances in our other provinces without doing a wrong to all catholics and in fine without weakening the rights not only of those italian sovereigns who have been unjustly deprived of their dominions but of all the sovereigns of all christendom who could not see with indifference certain most pernicious principles introduced nor did we omit to remark that his majesty was not ignorant by what men and with what monies and protection the recent outbreaks of rebellion at bologna at ravenna and in other cities had been excited and accomplished while far the greater part of the population remained as if astonished at those outbreaks which they by no means expected and showed themselves by no means inclined to take part with them and since the most serene emperor judged that those provinces were to be abdicated by us on account of the outbreaks of rebellion frequently excited in them we opportunely replied that this argument 
as proving too much was worth nothing since similar disturbances had frequently happened both in european countries and elsewhere and since everyone knows that a legitimate argument cannot be derived thence for diminishing the temporal dominion of sovereigns and we did not omit to point out to the said emperor that his first epistle addressed to us before the italian war which brought us consolation and not affliction was of a wholly different kind from his last letter but since from certain words in the imperial letter published by the said newspaper we deemed that we had reason to fear lest our said provinces in the emilia were already to be considered as severed from our pontifical sovereignty we entreated his majesty in the name of the church that even in consideration of his own good and of his own benefit he would take care that this our fear should be completely dispelled and with that paternal charity with which we must always watch over the eternal salvation of all men we recall to his mind that all men will one day have to render a strict account before the tribunal of christ and to undergo a most severe judgment and therefore that every one should strenuously labour that so he may experience the effects of mercy rather than of justice such are the chief things which among others we answered to the exalted emperor of the french and which we thought ought by all means to be communicated to you venerable brethren in order that you and the whole catholic world may know more and more that with the help of god according to the duties of our most weighty office we will fearlessly make every attempt and will leave nothing untried to defend strenuously the cause of truth and justice to guard with constancy and to keep whole and inviolate the temporal sovereignty of the roman church its temporal possessions and its rights which belong to the whole catholic world and finally to watch over the just cause of other sovereigns trusting in the divine help of him who said in the world you shall have distress but have confidence i have overcome the world gospel of john chapter 16 verse 33 and blessed are those who suffer persecution for justice sake gospel of matthew chapter 3 verse 10 we are prepared to follow the illustrious footsteps of our predecessors to rival their example and to suffer the most rude and cruel trials and even to lay down our life rather than in any way desert the cause of justice and of the church of god but you can easily imagine venerable brethren with what bitter grief we are afflicted when we behold the frightful warfare by which our most holy religion is attacked to the great injury of men's souls and the raging tempests in which the church and this holy see are tossed also you easily understand how deeply we are grieved knowing well the great danger to men's souls in those our convulsed provinces in which by pestilential publications piety religion faith and morality are daily most miserably shaken do you therefore venerable brethren who have been called to a share of our solicitude and who have shown with so much ardour your faith your constancy and your courage in protecting the cause of religion of the church and of this apostolic see do you continue to defend this cause with still more zeal and courage do you every day inflame more and more the faithful entrusted to your care that under your guidance they may never cease to employ all their efforts their zeal and their application to the defence of the catholic church and of this holy see as well as to the maintenance of the civil sovereignty of the said see and of the patrimony of the blessed peter the care of which concerns all catholics and one thing venerable brethren we implore of you again and again that together with us you and the faithful entrusted to your care will offer to almighty god the most fervent prayers without intermission that he may lay his commands upon the winds and the waves and with his present help be with us and with his church that he may arise and judge his own cause and that he may graciously deign to enlighten 
all the enemies of his church and of this apostolic see and by his omnipotent virtue lead them back to the ways of truth of justice and of safety and in order that our god thus invoked may incline his ear more readily to our prayers let us venerable brethren especially ask the suffrages of the immaculate and most holy virgin mary mother of god who is the most loving mother and most faithful hope of us all the ever-present pillar and guardian of the church than whose patronage nothing is more effectual with god let us also implore the suffrages both of the most blessed prince of the apostles whom christ our lord constituted the rock of his church against which the gates of hell shall never be able to prevail and of his co-apostle paul and of all the saints who reign with christ in heaven we nothing doubt venerable brethren that your distinguished piety and your sacerdotal zeal in which you excel will induce you most readily to comply with these our wishes and requests meanwhile as a pledge of our burning charity towards you we lovingly impart our apostolic benediction from the bottom of our hearts together with our wish of every true felicity to you yourselves venerable brethren and to all the clergy and faithful laity entrusted to the vigilance of each one amongst you given at rome at st peter's on the nineteenth day of january eighteen sixty in the fourteenth year of our pontificate end of encyclical letter nullus certe verbis on the need for civil sovereignty by pope pius the ninth encyclical letter ubi urbanio russian persecution of catholics in poland by pope pius the ninth encyclical letter of the pope to the polish clergy oitus express rome september the seventeenth the following is believed to be the authentic text of the encyclical letter recently addressed by the Pope to the Polish clergy. Castel Gandolfo, July the 30th, 1864. We, Pius IX, do the archbishops, bishops, and other ecclesiastics of the Kingdom of Poland and of the Russian provinces in communion with the Holy See. When, upon the 24th of April last, a day sacred to St. Fidelio of Sigma Ringen, we bitterly deplored at the College of Propaganda the sad and lamentable situation of the Kingdom of Poland and the inconsiderate revolution which had broken out against the powerful Emperor of Russia. We said also that we had learned from the newspapers the rigorous measures taken by the Russian government not only to repress the Polish insurrection but also to extirpate the Catholic religion from that kingdom. We added that it was necessary to verify these sad statements with the greatest care, and by information derived from the most authentic sources, because it is not well always to rely blindly on the press. But, venerable brethren, we have now ascertained, with profound sorrow, from abundant testimony worthy of belief, which has been transmitted to us, the truth of the rigour with which the Russian government does not cease to pursue the Catholic Church in Poland, her members, and the faithful. We have learned, indeed, with certainty, that the government, long since the enemy of the Catholic Church, and animated by the desire of leading all its subjects into schism, has seized upon the pretext of the revolution, which has broken out, to persecute in every way all Catholics and our holy religion. Consequently, setting on one side the concordat agreed upon with us, and trampling underfoot the public conventions which protect the Catholic Church in Poland, it has promulgated a host of laws and decrees contrary to the Catholic religion, prohibiting Catholic writings, and favouring, upon the contrary, the diffusion of books and newspapers opposed to Catholic doctrine, prints filled with gross insults against the Vicar of Christ upon earth, and against this apostolic chair, and having for their principal object the perversion of the Polish people. The Russian government has further never ceased to forbid communication with us and with the Holy See, to prescribe oaths contrary to the divine laws, to excite the people against the Catholic priests, and to hinder the latter from preaching, 
to teach the difference existing between Catholic truth and schism, forbidding, under the most serious penalties, the abandonment of fatal heresy and return to the bosom of the Catholic Church. Ministers of religion have been expelled from their convents, which have been converted into barracks. Bishops have been removed from their dioceses and sent into exile. An extraordinary number of Greek Catholics, already dragged into heresy by shameful machinations, have found themselves prevented from returning, as they had wished, within the pale of the Catholic Church. An incalculable number of our brethren of the Latin Confession have been torn from the Catholic Church, especially by means of mixed marriages. Children left orphans have been sent into distant countries under pretext of tutelage and taken from the Catholic Church. Thus innumerable Catholics of every age, of either sex, and of every rank, have been rigorously persecuted and transported into remote regions. Catholic churches have been profaned and converted into non-Catholic temples or barracks. Priests have been ill-treated in a horrible manner, despoiled of their property, reduced to frightful misery, sent into exile, or thrown into prison, and even put to death for having continued to offer the aid of their ministrations to the wounded and the dying upon the field of battle. It must be added to this that the priests and laymen sent into exile are deprived of all the offices of our religion, and that the Catholics of Lithuania have had to choose between exile into distant countries and apostasy. All these measures, and others equally deplorable, are unceasingly employed by the Russian government against the Catholic Church. This causes us profound sorrow, venerable brethren, and we are unable to restrain our tears when we think of the faithful who endure all the persecutions by which the Russian government endeavours to annihilate the Catholic religion in the Kingdom of Poland and in other portions of its empire. In this cruel war, which the Russian government has undertaken against the rights, the ministers, and the property of the Catholic Church, we are further obliged to deplore and to condemn another attempt quite novel in the history of the Church and unheard of up to this day. Not only has this government banished into remote regions our venerable brother Sigismund, the noble and worthy Archbishop of Warsaw, after having torn him from his see, but it has further not scrupled to order that he should be deprived of all authority and all episcopal jurisdiction in his diocese and has also not hesitated to forbid all communications between him and his diocese, declaring that Paul Zavonsky, his vicar-general, and bishop of Prusa in Partibus, appointed by us suffragan of the bishop of Warsaw, will suffice to administer the diocese of our dear son. Words fail us to qualify and reprove such an act. Who will not be profoundly astonished to learn that the Russian government has falsely adopted the belief that it could deprive the bishops of a mission given by the Holy Spirit of an authority received from God, and never subordinated to lay authority, and could remove them from the government and the administration of their diocese. By condemning and reproving this error, we must at the same time declare plainly and aloud that no one can obey these orders, but that all must render faithful obedience to our venerable brother Sigismund, who is the true and legitimate Archbishop of Warsaw. We doubt not also that our dear son, Paul Savonsky, calling to mind his duty and refusing to obey the orders of the Russian government, will continue to exercise the functions of Vicar General, which have been entrusted to him by his legitimate superior, the Archbishop of Warsaw, and will, in all things, and in every way, hasten to obey his orders. But while taking heaven and earth to witness, O venerable brethren, we deplore and reprove the persecutions which the Russian government does not cease to exercise against the Church, we are very far from approving in any way the revolutionary movement inconsiderately carried out in Poland. All the world, in fact, is aware with what care the Catholic Church has always recommended and taught that every person should obey the constituted authorities that each should submit himself to the civil power, so long at least as its orders are not contrary to the laws of God 
and of the church for this reason we deeply regret that the polish insurrection should have excited the russian government to persecute and oppress the church still further while condemning and reproving this revolt so injurious to christian and civil society it is our duty to call urgently upon those who direct the people to employ all their strength lest the grave words of the book of wisdom be addressed to them ye have received this power and this dominion from the most high who will ask of your works and will sound the depths of your thoughts forasmuch as being the ministers of his kingdom you have not judged equitably neither have regarded the law of justice neither have walked according to the will of god he will manifest himself unto you in a terrible manner because they who govern other men shall be judged with extreme rigour for more compassion is felt for the lowly but the powerful shall be powerfully tormented the book of wisdom chapter four verses four five six and seven we pray also the great princes of the earth and we call upon them to observe good faith and to understand that when nations are removed from our holy religion from its salutary doctrines from the obedience due to god and to the church and when they are cut off from communication with the holy see they are defiled by every error and by the most pernicious vices it results from this that these nations having lost the fear of and respect for god having shaken off the ties of gentle religion and forgotten the obedience due to god and to the laws of his church allow themselves to be carried away by every license and by a lawless life and acting according to their caprices despise honour insult authority rise up against the princes and refuse to obey them but in the extreme grief caused by the immensity of the evils which weigh o venerable brethren upon you and upon the faithful confided to your care we are in no slight degree consoled by your virtues in your firmness in defending the church and enduring so many fatigues and tribulations for the catholic faith and as you know that blessed are they who are persecuted for justice sake that it is glorious to suffer for jesus christ and that they who persevere until the end shall be saved we are convinced that relying upon the lord and upon the honour of his might you will continue to fight with invincible courage for the defence of his church and for salvation of souls calling to mind quod non sunt condigne passionis huius temporis ad futurum gloriam quae revelabitur in vobis st paul to the romans chapter eight verse eighteen we send you therefore this letter to arouse more and more your episcopal courage to support so many sufferings to watch over the flock entrusted to your charge and to spare neither care nor advice nor fatigue that the faithful under your jurisdiction may abstain from all evil and remain constantly firm in the practice of the catholic faith and religion without ever allowing themselves to be conquered and dragged into error by the enemies of both consequently we pray we conjure the faithful committed to your care and who are so dear to us with all the affection of our heart to remain constant to the catholic faith religion and doctrines which they have received by the special grace of the lord that giving precedence thereto above all things they may be firm in the way of the lord and in all the works which affect the love of god and of their neighbour and which belong to the catholic church be persuaded that we in the humility of our heart do not cease to address day and night fervent prayers to the most clement father of mercies to the god of consolation that he may cover you with his great virtue that he may protect you with his arm that he may guard and defend you that he may take in hand your ways that he may deliver the church from the calamities that afflict her that he may abate the pride and obstinacy of her enemies and continually shed over you the salutary dew of his bounty in token of this and as a particular proof of the love we bear towards you in the lord we herewith confer upon you with all the clergy and faithful committed to your charge our apostolic benediction 
invoked from the very bottom of our heart. Given in the nineteenth year of our pontificate. Pio Papa Nono. End of encyclical letter Ubi Urbanio. Russian persecutions of Catholics in Poland. By Pope Pius the Ninth. Encyclical letter Quanta Cura. Condemning current errors and the syllabus of errors by pope pius the ninth quanta cura condemning current errors and the syllabus of errors december eighth eighteen sixty four to our venerable brethren all the patriarchs primates archbishops and bishops having the grace and communion of the apostolic see pius the ninth pope venerable brethren health and apostolic benediction you know venerable brethren with what care and with what pastoral vigilance the roman pontiffs our predecessors fulfilling the charge entrusted to them by our lord jesus christ himself in the person of blessed peter chief of the apostles have unfailingly observed their duty in providing food for the sheep and the lambs in assiduously nourishing the flock of the lord with the words of faith in imbuing them with salutary doctrine and in turning them away from poisoned pastures. All this is known to you, and you have appreciated it. And certainly our predecessors, in affirming and in vindicating the august Catholic faith, truth, and justice, were never animated in their care for the salvation of souls by a more earnest desire than that of extinguishing and condemning by their letters and their constitutions all the heresies and errors which, as enemies of our divine faith of the doctrines of the catholic church of the purity of morals and of the eternal salvation of man have frequently excited serious storms and precipitated civil and christian society into the most deplorable misfortunes for this reason our predecessors have opposed themselves with apostolic fortitude to the criminal enterprises of those wicked men who spreading their disturbing opinions like the waves of a raging sea and promising liberty when they are slaves to corruption endeavor by their pernicious writings to overturn the foundations of the catholic religion and of civil society to destroy all virtue and justice to deprave all minds and especially those of inexperienced youth from the healthy discipline of morals to corrupt it miserably to draw it into the meshes of error and finally to tear it from the bosom of the catholic church but as you are aware venerable brethren we had scarcely been raised to the chair of saint peter far above all our merits by the mysterious designs of divine providence than seeing with the most profound grief of our soul the horrible storm excited by evil doctrines and the very grave and deplorable injury caused specially by so many errors to christian people in accordance with the duty of our apostolic ministry and following in the glorious footsteps of our predecessors we raised our voice and by the publication of our several encyclical letters and allocutions held in consistory and other apostolical letters we have condemned the principled errors of our sad age reanimated your utmost episcopal vigilance warned and exhorted upon various occasions all our dear children in the catholic church to repel and absolutely avoid the contagion of so horrible a plague more especially in our first encyclical on the ninth of november eighteen forty six addressed to you and in our two allocutions on the ninth of december eighteen fifty four and the ninth of june eighteen sixty two to the consistories which we held we condemned the monstrous opinions which particularly predominate in the present day to the great prejudice of souls and to the detriment of civil society doctrines which not only attack the catholic church her salutary teaching and her venerable rites but also the natural unalterable law inscribed by god upon the heart of man and sound reason itself and from which doctrines almost all other errors derive their origins but although we have not hitherto omitted to proscribe and reprove the principal errors of this kind yet the cause of the catholic church the safety of the souls which have been confided to us and the well-being of human society itself 
absolutely demand that we should again exercise our pastoral solicitude to destroy new opinions which spring out of these same errors as from so many sources these false and perverse opinions are the more detestable as they especially tend to shackle and turn aside the salutary force that the catholic church by the example of her divine author and his order ought freely to exercise until the end of time not only with regard to each individual man but with regard to nations peoples and their chief rulers and to destroy that agreement and concord between the priesthood and the government which have always existed for the happiness and security of religious and civil society for as you are well aware venerable brethren there are a great number of men in the present day who applying to civil society the impious and absurd principle of naturalism as it is called dare to teach that the perfect right of public society and civil progress absolutely require a condition of human society constituted and governed without regard to any consideration of religion as if it had no existence or at least without making any distinction between the true and false religion and contrary to the teaching of the holy scriptures of the church and of the fathers they do not hesitate to affirm that the best condition of society is that in which the government is not compelled to inflict the penalties of law upon violators of the catholic religion unless so far as the public peace may demand actuated by an idea of social government so absolutely false they do not hesitate further to propagate their erroneous opinion very hurtful to the safety of the catholic church and of souls and termed delirium by our predecessor gregory the sixteenth of excellent memory namely liberty of conscience and of worship is the right of every man a right which ought to be proclaimed and established by law in every well-constituted state and that citizens are entitled to make known and declare with a liberty which neither the ecclesiastical nor civil authority can limit their convictions of whatever kind either by word of mouth or through the press or by other means but in making these rash assertions they do not reflect they do not consider that they preach the liberty of perdition and that if it is always free to human conviction to discuss men will never be wanting who struggle against the truth and to rely upon the loquacity of human wisdom when we know by the example of our lord jesus christ how faith and christian sagacity ought to avoid this very culpable vanity since also religion has been banished from civil government since the doctrine and authority of divine revelation have been repudiated the idea intimately connected therewith of justice and human rights is obscured by darkness and lost sight of and in place of true justice and legitimate right brute force is substituted which has permitted some entirely oblivious of the plainest principles of sound reason to dare to proclaim that the will of the people manifested by what is public opinion or by other means constitutes a supreme law superior to all divine and human right and that accomplished facts in political affairs by the mere fact of their having been accomplished have the force of law but who does not perfectly see and understand that human society released from the ties of religion and true justice can have no further object than to amass riches and can follow no other law in its actions than the indomitable cupidity of a mind given up to its own pleasures and advantages for this reason also these same men persecute with so relentless a hatred the religious orders who have deserved so well of religion civil society and letters they loudly declare that the orders have no right to exist and in so doing make common cause with the falsehoods of the heretics for as taught by our predecessor of illustrious memory pius the sixth the abolition of religious houses injures the state of public profession of the evangelical councils injures a mode of life recommended by the church and in conformity with the apostolic doctrine does wrong to the celebrated founders whom we venerate before the altar and who constituted these societies under the inspiration of god in their impiety these same persons pretend that members of the church 
should be deprived of the opportunity of receiving alms from christian charity and that the law forbidding servile labor on account of divine worship upon certain fixed days should be abrogated upon the fallacious pretext that this opportunity and this law are contrary to the principles of political economy not content with eradicating religion from public society they desire further to banish it from families and private life teaching and professing those most fatal errors of socialism and communism they declare that domestic society or the entire family derives its right of existence solely from civil law whence is to be concluded that from civil law descend all the rights of parents over their children and above all the right of instructing and educating them by such impious opinions and machinations do these false spirits endeavor to eliminate the salutary teaching and influence of the catholic church from the instruction and education of youth and to infect and miserably deprave by their pernicious errors and their vices the tender and pliant minds of youth all those who endeavor to trouble sacred and public things to destroy the good order of society and to annihilate all divine and human rights have always concentrated their criminal schemes attention and efforts upon the manner in which they might above all deprave and delude unthinking youth as we have already shown it is upon the corruption of youth that they place all their hopes thus they never cease to attack the clergy from whom have descended to us in so authentic a manner the most certain records of history and by whom such considerable benefit has been bestowed in abundance upon christian and civil society and upon letters they assail them in every shape going so far as to say of the clergy in general that being the enemies of the useful sciences of progress and of civilization they ought to be deprived of the charge of instructing and educating youth others taking up wicked errors many times condemned presume with notorious impudence to submit the authority of the church and of this apostolic see conferred upon it by god himself to the judgment of civil authority and to deny all the rights of the same church and this see with regard to exterior order they do not blush to affirm that the laws of the church do not bind the conscience if they are not promulgated by the civil power that the acts and decrees of the roman pontiffs concerning religion and the church require the sanction and approbation or at least the assent of the civil power and that the apostolic constitutions condemning secret societies whether these exact or do not exact an oath of secrecy and branding with anathema their sectaries and supporters have no force in those regions of the world where these associations are tolerated by the civil government that the excommunications launched by the council of trent and the roman pontiffs against those who invade the possessions of the church and usurp its rights seek in confounding the spiritual and temporal orders to attain solely an earthly object that the church can decide nothing which may bind the consciences of the faithful in a temporal order of things that the law of the church does not demand that violations of sacred laws should be punished by temporal penalties and that it is in accordance with sacred theology and the principles of public law to claim for the civil government the property possessed by the churches the religious orders and other pious establishments and they have no shame in avowing openly and publicly the thesis and principle of heretics from whom emanated so many errors and perverse opinions they say that the ecclesiastical power is not of right divine distinct and independent from the civil power and that no distinction no independence of this kind can be maintained without the church invading and usurping the essential rights of the civil power neither can we pass over in silence the audacity of those who insulting sound doctrines assert that the judgments and decrees of the holy see whose object is declared to concern the general welfare of the church its rights and its discipline do not claim acquiescence and obedience under pain of sin and loss of the catholic profession if they do not treat of the dogmas of faith and morals how contrary is this doctrine to the catholic dogma of the full power divinely given to the sovereign pontiff by our lord jesus christ to guide 
to supervise and govern the universal church no one can fail to see and understand clearly and evidently amid so great a perversity of depraved opinions we remembering our apostolic office and solicitous before all things for our most holy religion for sound doctrine for the salvation of the souls confided to us and for the welfare of human society itself have considered the moment opportune to raise anew our apostolic voice and therefore do we by our apostolic authority condemn and proscribe generally and particularly all the evil opinions and doctrines specially mentioned in this letter and we will and commend that they be held as reproved proscribed and condemned by all the children of the catholic church but you know further venerable brothers that in our time insulters of every truth and of all justice and violent enemies of our religion have spread abroad other impious doctrines by means of pestilent books pamphlets and journals which distributed over the surface of the earth deceive the people and wickedly lie you are not ignorant that in our day men are found who animated and excited by the spirit of satan have arrived at that excess of impiety as not to fear to deny our lord and master jesus christ and to attack his divinity with scandalous persistence we cannot abstain from awarding you well-merited eulogies venerable brothers for all the care and zeal with which you have raised your episcopal voices against so great an impiety in our present letter therefore we speak to you most lovingly to you who called to partake our cares are our greatest support in the midst of our great grief our joy and our consolation by reason of the excellent piety of which you give proof in maintaining religion and the marvellous love faith and discipline with which united by the strongest and most affectionate ties to us and this apostolic see you strive to valiantly and accurately fulfil your grave episcopal ministry we ought then to expect from your excellent pastoral zeal that taking the sword of the spirit that is to say the word of god and strengthened by the graces of the lord jesus christ you will watch with redoubled care that the faithful committed to your charge abstain from evil pasturage which jesus christ does not cultivate because it was not sown by his father never cease then to inculcate in the faithful that all true felicity proceeds to men from our august religion its doctrine and practice and that the people is happy who have the lord god with them teach that kingdoms rest upon the foundation of the catholic faith and that nothing is so mortal so prompt to engender every ill so exposed to danger for those who think it can alone suffice as the free will which we received at birth if we ask nothing further from the lord that is to say if forgetting our author we abjure his power to show that we are free and do not omit to teach that the royal power has been established not solely to exercise the government of the world but above all for the protection of the church and that there is nothing more profitable and more glorious for the sovereigns of states and kings than to leave the catholic church to exercise its laws and not to permit any to attack its liberty as our most wise and courageous predecessor saint felix wrote to the emperor zenon for it is certain that it is advantageous when the cause of god is in question that they should study to submit and not to impose their royal will on the priests of jesus christ it is always but especially at present your duty venerable brothers in the midst of the numerous calamities of the church and of civil society in view of the terrible conspiracy of our adversaries against the catholic church and our apostolic see and the great accumulation of errors it is your duty we say before all to go with faith to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find fitting succor we have therefore judged the moment to have come to excite the piety of all the faithful in order that with us and with you all they may pray without ceasing to the father supplicating and beseeching him fervently and humbly for instruction and mercy in order also that in the plenitude of their faith they may seek refuge in our lord jesus christ who has redeemed us with his divine blood 
that by their multiplied efforts they may obtain from that burning heart victim of its charity for us the gift of drawing all by the bonds of his love of inspiring all men inflamed by his holy love with the desire of living according to his heart pleasing god in all things and fruitful in all good works but as there is no doubt that the prayers most agreeable to god are those of all the faithful men who approach him with a heart pure from all stain we have thought it good to open to all faithful christians with apostolic liberality the heavenly treasures of the church confided to our dispensation so that the faithful more strongly drawn towards true piety and purified from the stain of their sins by the sacrament of penance may more confidently offer up their prayers to god and obtain his mercy and grace by these letters emanating from our apostolic authority we grant to all and each of the faithful of both sexes through the universe a plenary indulgence during one month up to the end of the year eighteen sixty five and not longer to be carried into effect by you venerable brethren and the other legitimate ordinaries in the form and manner laid down at the commencement of our sovereign pontificate by our apostolic letters issued as a brief upon the twentieth of november eighteen forty six and sent to your whole episcopal order commencing with the words arcano divine providentiae concilio and with the faculties given by us in those same letters we desire however that all the prescriptions of our letters shall be observed saving the exceptions we have declared admissible we have come to this determination notwithstanding all which might be ordered to the contrary by special and individual mention and which might be worthy of departure from that decision but in order that every hesitation and difficulty should be removed we have ordered that a copy of our letter should be again forwarded to you let us implore venerable brethren from the bottom of our hearts and with all our souls for the mercy of god he has encouraged us to do so by saying i will not withdraw my mercy from them let us ask and we shall receive and if there is slowness or delay in its reception because we have gravely offended let us knock because he opens to those who knock for prayers groans and tears by means of which we must persist and remain joined in unanimous prayer and let each entreat god not for himself alone but for all his brethren as the lord has taught us to pray but in order that god may accede more easily to our prayers and yours and to those of all his faithful servants let us employ in all confidence as our mediatrix with him the virgin mary who has destroyed all heresies throughout the world and who the well-beloved mother of us all is very gracious and full of mercy allows herself to be touched by all shows herself very clement towards all and takes under her pitying care all miseries with unlimited affection and who standing as queen upon the right hand of her son our lord jesus christ in a golden vestment knows nothing which he cannot obtain from the sovereign master let us implore also the intervention of the blessed peter prince of the apostles and of his co-apostle paul and of all those saints in heaven who having already become the friends of god have been admitted into the celestial kingdom where they are crowned and bear palms and who henceforth certain of immortality are solicitous for our salvation lastly beseeching of god from the bottom of our heart the abundance of all his celestial gifts for you we ourselves bestow upon you venerable brethren and upon all clerks and faithful of the laity committed to your care our apostolic benediction from the most loving depths of our heart in token of our charity towards you given at st peter's in rome this eighth day of december eighteen sixty four being the tenth anniversary of the definition of the dogma of the immaculate conception of the virgin mary the mother of god and in the nineteenth of our pontificate pope Pius the ninth catalogus of the principal errors of our time indicated in the consistorial allocutions in the encyclical and other apostolic letters of pope Pius the ninth section one pantheism naturalism and absolute rationalism error one 
there does not exist any divine power supreme being and distinct providence in the universality of things and god is but the nature of things and therefore immovable god is in man and in the world and all things are god and have the substance of god god is then one and the same thing with the world and hence spirit is confounded with matter necessity with liberty the true with the false the good with evil the just with the unjust error two all action of god on men and on the world ought to be denied error three human reason without any consideration of god is the sole arbiter of the false and the true of good and evil it is a law to itself and is sufficient to itself by its own natural strength to take care of the good of men and peoples error four all the truths of religion are derived from the native strength of human reason hence reason is the principal rule by which men can and ought to arrive at the knowledge of all truths of every kind error five the divine revelation is imperfect and therefore subject to continual and indefinite progress corresponding to that of the human reason error six the christian faith is in opposition to human reason and the divine revelation not only does not do any good but injures the perfection of mankind error seven the prophecies and the miracles uttered and recounted in the sacred books are only fables of poets and the mysteries of christian faith are the result of philosophical investigations the books of the two testaments contain fabulous fictions and jesus christ himself is a myth section two moderate rationalism error eight since human reason is the equal of religion theological matter ought to be treated in the same manner as philosophical questions error nine all the dogmas of the christian religion indifferently are the objects of natural science or philosophy and human reason instructed by history alone can by its natural strength and its principles arrive at the knowledge of the most abstruse dogmas from the moment those dogmas have been proposed as objective to the human reason error ten as the philosopher is one thing and philosophy is another the former has a right to submit himself to authority when he shall have recognized its truth but philosophy neither can nor ought to submit to authority error eleven not only should the church not occupy herself with philosophy but she ought to tolerate its error and leave to itself the care of correcting them error twelve the decrees of the apostolic see and the roman congregations impede the free progress of science error thirteen the methods and the principles by means of which the ancient and scholastic doctors cultivated theology are no longer in accord with the necessities of our times and the progress of science error fourteen philosophy ought to be studied without taking any account of a supernatural relation section three indifferentism latitudinarianism error fifteen every man is free to embrace and to profess that religion which he shall believe to be true guided by the light of reason error sixteen men may find the way of eternal salvation and obtain eternal salvation in every form of religion error seventeen at least the eternal salvation of all those who have never been in the true church of christ may be hoped for error eighteen protestantism is nothing else but another form of the same true religion in which it is possible to please god to the same degree as in the catholic church section four socialism communism secret societies bible societies clerical liberal societies pests of this kind are often reproved by the severest formulas in the encyclical qui pluribus of the ninth of november eighteen forty six in the allocution quibus quantisque of the twentieth of november eighteen forty nine 
in the encyclical Nositis et Nobiscum of the 8th of December 1849, in the allocution Singulari Quadam of the 9th of December 1854, and in the encyclical Quanto Conficiamur Merore of the 10th of August 1863. Section 5. Errors Concerning the Church and Her Rights. Error 19. The Church is not a true and perfect society with full freedom. She does not rest upon her proper and constant rights, which have been conferred upon her by her divine founder, but it belongs to the civil power to define what are the rights of the church and the limits within which she shall exercise them. Error 20. The ecclesiastical power ought not to exercise its authority without the assent and toleration of the civil government. Error 21. The Church has not the power to define dogmatically that the religion of the Catholic Church is the only true religion. Error 22. The obligations which are undertaken by Catholic teachers and writers only bind them with regard to those things which are proposed to universal belief, under the titles of Articles of Faith, by the infallible judgment of the Church. Error 23. The Roman Pontiffs, and the ecumenical councils have overstepped the limits of their powers, have usurped the rights of princes, and have even committed errors in their definitions of points of dogma and morality. Error 24. The Church has not power to employ force. Error 25. In addition to the power inherent in the episcopacy, a temporal power is attributed to it by the civil authority either expressly or tacitly, but it is revocable at the pleasure of the civil power. Error 26. The Church has not a natural and legitimate right to acquire and to possess. Error 27. The ministers of the Holy Church and the Sovereign Pontiff ought to be absolutely excluded from all charge and domination in temporal things. Error 28. The bishops have not a right to promulgate apostolic letters without the authorization of the civil power. Error 29. The spiritual graces granted by a Roman pontiff ought to be held as null if they have not been sought by the civil government. Error 30. The community of the church and of ecclesiastical persons is derived from the civil right. Error 31. Ecclesiastical jurisdiction in the cases of clerics, for civil or criminal offenses, ought to be abolished, even without the knowledge and contrary to the protest of the Holy See. Error 32. The personal immunities which exempt clerics from military law may be abrogated without any violation of equity or of national law. Such abrogation is demanded by civil progress especially in a society modeled on the principles of a liberal government. Error 33. It does not appertain to ecclesiastical jurisdiction by any proper right, inherent in its essence, to direct doctrine in matters of theology. Error 34. The doctrine of those who compare the sovereign pontiff to a free sovereign ruling in the universal church is a doctrine which prevailed in the Middle Ages. Error 35. By the sentence of a general council, or an act of all the people, the pontifical sovereignty could be transferred from the bishop and the city of Rome to another bishop and another city. Error 36. The definition of a national council does not admit of subsequent discussions and the civil power can require that things remain as fixed by it. Error 37. National churches can be instituted outside and separated from the Roman pontiff. Error 38. Many Roman pontiffs lent themselves to the division of the church into eastern and western. Section 6. The Errors of Civil Society as Regards Itself and also considered in its relations with the Church. Error 39. The Republic being the origin and the source of almost all rights, declares itself by its own right 
which is not circumscribed by any limit. Error 40. The doctrine of the Catholic Church is opposed to the good and to the interests of human society. Error 41. An indirect and negative power in sacred things belongs to the civil government, even when expressed by an infidel sovereign. To him belongs not only the right, called exequatur, but also that of the process which is called abuse of power. Error 42. In cases of legal conflict between the two powers, the civil right prevails. Error 43. The civil power has a right to break and to declare and render null the conventions, commonly called concordats, concluded with the apostolic see relative to the use of rights appertaining to the ecclesiastical community without the consent of the Holy See and even contrary to its protest. Error 44. The civil authority may interfere in matters relating to religion, morals, and spiritual rule. Whence it follows that it can pass judgment on the instructions which the pastors of the church publish in fulfillment of their charge for the regulation of consciences. It can even decide on the administration of the sacraments and the dispositions necessary for receiving them. Error 45. All the direction of public schools in which the youth of a Christian state are brought up, with the exception, to a certain extent, of Episcopal seminaries, can and ought to be assumed by the civil authority, and that in such a manner that no right shall be recognized on the part of any other authority of interfering in the disposition of the schools, in the regulation of the studies, in the arrangement of grades, or in the selection or approval of masters. Error 46. Much more, even in seminaries for clerics, the method to be pursued in the studies would be submitted to the civil authority. Error 47. The good constitution of civil society demands that the popular schools which are open to all children of every class of the people, and in general that of all public institutions destined to letters, to the superior instruction and more extended elevations of youth, should be set free from the authority of the church, from all influence and inspection on her part, and that they should be wholly subject to the will of the civil and political authority, according to the desire of the governors and the tendency of public opinion at this epoch. Error 48. Catholics may approve of a system of education for youth outside the Catholic faith and the authority of the church, and which has for its sole or at least for its chief object, the knowledge of things purely natural and of social life in this world. Error 49. The secular authority may prevent the bishops and the faithful from communicating freely between themselves and with the Roman pontiff. Error 50. The secular authority has of itself a right to appoint bishops and to require them to undertake the administration of their diocese before they have received the canonical institution of the Holy See and the letters apostolic. Error 51. The secular authority has a right to forbid to bishops the exercise of their pastoral ministry, and is not bound to obey the Roman pontiff in matters concerning the institutions of bishoprics and bishops. Error 52. The government can, by its own proper right, change the prescribed form of religious profession, both for men and women, and can enjoin religious communities not to admit persons to solemn vows without its authorization. Error 53. The laws which protect the existence of religious communities, their rights and functions, ought to be abrogated, and the civil power ought to give its support to all those who may desire to quit the religious life and to infringe their solemn vows. It can also completely suppress these same religious communities, as well as collegiate churches and simple benefices, even when privately endowed, and devise and submit their goods and revenues to the administration and the will of the civil authority. Error 54. Kings and princes are not only exempt from the jurisdiction of the church, but they are superior to the church in all questions of jurisdiction. Error 55. 
the church ought to be separate from the state and the state from the church section seven errors concerning natural and christian morality error fifty six the laws of morality have no need of the divine sanction and it is not at all necessary that human laws should be conformed to natural right or should receive any obligatory power from god error fifty seven the philosophical and moral sciences as well as the civil laws ought to be removed from divine and ecclesiastical authority error fifty eight no other forces are to be recognized but such as reside in matter and every system of morals all honesty ought to consist in accumulating and augmenting wealth by whatever means and in abandonment to pleasure error fifty nine right consists in the material fact all the duties of man are empty words and all human facts have the force of right error sixty authority is nothing else but the sum of material forces and numbers error sixty one an injustice in fact crowned with success does not in any way do injury to the sacredness of right error sixty two the principle of non-intervention ought to be proclaimed and observed error sixty three it is lawful to refuse obedience to legitimate princes and even to revolt against them error sixty four the violation of an oath however holy it may be and every shameful and criminal action opposed to the eternal god not only is not to be blamed but it is quite lawful and even most praiseworthy when inspired by love of country section eight errors concerning christian marriages error sixty five it cannot be established by any reason that christ has elevated marriage to the dignity of a sacrament error sixty six the sacrament of marriage is only an adjunct of the contract from which it is separable and the sacrament itself only consists in the nuptial benediction error sixty seven by the law of nature the marriage tie is not indissoluble and in many cases divorce properly so called may be pronounced by the civil authority error sixty eight the church has not the power of pronouncing upon the impediments to marriage this belongs to civil society which can remove the existing hindrances error sixty nine it is not only more recently that the church has begun to pronounce upon invalidating obstacles availing herself not of her own right but of a right borrowed from the civil power error seventy the canons of the council of trent which invoke anathema against those who deny the church the right of pronouncing upon invalidating obstacles are not dogmatic and must be considered as emanating from borrowed power error seventy one the form of the said council under penalty of nullity does not bind in cases where the civil law has appointed another form and desires that this new form is to be used in marriages error seventy two boniface the eighth is the first who declared that the vow of chastity pronounced at ordination annuls nuptials error seventy three a civil contract may very well among christians take the place of true marriage and it is false either that the marriage contract between christians must always be a sacrament or that the contract is null if the sacrament does not exist error seventy four matrimonial or nuptial causes belong by their nature to civil jurisdiction section nine errors regarding the civil power of the sovereign pontiff error seventy five the children of the christians and catholic church are not agreed upon the compatibility of the temporal with the spiritual power error seventy six the cessation of the temporal power upon which the apostolic see is based would contribute to the happiness and liberty of the church section ten errors referring to modern liberalism 
Error 77. In the present day, it is no longer necessary that the Catholic religion shall be held as the only religion of the state, to the exclusion of all other modes of worship. Error 78. Whence it has been wisely provided by the law, in some countries called Catholic, that emigrants shall enjoy the free exercise of their own worship. Error 79. But it is false that the civil liberty of every mode of worship, and the full power given to all of overtly and publicly displaying their opinions and their thoughts, conduce more easily to corrupt the morals and minds of the people, and to the propagation of the evil of indifference. Error 80. The Roman pontiff can and ought to reconcile himself to, and agree with, progress, liberalism, and moderate civilization. End of Encyclical Letter, Quanta Cura, Condemning Current Errors, and the Syllabus of Errors, December 8, 1864, by Pope Pius IX. Encyclical Letter, Lavate, on the Affiliations of Church, by Pope Pius IX. We publish, in another column, the Latin text of the encyclical letter addressed by the Holy Father on October the 17th, 1867, to the patriarchs, primates, archbishops, and bishops of the whole Catholic world, who are in communion with the Apostolic See. In English it may be read as follows. Venerable Brethren, Health and the Apostolic Blessing. Cast your eyes around, Venerable Brethren, and you will see, and with us you will grieve over the abominations which afflict unhappy Italy. For our part, we adore the inscrutable judgments of God, who hath pleased that we should live in these sad times, when, by the action of men, and especially of those who rule and administer public affairs in Italy, the commandments of God and the laws of the Holy Church are utterly despised, and impiety, unchecked, exalts its head and triumphs. Hence flow all the crimes, evils, and misfortunes which we see. Hence arise all those bands of men who walk in impiety and fight under the standard of Satan, on whose face is written, Lie. Called by the name of revolution, and setting their mouths against heaven, they blaspheme God, they defile and contemn everything sacred, they trample on all laws, human and divine. Like ravenous wolves, they pant after their prey. They are shedders of blood. They are destroyers of souls by their scandals. They seek the stipend of their service by every injustice. They are robbers. They afflict the weak and the poor. They add to the number of widows and orphans. They deny justice to the just, and for bribes spare the wicked. Thoroughly corrupted, they strive at gratifying every passion at whatever damage to society itself. By ruffians of this sort, we are now surrounded. Animated by a spirit utterly devilish, they long to plant their standard of lies in this, our fair city, by the chair of Peter, the centre of Catholic truth and unity. The subalpine government, which ought to punish them, is not ashamed to cherish them to provide them with arms and provisions, and to provide them with access to this city. But let all such tremble, even of the highest rank and place, for they are incurring additional ecclesiastical penalties and censures. In the humility of our heart, we earnestly pray God, who is rich in mercies, to lead all these unhappy men back to saving repentance and to the path of justice, religion, and piety but we cannot keep silence on the grave perils to which, in this hour of darkness, we are exposed. We await calmly every event, though procured by wicked frauds, calumnies, conspiracies, and falsehoods. For we place all our hope and trust in God our Saviour, who is our help and strength in all our tribulations, who never suffers those who hope in him to be confounded, who confounds the designs of the impious, and breaks the necks of sinners. Still we are bound to announce to you, venerable brethren, and to all the faithful committed to your care, the affliction and the great danger in which we find ourselves, principally owing to the conduct of the subalpine government. 
although we are defended by the valour and devotion of our faithful army which by its gallant exploits has displayed a courage almost heroic it is clear that it is not able long to resist the far superior numbers of its unjust assailants and although we are much consoled by the filial piety shown to us by the remnant of our subjects reduced in number as they are by wicked usurpers we have still to lament that they must needs incur great danger from the savage bands of criminals who continually menace them plunder them and oppress them in a thousand ways and we have to deplore other evils venerable brethren evils which we can never sufficiently lament from our consistorial allocution delivered on october the twenty ninth last year and from the narrative and documents which we printed and published you know with what affliction the catholic church and her children in the russian empire and in the kingdom of poland are oppressed and tortured catholic bishops and ecclesiastics and laymen have been banished imprisoned persecuted robbed of their property and made to suffer most cruel punishment while the canons and laws of the church have been trampled under foot and not content with this the russian government continues in its ancient fashion to violate the discipline of the church to sever the bonds of union and communion between the faithful and ourselves and the holy see and to plot and strive in a thousand ways utterly to destroy the catholic religion in those dominions to tear the faithful from the bosom of the catholic church and to drag them into a fatal schism we inform you with deep grief that two decrees have lately been issued by that government since our last allocution above mentioned by the decree issued on the twenty second of last may the diocese of podlachia in the kingdom of poland its college of canons its general consistory and its diocesan seminary were utterly abolished the bishop of the diocese was torn from his flock and compelled at once to quit the diocese and this decree is similar to that which was published on june the third last year which we are unable to mention as we knew not of it by this clause the government of its own will and power abolished the diocese of kamenitz dispersed its college of canons its consistory and its seminary and removed the bishop from the diocese by force as every means of communicating with the faithful is obstructed and in order not to expose any one to imprisonment exile or other punishment we have been obliged to insert in our newspapers the document by which we decided on providing for the exercise of legitimate jurisdiction in those vast dioceses in order that by aid of the press notice of our decision might reach thither everyone sees at a glance in what spirit and for what object the russian government issues these decrees to the absence of many bishops it now adds the suppression of dioceses but our affliction is yet increased by another decree of the same government promulgated on the twenty second of last may by which a college was constituted at st petersburg called the roman catholic ecclesiastical college over which the archbishop of mobilev presides all petitions appertaining even to matters of faith and conscience which are sent to us and this apostolic see by the bishops clergy and faithful people of the russian empire and of the kingdom of poland are first to be transmitted to this college and the college has to examine them and decide whether the petitions exceed the power of the bishops in which case it is to see that they be forwarded to us and when our decision arrives thither the president of the college is bound to forward it to the minister for home affairs that he may decide whether anything be found in it contrary to the laws of the state and the rights of the sovereign and may execute it at his pleasure and discretion should nothing of the sort be found in it you see clearly venerable brethren how worthy of blame and reprobation is this decree issued by lay and schismatical authority it destroys the divine constitution of the catholic church it subverts ecclesiastical discipline it inflicts a great injury on our supreme pontifical power and authority and on the power and authority of this holy see and of the bishops it impels the faithful towards a fatal schism and violates the very law of nature as to matters which concern faith and conscience moreover 
the Catholic Academy of Warsaw, has been destroyed, and ruin impends over the Ruthenian diocese of Kelm and Belts. Most of all have we to lament that a certain priest, Wujiki, a man of suspected faith, despising all ecclesiastical penalties and censures, disregarding the terrible judgment of God, has dared to accept from the civil power the government and administration of that diocese, and to issue sundry ordinances opposed to ecclesiastical discipline and furthering a fatal schism. Amid these misfortunes, afflicting us and the Church, we entreat you, venerable brethren, as there is none to fight for us, save the Lord our God, to join your fervent prayers with ours, as becomes your zeal for the Catholic Church and your affection for us, and together, with all your clergy and people, to pray God without ceasing to be mindful of his mercies, which are for ever, to turn away his wrath from us, to rescue his holy church and us from these evils, to help and defend by his omnipotence our beloved children of the church in all parts, and especially in the Russian Empire and Kingdom of Poland, exposed as they are to so many snares and visited by so many crosses, to keep, confirm and fortify them daily in the profession of the Catholic faith and its saving doctrine, to dissipate all the impious counsels of the enemy, to recall them from the gulf of sin to the path of virtue, and to guide them in the way of his commandments. We desire you, therefore, to announce public prayers in your diocese at your discretion for three days within the next six months, and within a year in the transoceanic diocese, and that the faithful may assist at these public prayers, and beseech God with more devotion, we mercifully grant in the Lord to all and every the faithful of Christ, of both sexes, who shall devoutly assist at the prayers on the next three days, who shall pray to God according to our intentions in the present needs of the Church, and who shall have been cleansed by sacramental confession and refreshed by Holy Communion, a plenary indulgence and remission of all their sins, and to those of the faithful who, being contrite of heart, shall on any one of the said days perform the other works, we remit, according to the wonted form of the church, seven years and seven, forty days of the penances, or otherwise due. Also we grant, in the Lord, that all and singular these indulgences, remissions of sins, and relaxations of penances may be applied by way of suffrage to the souls of Christ's faithful who have departed this life in union with God by charity, all things whatsoever to the contrary notwithstanding. Lastly, nothing is more pleasing to us than to use this occasion to testify and repeat the special kindness with which we embrace you in the Lord, in sure token of which accept the apostolic benediction which, with cordial affection, we lovingly bestow on yourselves, venerable brethren, and on all the clergy and laity entrusted to your vigilance. Given at Rome at St. Peter's, October the 17th, 1867, in the 22nd year of our pontificate. Pope Pius the Ninth. End of encyclical letter, Levate, on the affiliations of church. By Pope Pius the Ninth. Encyclical letter, Respicientes, protesting the taking of the pontifical states by Pope Pius the Ninth. Epistle Encyclical of His Holiness Pius the Ninth on the Usurpation of Rome. Pius the Ninth, by Divine Providence Pope, to all patriarchs, primates, archbishops and bishops, and to other local ordinaries having favour and communion with the Apostolical See. Venerable Brethren, Health and Apostolic Benediction. Having regard to all the proceedings taken for many years past by the Piedmontese government, with incessant plots aiming at the overthrow of the civil principality granted by the singular providence of God to the Apostolic See, in order that the successors of Blessed Peter might enjoy full liberty and security in the exercise of their spiritual jurisdiction, it is impossible, venerable brethren, but that our inmost heart should be grieved at such a conspiracy against the Church of God and this Holy See, 
and at this calamitous period when the said government following the counsels of sects of perdition has for a long time meditated a sacrilegious invasion of our beloved city and of the remaining states of which the dominion was left to us from the former usurpation and has now carried that design into effect by force of arms against all law and right whilst we prostrate before almighty god adore his mysterious designs and say with the prophet ego plorans et oculus meus deducens aquas quia longe factus est a me consolato convertans animam meam facti sunt filii me perditi quoniam invaluit inimicus jeremiah lamentations chapter one verse sixteen venerable brethren the history of this nefarious war has been sufficiently explained and published long ago to the whole catholic world we have done it in our encyclical allocations and briefs delivered or dated at various times namely on the first of november eighteen fifty on the twenty second of january and twenty sixth of june eighteen fifty five on the eighteenth and the twenty eighth of june and on the twenty sixth of september eighteen fifty nine on the nineteenth of january eighteen sixty and in the letters apostolical twenty sixth of march eighteen sixty also in allocutions of twenty eighth of september eighteen sixty eighteenth of march and thirtieth of september eighteen sixty one twentieth of september seventeenth of october and fourteenth of november eighteen sixty seven in this series of documents are viewed and explained the very grievous injuries inflicted by the piedmontese government on the sovereign authority of us and of this apostolic see in the years prior to the commencement of the occupation of the ecclesiastical dominion laws being enacted against natural against divine and against ecclesiastical right the ministers of religion the religious communities and even the bishops themselves being subjected to unworthy vexations the faith pledged to this holy see in solemn treaties being forfeited and the sacred obligations of those treaties being curtly repudiated at the very time when the said government was signifying its desire to conclude new treaties with us in those documents venerable brethren it is evidenced and posterity will see with what arts and by what cunning and unworthy plots the said government has gone the length of overbearing justice and the sacredness of the rights of this apostolic see and at the same time it will be known what exertions we have made to restrain so far as in us lay such lawless conduct that daily grew worse and to defend the cause of the church you are well aware how in the year eighteen fifty nine the chief cities of the emilia were stirred up to rebellion by the piedmontese authorities who sent in writings conspirators arms and money and how not long afterwards assemblies of the people having been convened and suffrages having been taken a pretended plebiscite was got up and by that trickery and pretence our provinces situate in that region were wrested from our paternal government all good men in vain protesting against the act you are also well acquainted with the fact that during the year following the said government made prey of other provinces situated in piscinum in umbria and in the patrimony and turned them to its own profit alleging crafty pretexts and with a large army attacked by surprise our troops and the volunteer band of catholic youths who induced by the spirit of religion and piety towards their common father had hastened from all parts of the world to our defence and routed them in a murderous battle they being taken at unawares yet fighting bravely for their religion to the last neither is any man ignorant of the extraordinary insolence and hypocrisy of this government which in order to extenuate the odium of their sacrilegious usurpation has not hesitated to give out that it had invaded those provinces to restore in them the principles of moral order whilst in reality 
yet everywhere promoted the diffusion and cultivation of every false doctrine and everywhere relaxed the restraints of lust and impiety likewise inflicting undeserved penalties on catholic bishops and on ecclesiastics of every grade whom it threw into prison and allowed to be harassed with public insults while at the same time it granted immunity to those persecutors and even to the assailants of the supreme pontifical dignity in the person of our humility it is moreover true that we in the due discharge of our office have not only all along resisted reiterated counsels and demands offered to us to the effect that we should basely betray our duty throwing over forsooth and surrendering the rights and possessions of the church or entering into a sinful compromise with the usurpers also it is true that we have opposed to these wicked attempts and crimes so perpetrated contrary to all law human and divine our solemn protests before god and man and that we have declared their authors and abettors to be involved in ecclesiastical censures and as far as the case required we inflicted anew those censures upon them lastly it is a well-known fact that the aforesaid government has persisted nevertheless in its contumacy and its plots and endeavoured to stir up rebellion in our remaining provinces by sending in without intermission its emissaries to stir up trouble and by artifices of every kind but these attempts not succeeding as was expected on account of the unshaken fidelity of our soldiers and the love and affection of our people which was remarkably and unwaveringly manifested towards us at last that fierce tempest broke out against us in the year eighteen sixty seven when during the autumn bands of desperate men burning with wickedness and rage and aided by subsidies from the said government invaded our territories and this city where many persons belonging to the same bands had already found entrance and had concealed themselves and from their violence and cruelty and arms all fierce and bloody outrages were to be feared by us and by our beloved subjects as was clearly evident unless the merciful god had frustrated their attacks by the energy of our troops and by the effective aid of a force sent to us by the renowned french nation in so many conflicts in such a succession of perils anxieties and sorrows divine providence conferred on us meanwhile the greatest consolation venerable brethren from the noble piety and zeal of yourselves and of your faithful flocks towards us and towards this apostolic see of which piety and zeal you continually gave signal proofs by works of catholic charity and although the very grave dangers in which we were involved left us scarcely any respite yet with the help of god we never relaxed our efforts to secure the temporal prosperity of our subjects and the state of public tranquillity and security under our rule the condition of all our best arts and sciences and the loyalty and affection of our populations towards us were matters of notoriety to all nations from whom strangers continually came in crowds to this city and especially on the occasions of the numerous solemnities which we celebrate and at the times of the solemn festivals in their succession and now when things were in this posture and our people enjoying peace and quietness the piedmontese king and his government seizing the opportunity when two of the most powerful nations of europe were engaged in a great war with one of which the said government had entered into a treaty to preserve inviolate the present state of the church's dominion and not to allow it to be invaded by the revolutionists all at once determined to invade the remaining territories of our dominion and even our sea itself and reduce them under their power but why this hostile invasion and what pretexts were alleged for it it is a matter of notoriety what kind of representations were made in the letter of the king to us dated the eighth of september last and delivered to us by his envoy commissioned for the purpose in that letter with lengthy and insincere circuitousness of words and sentences under the assumed character of a loving son and a catholic 
and under the pretext of the preservation of public order, and of the security of the papacy itself, and of our person, the demand was made that we would be pleased not to take as a hostile act the overthrow of our temporal power, and would surrender that power of our own accord, in reliance on the futile promises made by himself, which, as he said, would reconcile the aspirations of the peoples of Italy with the sovereign rights and free exercise of the spiritual authority of the Roman Pontiff. We, in truth, could not but greatly marvel at seeing in what manner the violence intended to be used shortly against us was attempted to be veiled and disguised, nor could we help deploring from our inmost soul the sad case of the said king, who, impelled by evil counsels, inflicts daily new wounds on the church, and, having respect to men rather than to God, does not reflect that there is in the heavens a king of kings and lord of lords, who doth not regard the person of any man, nor fear the greatness of any man, for he hath made both great and small, and that for the stronger there is but the stronger punishment. The Book of Wisdom, chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. But as to the propositions made to us, we thought that we ought not to entertain them, but that we should obey the laws of duty and conscience, and imitate the example of our predecessors, and especially of Pius the Seventh, of happy memory, the sentiments of whose unconquered soul uttered by him in a cause completely similar to our own, we have pleasure in quoting. Let us remember, with St. Ambrose, that Naboth, a holy man, and the possessor of a vineyard of his own, was called upon by a royal demand that he should make over his vineyard that the king might cut down the vines and plant common pot-herbs therein, and that he answered, God forbid that I should sell the inheritance of my fathers. Much more do we judge that it would be unlawful for us to surrender so ancient and sacred an inheritance, namely the temporal dominion of this holy see, which, not without the evident design of divine providence, has been held in possession by the Roman pontiffs, our predecessors, through a long series of ages, or even to give a tacit assent that any man should take possession of the chief city of the Catholic world, when the unsettlement and abolition of the holiest form of government, which has been left by Jesus Christ to his holy church, and has been ordained by the sacred canons authorized by the Spirit of God, would introduce in its place that code which is contrary and repugnant not only to the sacred canons, but even to the precepts of the gospel, and would bring in, as is usually the case, that new order of things which tends most manifestly to mingle and confound all sects and superstitions with the Catholic Church. Naboth defended his vines with his blood. Can we do otherwise, happen what may to us, than defend those rights and possessions of the Holy Roman Church, as we are in duty bound to do by the solemn obligation of our oath? Can we do otherwise than vindicate the liberty of the apostolic see, which is so intimately connected with the liberty and welfare of the universal church? And how great in reality is the congruity and necessity of this temporal principality to the assertion of that safe and free exercise of the spiritual power granted by God to them over the whole world, too many facts that are now taking place, should other arguments be wanting, clearly demonstrate. Letters Apostolic, June the 10th, 1809 Therefore, adhering to the sentiments, which in many of our allocutions we have constantly professed, we reproved in our answer to the king his unjust demands, and yet so as to show that, with our bitter sorrow, there was conjoined that fatherly affection which cannot wholly repel from its solicitude even sons who imitate the rebellious Absalom. But this, our letter, had not yet been conveyed to the king, when the cities of our pontifical dominion, which were as yet untouched and at peace, were invaded by his army, the garrisons, whenever they attempted to make any resistance, being easily routed, and then, in a short time, that unhappy day dawned, the 20th of last September, on which we beheld this city, the see of the Prince of the Apostles, the centre of the Catholic religion, and the refuge of all nations, 
beset with thousands of armed men, its walls battered down, and itself terror-stricken by the cannon-shots fired upon it. And we had to mourn over its capture, vi et armis, by the order of the man who just before had professed so strongly his filial affection towards us and his fidelity to religion. What could be to us and to all good men more afflicting than that day? On it, when the troops entered the city, the city was filled with a large and promiscuous crowd of disorderly persons, and we immediately beheld public order overturned. We saw the dignity and sacredness of the sovereign pontificate and the humility of our person insulted with impious language. We beheld our very faithful troops treated with every kind of insult and license, and impudence let loose without restraint far and near where but just before the affilial affection was conspicuous of those who were endeavouring to alleviate the grief of a common father and ever since that day there have ensued before our own eyes things which cannot be mentioned without exciting the just indignation of all good men wicked books stuffed with lies obscenity and blasphemy have begun to be exposed for ready sale and to be disseminated everywhere a multiplicity of newspapers intended to corrupt minds and morals are published, tending to insult and calumniate religion, and to influence public opinion against us and against this apostolic see. Foul and improper pictures are displayed openly, and other contrivances of the same kind, by which sacred persons and things are held up to ridicule and exposed to public derision, are exhibited. Honours and monuments are decreed to those who have suffered, by legal trial and sentence, the just punishment of most heinous crimes. Many ministers of the Church, against whom every species of odium is stirred up, are harassed with all kinds of insult, and some of them are stricken and wounded by the blows of treacherous assassins. Some religious houses have been subjected to illegal search. Our quirinal palaces have been broken into, and from his residence, in one of them, a Roman cardinal has been roughly thrust out by violent orders, and other ecclesiastics of our household have been shut out of their use and subject to molestation. Laws and decrees have been put forth which avowedly injure and destroy the liberty, immunity, property, and lawful rights of the Church of God. And all these most terrible evils, unless God avert it, we grieve to see are likely to progress and we, meanwhile, are hindered by reason of our present position from applying any remedy, and are every day more rudely reminded of the captivity in which we are held, and of the absence of that full liberty which is pretended in lying words to be left us for the exercise of our apostolic ministry over the world, and is professed to be meant to be secured to us with safeguards, as they are called, by the intruding government. We cannot here, venerable brethren, pass under silence the commission of an atrocious crime, which, without doubt, is known to you. As though the possessions and rights of the apostolic see, sacred and inviolable by so many titles, and respected during so many centuries, could be today controverted and disputed, and as though the grave censures which are incurred ipso facto, and without fresh declaration, by the violators of these rights and possessions, could lose their force by rebellion and popular audacity, they have had recourse to cover the sacrilegious spoliation we have suffered, in spite of the common law of nature and of nations. They have had recourse, we say, to the show and comedy of a plebiscite, already employed when the other provinces were robbed from us. And those who are in the habit of rejoicing in the worst actions did not blush to parade, as in triumph, through the towns of Italy, rebellion and contempt of ecclesiastical censures, thus insulting the true sentiments of the great majority of Italians, whose religion and fidelity towards us and towards Holy Church, forcibly repressed in all sorts of ways, cannot have free course. As to ourselves, charged by God to rule and govern the whole house of Israel, and made the supreme defender of religion, of justice, and of the rights of the Church, in order that we be not reproached before God, 
and before the church for having been silent and for having by our silence consented to this unjust revolution renewing and confirming that which we have already declared in the allocutions encyclicals and briefs above mentioned and recently in the protestation which by our order and in our name the cardinal secretary of state communicated on the twentieth of september to the ambassadors ministers and charge d'affaires of foreign nations accredited to us and to this holy see we declare anew before you venerable brethren with all possible solemnity that it is our intention resolution and will to retain in their integrity intact and inviolable all the dominions and rights of this holy see and so to transmit them to our successors that all usurpation of these rights whether of a recent or of an earlier date is unjust violent null and void and that all the acts of the rebels and invaders already accomplished or still to be accomplished with a view of confirming in whatever manner this usurpation are by us from this moment condemned annulled quashed and abrogated we moreover declare and we protest before god and before the catholic world that we are in such captivity as to render it altogether impossible for us to exercise our pastoral authority with security ease and freedom finally following the advice of saint paul que participatio injustitiae cum iniquitate aut quae societas luci ad tenebras que autem conventio christi ad belial second letter to the corinthians chapter six verses fourteen and fifteen we announce and publicly and openly declare that faithful to our office and to the solemn oath which binds us we neither consent nor will consent to any project of conciliation which may in any manner whatever destroy or lessen our rights which are the rights of god and of the holy see and we likewise profess that we are ready thanks to the divine assistance and in spite of our great age to drink to the dregs for the church of jesus christ the chalice which he first deigned to drink for her and that we will never commit the fault of yielding to or acquiescing in the unjust demands which are addressed to us for as our predecessor pius the seventh said to do violence to this sovereign empire of the apostolic see to separate the temporal power from the spiritual to disjoin to tear asunder and to cut up by the roots the offices of pastor and of prince is nothing but the desire to ruin and destroy the work of god nothing else but to labour for the greatest injury to religion is nothing else but to deprive it of a most efficacious bulwark so that the supreme ruler pastor and vicar of god may not have it in his power to give to catholics who scattered all over the world ask of him aid and succour that help which they claim from his spiritual power and which no one may hinder but since our admonitions expostulations and protests have been without effect by the authority of almighty god of the holy apostles peter and paul and by our own we declare to you venerable brethren and by you to the whole church that all those who have perpetrated the invasion usurpation and occupation of any of the provinces of our dominion and of this our beloved city or have done any of these things of whatever dignity they may be and even know they should be worthy of a most special mention and in like manner all their agents abettors assistants counsellors adherents and all others either obtaining the execution of those things under whatever pretext or in whatever manner or executing them themselves have incurred according to the form and tenor of our letters apostolic recited the twenty sixth of march eighteen sixty the greater excommunication and the other censures and ecclesiastical penalties published by the holy canons apostolical constitutions and the decrees of general councils and particularly of the council of trent but calling to mind that we hold on earth the place of him who came to seek and to save that which was lost we desire nothing more ardently than to embrace with paternal love 
the wandering sons who may return to us and therefore raising our hands to heaven in the humility of our heart remitting and commending to god the most just of causes which is his still more than our own we conjure and supplicate him by the bowels of his mercy to aid us by his succour to aid his church and to bring about through his mercy and compassion that the enemies of the church thinking upon the eternal damnation which they are preparing for themselves may hasten to appease his terrible justice before the day of vengeance and to console by their conversion the affections of their holy mother the church and our own grief in order to obtain from the divine mercy such special favours we earnestly exhort you venerable brethren to join with our supplications your fervent prayers and those of the faithful committed to your care and going all together to the foot of the throne of grace and mercy let us engage the intercession of the immaculate virgin mary mother of god and that of the blessed apostles peter and paul the church of god from her beginning until our day has often been in tribulation and has as often been delivered it is she who cries out seipi expugna verunt me juventute mea etinim non potuerunt mihi supra dorsum meum fabrica verunt peccatores prolunga verunt iniquitatum suam neither today will the lord allow the sceptre of sinners to determine the lot of the just the arm of the lord is not shortened nor unable to save without doubt he will deliver his spouse once again his spouse whom he has purchased with his blood endowed with his spirit adorned with his heavenly gifts and has also enriched with earthly gifts and now we ask of god from the bottom of our heart the abundant treasures of the heavenly graces for you venerable brethren and for all the clergy and laity confided to the care of each of you and as a pledge of our special love for you we affectionately grant to you from our inmost heart the apostolical benediction to you and to all the faithful our well-loved sons given at rome at st peter's the first day of november of the year eighteen seventy being the twenty-fifth year of our pontificate pius the ninth end of encyclical letter respicientes protesting the taking of the pontifical states by pope pius the ninth encyclical letter ubi nos on the pontifical states by pope pius the ninth encyclical epistle of our most holy lord pius the ninth by divine providence pope to all patriarchs primates archbishops bishops and other ordinaries in the grace and communion of the apostolic see pius the ninth venerable brethren health and apostolical benediction when reduced by the sacred counsel of god under the power of the enemy we beheld the hard lot of this our city and our civil princedom crushed under an armed invasion then by letters addressed to you on the first day of november in last year we declared to you and through you to the whole catholic world what was the state of our affairs and of this city and to what excesses of impious unbridled license we were exposed and in accordance with our supreme office we testified before god and men that we were resolved that the rights of the holy see should be kept safe and entire and we stirred you and all our beloved children the faithful committed to your care to appease the divine majesty with fervent prayers since that time the evils and calamities which those first bitter experiences foreboded for us and for this city have truly increased beyond measure against the apostolic dignity and authority against the purity of religion and morals and against our well-beloved subjects moreover venerable brethren the condition of affairs daily growing more serious we are compelled to say with saint bernard these are the beginnings of ills we fear worse things behind epistle number 243 for iniquity keeps on advancing and carries forward its designs 
nor now does it greatly trouble itself to veil its wicked proceedings, for they cannot be concealed, and it is now endeavouring to possess itself of the last spoils stripped from justice on which it has trampled, from decency, and from religion. Under these distresses, which fill our days with bitterness, especially when we consider to what perils and snares the faith and virtue of our people is exposed, we cannot, venerable brethren, recollect or mention without the deepest gratitude the high desert of yourselves and of our beloved faithful under your care. For in every part of the world the faithful of Christ, responding with admirable zeal to our exhortations, and following you as their guides and examples, have persevered in continual and fervent prayers, and either by repeated devotions, or by holy pilgrimages, or by uninterrupted attendance in the churches, by approach to the participation of the sacraments, or by other special acts of Christian virtue, have deemed it their duty to have recourse with perseverance to the throne of divine mercy. All the burning zeal of these deprecatory prayers cannot fail to obtain from God abundant fruit. The numerous blessings that have already proceeded from them are the earnest of other good things to come, which we await in faith and hope. For we behold firmness of faith and warmth of charity expanding daily. We see stirred up in the minds of faithful Christians that concern and sympathy which God alone can inspire for this holy see and for the labours and conflicts of the Supreme Pastor. And we behold such unity of minds and wills that from the first ages of the Church, even to the present, it could never be said with more splendour and truth that the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. The Book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 32. In mentioning such a spectacle of virtue, we cannot pass over in silence our well-beloved children, the citizens of this city, whose love towards us, whose piety, and whose firmness equal to the trial, has shone, and still shines brilliantly with a greatness of soul not only worthy of, but even rivalling the heroism of their ancestors. Therefore do we ascribe immortal glory and thanks for you all, venerable brethren, and for our well-beloved children, the faithful, to the merciful God, who hath wrought such great things in you and in his church, and still worketh, and, where malice aboundeth, hath made the grace of faith, of charity, and of confession of the truth still more to abound. What is then our hope and our joy and crown of glory? Is it not you before God? A wise son is the glory of his father. May God therefore bless you, and may he be mindful of your faithful service and pious compassion, and the consolation and honour which you showed, and still show to the spouse of his son, in the evil time and in the days of her affliction. St. Bernard, Epistles 238 and 130. But in the meantime, the subalpine government, while, on the one hand, it exerts itself to make of Rome a fable for the whole world, St. Bernard, Epistle 243, on the other, has elaborately endeavoured to impose upon Catholics, and to quiet their anxieties, by drawing up and contriving certain futile immunities and privileges, called in the vulgar tongue, guarantigie, guarantees, with the intention of our accepting them in lieu of that civil princedom, of which, by a long series of plots, and by parricidal arms, it has robbed us. On these immunities and safeguards, venerable brethren, we have already passed our judgment, noting their absurdity, their disingenuousness, and their mockery in our letter of the 2nd of last March, addressed to our venerable brother Constantine Patrizzi, Cardinal of the Holy Roman Church, Dean of the Sacred College, and exercising the functions of our vicar in Rome, which letter was forthwith printed and published. But forasmuch as it is a characteristic of the said subalpine government to add an unfailing and base insincerity to its unblushing contempt of our pontifical dignity and authority, and as it is shown by its acts that it regards as naught our protests, expostulations and censures, hence 
notwithstanding the judgment expressed by us respecting the aforesaid guarantees, it has not desisted from urging forward and promoting their discussion and examination in the supreme estates of the realm, as though a serious affair were being transacted, in which discussion has clearly appeared both the truth of our judgment upon the nature and character of those guarantees, and the fruitlessness of the enemy's attempt to disguise their malicious and fraudulent intent. Truly, venerable brethren, it is incredible that so many errors, in open opposition to the Catholic faith, and even to the principles of natural justice, and that so many blasphemies as were uttered on that occasion, could be uttered in the midst of this Italy, which has ever boasted, and still boasts, above all things, of possessing the worship of the Catholic religion, and the see of the apostolic Roman pontiff, and in truth, by the protection of God over his church, widely different are the feelings which by far the greater part of Italy cherishes, groaning over and deploring together with us this new and unprecedented form of sacrilege, and by the continually increasing proofs of its affection and duty, proving to us that it is united in one spirit and sentiment with the rest of the faithful throughout the world. Wherefore, we this day again direct our voice to you, venerable brethren, and although the faithful of your diocese have, either by their letters or by other important protests, publicly expressed how bitterly they feel our distressed situation, and shown how far they are from being deceived by the trickeries disguised under the name of guarantees, yet have we judged it to be a duty of our apostolic office to declare solemnly through you to the whole world that not only those so-called guarantees which have been perversely fabricated by the Italian government, but any titles, honours, immunities, privileges, and whatsoever else may come under the name of guarantees, can be of no value whatsoever towards the assertion of that unfettered and free use of the power divinely committed to us, or towards the preservation of the necessary liberty of the Church. These things being so, as we have already many times declared and professed, that we cannot, without incurring the guilty of perjury, adhere to any scheme of conciliation which in any manner infringes our rights, or diminishes those rights which belong to God and to the Apostolic See, so now as bound by our office, we declare that we shall never admit, nor accept, nor can, under any circumstance, admit or accept those guarantees framed by the subalpine government, whatever may be their purport, or any other enactment of whatever kind and in whatever manner passed, which, under colour of securing our sacred power and liberty, may be offered to us in lieu and in derogation of that civil princedom by which divine providence has willed that the holy apostolic see should be secured and dignified, and possession of which is confirmed to us by the most legitimate and indisputable titles, and by a prescription of more than eleven centuries of possession. It cannot but be evident to every one that were the Roman pontiff to become subject to the dominion of any other prince, he would neither be himself any longer invested with supreme power in the political order, nor would he, either as to his person or as to his acts in the apostolic ministry, be exempted from the control of the ruler to whom he was subject, who might even become a heretic or a persecutor of the church, or be engaged in actual war or in virtual hostility against other princes. And in fact, this very granting of guarantees of which we are speaking, is it not of itself a very plain proof that on us, to whom is given by God, the authority to pass laws concerning the moral and religious order, on us who have been appointed the interpreters of natural and divine law for the whole world, laws are imposed, laws which concern the government of the universal church, and for the maintenance and execution of which there is no other right than what the lay power in its discretion may prescribe and ordain. And as to what pertains to the relation between the church and civil society, you well know, venerable brethren, that all prerogatives and all rights of authority needful for the government of the universal church, we, 
in the person of blessed Peter, have received directly from God. Moreover, that those prerogatives and rights, as also the liberty of the church, have been obtained and bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, and are to be valued according to that infinite price of his divine blood. We, therefore, should commit an outrage, which, God forbid, against the blood of our divine Redeemer, if we should consent to borrow from the princes of the earth these our rights, especially tarnished and pared down, as they now desire to hand them back to us. For Christian princes are the church's sons, and not her lords and masters, as that great light of sanctity and learning, St. Anselm, Archbishop of Canterbury, appositely told them, Think not that the church of God is given to you as a servant to a master. She is committed to you as to her advocate and defender. Nothing doth God so much love in this world as the liberty of his church. Epistle 8, line 4. And he further exhorts them in another place, where he writes, Never deem that the dignity of your grandeur is impaired if you love and defend the liberty of the spouse of God, your mother, the church. Think not that you are lowered when you exalt her, that you are weakened when you strengthen her. See, look around. There are examples in plenty. Consider the princes who attack and trample upon her, how it profits them, and what becomes of them is known to everybody. It needs not to be told. Certainly they who glorify her shall be glorified with her and in her. Epistle 12, line 4 now, however, venerable brethren, it must be evident to all, from these declarations which we have made to you, both now and on former occasions, that the injury done to this holy see in these troublous times must redound to the injury of all Christendom. For every Christian man, as St. Bernard said, is touched by wrong done to the apostles, who are the glorious princes of the earth. And since the Roman Church, as the before quoted St. Anselm says, labours for all the churches. Therefore, whosoever robs her is judged guilty of sacrilege, not against her alone, but against all the churches. Epistle 42, line 3. Certainly no man can doubt but that the conservation of the rights of this apostolic see is most closely bound up with the highest purposes and interests of the universal church, and with the liberty of your own Episcopal function. We, therefore, considering and pondering upon all these things, as is our duty, are compelled to confirm and constantly to reassert that which we have many times declared to you, who unanimously agreed with us that the civil princedom of the Holy See has been, by the singular design of divine providence, given to the Roman Pontiff, in order that he, the said Roman Pontiff, being never subject to any prince or civil power, may exercise in the fullest liberty throughout the universal church the supreme power and authority received from Christ our Lord of feeding and ruling the universal flock, and may consult for the church's greater good and for her interests and needs you, venerable brethren, and your faithful flocks, well knowing this, are all of you with reason troubled in behalf of religion, justice, and peace, which are the foundations of all good things, and illustrating the Church of God with a noble spectacle of faith, charity, constancy, and virtue, and being faithfully intent on her defence, are transmitting to her annals a new and admirable example for the remembrance of future generations. But forasmuch as the God of all mercies is the author of those good things, Therefore, lifting up our eyes, our heart, and our hopes to him, we do, without ceasing, beseech him that he would confirm, strengthen, and increase the noble sentiments of yourselves and of your faithful flocks, and your collective piety, love, and zeal. Yourselves also, and the people committed to your watchful care, we earnestly exhort that as the conflict grows more severe, so you would daily more resolutely and more abundantly cry with us to the Lord, that he may vouchsafe to hasten the time of his mercy. May God grant that the princes of the earth, whom it very greatly concerns not to allow the example of the usurpation 
which we are suffering to be confirmed and successful, to the ruin of all order and established authority, may be all united together with the consent of mind and will, and all disagreements being removed, rebellious disturbances being calmed down, and the fatal plots of the sects being defeated, they may undertake in concert the labour of restoring to this holy see its rights, and with them his full liberty to the church's visible head, and wished for tranquillity to civil society. Nevertheless, venerable brethren, do you implore, with fervent prayer, you and your faithful flocks, the divine mercy, that it may turn the hearts of the wicked to penance, and remove the blindness of their minds before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Or, crushing their wicked plots, show them how mad and foolish they are who attempt to overthrow the rock founded by Christ, and to violate its divine privileges. St. Gregory the Eighth, Epistle 6, Line 3 In these prayers let our hopes rest more firmly on God. Think you that God can turn a deaf ear to his most dear spouse when she stands and cries against those who have straightened her? How shall he not acknowledge the bone of his bone and the flesh of his flesh? Yea, also, in some sort, the spirit of his spirit. It is indeed now the hour of evil and the power of darkness. But this is the last hour, and the power swiftly passeth away. Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, is on our side, and the cause is his own. Be of good courage, he hath overcome the world. St. Bernard, Epistle 126 Meanwhile, let us, with good courage, and an assured faith, follow the voice of eternal truth, who hath said, Wrestle for thy life for justice, and contend for justice even unto death, and God will vanquish for thee thy enemies. Ecclesiasticus, chapter 4, verse 33. Finally, venerable brethren, we do from our soul pray for the richest blessings of heavenly graces on you, and on the faithful clergy and laity whom God hath committed to your care and as a token of our special and heartfelt affection to you and to them, we very lovingly impart to you and to them our apostolical benediction. Given at Rome, at St. Peter's, this 15th day of May, in the year of our Lord, 1871, in the 25th year of our pontificate. End of encyclical letter, Ubi Nos, on the Pontifical States, by Pope Pius the Ninth. Encyclical Letter Beneficia Dei on the 25th Anniversary of His Pontificate by Pope Pius IX Encyclical Epistle of Our Most Holy Lord Pius IX by Divine Providence Pope To all patriarchs, primates, archbishops, bishops, and other ordinaries in the grace and communion of the Apostolic See. Pius Pope IX Venerable Brethren, Health and Apostolical Benediction The benefits of God call upon us to celebrate His goodness, whilst they manifest anew His gracious protection over us and the glory of His Majesty. For now has elapsed the twenty-fifth year since, by the dispensation of God, we undertook the ministry of this our apostleship of which the troublous times are so fresh in your memory that they require no long mention from us. Truly, venerable brethren, is it evident from such a series of events that the Church militant hold on her course amidst frequent conflicts and victories. Truly does God rule and govern the changes of affairs in the world, which is his footstool, Truly does he often employ weak and contemptible instruments, thereby to fulfill the designs of his wisdom. Jesus Christ our Lord, the author and supreme ruler of the Church, which he purchased with his blood, has, for this long period of the duration of our apostolic service, deigned to govern and support by his grace and strength our weakness and littleness, to the greater glory of his name and to the benefit of his people, 
the merits of most blessed Peter, Prince of the Apostles, who in the sea of Rome ever lives and rules, pleading in our behalf. Therefore have we, being upheld by his divine aid, and continually availing ourselves of the counsels of our venerable brethren, the cardinals of the Holy Roman Church, and, not unfrequently, of yours also, venerable brethren, who were present here in Rome with us in great concourse, doing honor to this chair of truth by the brightness of your virtue and of your unanimous devotion, been able, in the course of this our pontificate, to define in accordance with our own wishes and those of the Catholic world, by a dogmatic definition, the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mother of God. Also to decree heavenly honors to numerous heroes of our religion, whose guardianship, and especially that of the Divine Mother, will, we doubt not, be exercised in favor of the Church in these her times of adversity. Equally was it by the aid and for the glory of God that we were enabled to carry forth the light of the true faith into distant and inhospitable regions by the mission of evangelical laborers. In many places to establish the order of the ecclesiastical hierarchy and to brand with solemn condemnation the errors especially prevalent in this age and alike hostile to human reason, to good morals, to Christianity, and to the state. Moreover, by the help of God, we have been able to join together in as firm and solid union as possible the ecclesiastical and civil power, both in Europe and in the parts of America, and to provide for many needs of the Eastern Church, which, from the commencement of our apostolic ministry, we have always regarded with fatherly affection. Lastly, it has been recently vouchsafed to us to commence and carry forward the work of the Ecumenical Council of which, however, the great results had been only partially attained, some of them being still awaited by the Church when, on account of well-known circumstances, we were compelled to decree its suspension. Nor have we ever failed, venerable brethren, by the help of God, to carry out all that the rights and duties of our civil government made incumbent upon us. You remember how, at the commencement of our pontificate, we were greeted with congratulations and plaudits, soon to be turned into such insults and attacks as drove us from this our well-beloved city into exile. But when, by the general efforts of Catholic loyalty and valor in peoples and princes, we were restored to this pontifical see, immediately we exerted all our energy and endeavors to promote and secure to our faithful subjects the solid and not fallacious prosperity which we have always recognized as the most important duty of our civil princedom. But the cupidity of a neighboring potentate coveted the territory of our temporal government, and obstinately preferred the counsels of the sex of perdition to our paternal and oft-repeated admonitions. And at last, as you well know, far outdoing the shamelessness of the prodigal son whom we read of in the gospel, he has attacked and taken with force and arms this our city, which he claimed as his own and now retained in his possession, against all right, as if it were the share of substance which fell to his lot. Venerable brethren, it is impossible but that we should be greatly moved to indignation and sorrow by the nefarious usurpation under which we are suffering. We are very grievously afflicted at the great wickedness of the design which aims, if it were possible, at the downfall of our spiritual power and of the kingdom of Christ on earth together with the destruction of the temporal power. We are afflicted at the sight of so many grave evils, especially those by which the eternal salvation of our people is imperiled. And in this affliction, nothing is so grievous to us as that by reason of the coercion put upon our liberty, we are debarred from applying the remedies needful for such evils. Added to these sources of affliction to us, venerable brethren, is another, in that protracted and deplorable series of calamities and misfortunes which has so long smitten down and crushed the noble French nation, which have been enormously aggravated recently by the unheard-of excesses perpetrated by a ferocious and abandoned horde, the offscourings of society, and particularly by the dreadful wickedness of the impious parasite consummated in the murder of our venerable brother, 
the Archbishop of Paris. You can well understand what feelings these events must excite in us when they have filled the whole world with fear and horror. Lastly, venerable brethren, there is one bitterness greater than any other. It is to see so many rebellious sons involved in so many and so terrible ecclesiastical censures, and yet disregarding our fatherly appeals, disregarding their own salvation, disregarding and despising the season of repentance still allowed them by God, obstinately determining rather to brave the divine vengeance in eternity than, in time, to experience the benefit of mercy. Now, however, through so many vicissitudes, under the protection of the most merciful God, we behold the approach of the anniversary of our election, on which we, having succeeded to the see of blessed Peter, although as far as possible from equaling his merits, have yet shared his length of years in apostolic service. This truly is a new, it is a singular and great instance of the divine goodness. It is conferred by the dispensation of God on us alone, out of the great succession of our holy predecessors in the long course of nineteen centuries. In it we recognize the wonders of divine mercy towards us, seeing that, during this time, we have been thought worthy to suffer persecution for the sake of justice, and beholding that marvelous sentiment of devotion and love with which the Christian people is strongly moved all over the world, and is drawn with unanimous affection towards this holy see. As these gifts have been conferred on us wholly unworthy, so we find our own powers quite unequal to the duty of returning due thanks. Wherefore we pray the Immaculate Virgin, Mother of God, to teach us, in the same spirit as she did, to give glory to the Most High in those sublime words, Pesit mihi magna qui potenest. He that is mighty hath done to me great things. You also we entreat, venerable brethren, that you, together with your flocks, would offer to God with us hymns of praise and thanksgiving. We say, in the words of Leo the Great, Magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together so that the entire catalogue of favors and mercies which we have received may be referred to the praise of him, their author. And do you make known to your people our burning charity towards them, and our deepest gratitude for their noble testimonies and acts of filial piety so long and so perseveringly exhibited towards us? And we, as far as regards ourselves, while we may use the words of the royal prophet and say, in colatus meus prolongatus est, we stand in need of the help of your prayers, that we may obtain strength and confidence to render up our soul to the Prince of Pastors, in whose bosom is refreshment from the ills of this turbulent and troublesome life, and the blessed haven of eternal calm and peace. And in order that the blessings which he of his bounty hath bestowed on our pontificate may redound to the greater glory of God, we, venerable brethren, do on this occasion unlock the treasury of spiritual graces and do grant to you in each of your dioceses on the sixteenth or twenty-first day of the present month or on any other day to be chosen by you at your discretion the power of imparting the papal benediction with the application of a plenary indulgence in the accustomed form. And desiring to consult the spiritual benefit of the faithful, we do, by these presents grant in the Lord, to all the faithful, secular, and regular of both sexes, in whatever place of each of your respective dioceses they may be, that all who have made their sacramental confession and received Holy Communion shall offer up devout prayers for the concord of Christian princes, for the extirpation of heresies, and for the exaltation of our Holy Mother the Church, on that day which you, by our authority, shall have chosen and appointed for bestowing the aforesaid benediction, or in dioceses where the see is vacant, on the day which the vicar's capitular for the time being shall have so chosen and appointed, shall be enabled and empowered to obtain plenary indulgence for all their sins. And we do not at all doubt, but that by this opportunity, all Christian people will be the more effectually stirred up to prayer, and that so, prayers being multiplied, 
we may deserve to attain the divine mercy which the view of present evils obliges us most earnestly to implore for yourselves venerable brethren we beseech almighty god to grant you constancy heavenly hope and all consolation and we intend as the augury of these graces and the testimony of our special regard the apostolic benediction which from the full exuberance of our heart we hereby impart to yourselves to your clergy and to the people committed to your charge given at rome at st peter's on the fourth of june being the feast of the most holy trinity in the year of our lord eighteen seventy one in the twenty-fifth year of our pontificate pious pope nine end of encyclical letter beneficia day on the twenty-fifth anniversary of his pontificate by pope pius the ninth encyclical letter saint be venerabilis fratres thanksgiving for twenty-five years of pontificate by pope pius the ninth encyclical epistle of his holiness pope pius the ninth to all patriarchs primates archbishops bishops and other ordinaries in communion with the holy see venerable brethren health and apostolical benediction often venerable brethren during our long pontificate have we turned to you and intimated how gratefully we have received the proofs of devotion and love which the god of all mercy has put it into your minds and into the minds of your faithful flocks to show to us and the apostolic see when the enemies of god began to invade its civil dominion in order that if it were possible they might prevail against jesus christ and his church which is his body and the fullness thereof you venerable brethren and the christian people have without ceasing besought god whom the winds and the sea obey that he would still the tempest nor have you desisted from repeating again and again the testimonies of your love or from discharging every duty by which you could console us in our tribulation and when this city the capital of the whole catholic world was wrested from us and we were placed at the disposal of those who had oppressed us you together with the multitude of the faithful of your dioceses redoubled your prayers and with your numerous denunciations you asserted the sacred rights of religion and justice that had been most audaciously trampled upon and now that by an event unknown since the days of saint peter and unprecedented in the whole succession of the roman pontiffs we have attained the twenty-sixth year of our pontificate in the chair of rome you have given such magnificent proofs of your joy on account of this great mercy granted to our littleness and you have so brilliantly exhibited in action the vigorous life with which the entire household of christ is animated that we have been profoundly affected at it and uniting our prayers to you we have been afresh encouraged to look with greater confidence than ever for the complete and absolute triumph of the church it has been most gratifying to us to know that in every part of the world the faithful have made in vast crowds pilgrimages to celebrated sanctuaries and that great assemblages of catholics have been gathered at those sanctuaries and there under the leadership of their own pastors have publicly offered up their prayers and made their communions to thank god for the great mercy he has bestowed upon us and to beseech him to give the victory to his church we felt our sorrows alleviated nay turned into joy at the congratulations contained in your letters at your assurances of loyalty at your prayers and at the very numerous arrivals of catholics from all parts amongst whom were many distinguished by noble rank and by ecclesiastical and civil dignities and still more ennobled by their faith all of whom being united in feeling and in act together with a large number of the citizens of rome and of the provinces that have been seized on from different and distant realms have traveled hither with one accord and have voluntarily exposed themselves to the same perils and insults to which we are exposed in order that they might come face to face with us and there testify the pious sentiments of themselves and their fellow citizens and also might present to us volumes containing many hundred thousand signatures of the faithful of all nations to addresses in which they characterized in the severest terms the invasion of our princedom and earnestly maintained that its restitution was demanded and enjoined by every principle of religion justice and even of civilization 
By this occasion also, there hath accrued to us a receipt of money larger than ordinary, both poor and rich having exerted themselves to relieve the poverty that had been brought upon us, added to which there were also manifold presents of various kinds and of great value, forming a magnificent tribute of the productions of Christian art and genius, excellently adapted to exalt the twofold powers, spiritual and royal, granted to us by Almighty God. There was also an extensive and splendid supply of sacred vestments and church furniture, out of which we were enabled to assist the poverty and meanness of a great many churches in different places. Truly it was a wondrous spectacle of Catholic unity, and one which clearly proved that the universal church, although spread over the whole world, and made up of nations differing in manners, in character, and pursuits, yet is animated by the same Spirit of God, and is all the more marvelously strengthened thereby, the more fiercely the impious persecute and distress her, and the more craftily they plot to cut her off from all human aid. Let, therefore, abundant and most hearty thanks be rendered to him who glorifies his own name, and at the same time by showing forth his ever-ready power and help, raises up our afflicted souls to the hope of final and certain triumph. If, however, we refer all the good things that we have received to God their giver, yet at the same time we do feel the utmost gratitude towards those who have been the agents of providence, and have discharged abundantly towards us all the duties of help, consolation, loyalty, devotion, and love. Lifting up our eyes and hands towards heaven, we offer to the Lord all that has been conferred on us in his name by our children, earnestly beseeching him that he would vouchsafe speedily to hear their united prayers for the liberty of the Holy See, for the victory of the Holy Church, and for the peace of the world, and that he would bountifully reward each one with earthly and heavenly blessings, which is beyond our power. In truth, we could have wished to express to each and to all personally our gratitude, and to give to each and to all the assurance of our warm affection. But the great number of presents, letters, and addresses that have come in from every quarter render this plainly impossible. In order, therefore, that our desire may in some manner be carried into effect, we communicate our sentiments to you, venerable brethren, first of all and beg that you would announce and explain them fully to your clergy and to your flocks. And we exhort all that they continue instant in prayer unitedly with yourselves, and in full confidence of soul. Or if the continual prayer of the just penetrateth the clouds, and turneth not back until the Most High regardeth, and Christ has promised that wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, and agree as to what they shall ask for, his heavenly Father will do whatsoever they shall ask. Much more must the Church Universal, by her continual and united prayer, obtain all that she asks for, so that, divine justice being appeased, she may behold the powers of hell crushed, the efforts of human malice defeated and brought to naught, and peace and justice restored to earth. But do you, venerable brethren, above all things, labor with your soul and strength to this end, that, being ever united together in a close phalanx, you may confront the enemies of God, ever attacking, with fresh plots and violence, the church, which no force shall ever destroy, that you may the more easily and successfully resist their onset and defeat their armies. This is what we do most earnestly desire and most fervently pray for. And with all our heart do we ask it for you and for the whole household of the Catholic Church. And as a pledge of that most wished-for issue and of the divine favor, and as an undoubted proof of the special affection and gratitude that we feel towards you and each one of you, venerable brethren, we do from our inmost heart most lovingly impart to yourselves, your clergy and flocks, the apostolic benediction. Given at Rome, at St. Peter's, August 5th, being the Feast of St. Mary of the Esquiline, Our Lady at Nive, Anno Domini, 1871, in the 26th year of our pontificate. End of encyclical letter, Sepe Venerabilis Fratris, by Pope Pius IX. Encyclical letter, Quartus Supra, on the Church in Armenia, by Pope Pius IX.
encyclical letter of his holiness pope pius the ninth on the affairs of the armenian church to our venerable brethren antony peter the ninth patriarch of cilicia the archbishops and bishops and to our dear sons the priests and faithful of the armenian rite in favor and communion of the apostolic see venerable brethren and dear sons health and apostolic benediction one twenty-four years have already elapsed since at the season when the return of the sacred days recalls the advent of the new star that appeared in the east to the nations that were to be illuminated by his brightness we addressed to the orientals our letters apostolic by which we desired to confirm the catholics in the faith and at the same time to bring back to the one fold of christ those unhappily outside of the catholic church at that moment the joyful hope shone upon us that by the help of god and our lord jesus christ the purity of the christian faith would be propagated more widely and that zeal and christian discipline would be seen to blossom again in the east to bring about that result we promise to employ our authority to fix and order that discipline according to the rule of the holy canons since then god knows how much solicitude we have felt for the orientals and with what charity our heart has embraced them as for the measures we have taken to attain that end they are known to all the world and would to god that all the world understood them properly but by an unfathomable judgment of god it has come to pass that things have in no manner corresponded with our endeavor or with our cares so that instead of rejoicing we have to complain and to groan by reason of the new scourge under which certain churches of the east are afflicted two that which jesus christ the author and finisher of the faith long ago foresaw for our warning namely that many should come in his name saying i am christ and should seduce many you have been compelled to see before your eyes and to have painful experience of for the adversary and enemy of the whole human race having three years since stirred up a fresh schism amongst the armenians at constantinople is now exerting all his strength by means of the wisdom of this world heretical discourses trickery subtlety and fraud nay even wherever he is able by force to ruin the faith to corrupt the truth and to rend unity saint cyprian has lamented and has at the same time exposed such hypocrisy and such trickery when he said the devil draws men away from the church and when they seemed to be already approaching the light and almost to have escaped the darkness of the world he throws fresh darkness over their ignorance to the end that declining from the doctrines and the obedience of the gospel of christ they may still nevertheless call themselves christians and that walking all the while in darkness they may imagine that they possess the light so are they cajoled and deceived by that enemy who according to the words of the apostle transfigures himself into an angel of light and sends his agents like the ministers of righteousness to preach the night instead of the day death instead of salvation despair under pretext of hope perfidy under color of faith and antichrist under the name of christ to the end that lying with the semblance of truth they may by their wiles draw away those that listen to them from the power of the truth three now although the beginnings of this new schism have been as commonly happens involved in much obscurity yet had we anticipated its wickedness and its perils and we had at once opposed them by two letters apostolic one written on the twenty fourth of february eighteen seventy and commencing with the words non sine gravissimo and the other of the twentieth of may in the same year and commencing with the words quo impensiore but the thing went on so that the authors and abettors of the schism dared in spite of the exhortations admonitions and censures of the apostolic see to elect a pseudo patriarch this election we have declared to be absolutely null and schismatical both as to the elect and the electors we laid upon them canonical penalties in our letter of the eleventh march eighteen seventy one commencing with the words ubi prima now after having seized with violence upon the churches of the catholics 
after having driven into exile the lawful patriarch our venerable brother antony peter the ninth after having invaded v et armis the patriarchal see of cilicia which is at the lebanon they have taken forcible possession of the civic prefecture itself they have imposed themselves on the catholic armenian nation and since then have been striving by every means to draw it into separation as they themselves are from the communion of the apostolic see and the obedience that is due to it amongst them the man who labors chiefly for these ends is one of the neoschismatic priests john capulian by name who had previously stirred up the people and fomented schism in the city of diarbekir or amida and who for this fact had been publicly and by name excommunicated and cut off from the catholic church by sentence of our venerable brother nicholas archbishop of mardin delegate apostolic in mesopotamia and the other countries acting by our authority for after having received from the pseudo patriarch a sacrilegious consecration as bishop this unfaithful priest took possession of the powers of a bishop and by persuasion or public menace assumes to have placed under his authority the catholics of the arminian rite if this could ever take place the catholics would be again brought to that miserable condition to which they were reduced forty years ago when they were subjected to the authority of the old schismatics of their right four as for us according to the custom of our predecessors whose authority patronage and support the most illustrious fathers and bishops of the east have always claimed under similar circumstances we have neglected nothing to remove from you so great evils it was with that view that we sent to constantinople our legate extraordinary also for that purpose and in order that we might not be reproached hereafter for having left anything undone that we ourselves wrote a private letter to the most exalted ottoman emperor to the end that the injuries inflicted on the catholic armenians might be redressed according to the laws of justice and that the expelled pastor might be restored to his flock but obstacles to the fulfilment of our desires were created by those who dare to call themselves catholics when they are the enemies of the cross of jesus christ five accordingly things are plainly come to such a pass that it is greatly to be feared lest the authors of the new schism while they plunge into wickedness themselves may succeed in seducing and leading into the path of perdition those who are weak in the faith or who are lacking in prudence as well amongst the armenians as amongst catholics of other rites therefore it is that by reason of our apostolic charge we are compelled to speak again to you and to warn all the people dispelling the darkness and the thick mists which as we well know have been gathering around the truth to the end that we may confirm those who are steadfast that we may sustain those who are weak and that we may bring back by god's help those who are miserably separated from the catholic unity and from truth if indeed they will listen which with our soul we ask of god six the greatest deceit that is made use of to cloak the new schism is the name of catholic which its authors and adherents have the audacity to assume notwithstanding the condemnations pronounced upon them by our authority and our judgment in effect heretics and schismatics have never failed thus to call themselves catholics and to publish the most plausible things in their own honor so as to draw princes and peoples into the error saint jerome amongst others points this out when he says the heretics are accustomed to say to their king or to pharaoh we are the sons of the sages who have transmitted to us from the beginning the apostolic doctrine we are the sons of the ancient kings who are called kings of the philosophers and in us the science of the scriptures is added to the wisdom of the world seven and to prove that they are catholics the neo-schismatics appeal to a certain declaration of faith which they say was drawn up by themselves on the sixth of february eighteen seventy and which they assert to differ in nothing from the catholic faith but when has it been allowed to any one to prove himself a catholic by drawing up at his own choice formulas of faith in which it is usual to conceal whatever it does not please him to show on the contrary to be a catholic it is necessary as the whole of the church's history proves 
to subscribe absolutely everything that is professed by the church. 8. What completes the proof that the formula of faith so drawn up by them is captious and full of fraud is that they have rejected the declaration of profession of faith proposed as usual on our authority. Subscription to this profession had been prescribed by our venerable brother Anthony Joseph, Archbishop of Tyana, Delegate Apostolic at Constantinople, who intimated the same to them by a letter addressed to them on the 29th September in the same year. In effect, it is contrary, as well to the divine institution of the Church, as to her constant and perpetual tradition, to admit that anyone can rightly profess the Catholic faith and truly claim to be a Catholic who does not satisfy the prescriptions of the Holy Apostolic See. For it is to this See, by reason of its primacy, that the Church, that is to say, the universal body of the faithful, ought to adhere. He then who leaves the chair of Peter, on whom the Church is founded, cannot without a lie assert that he is within the church. For he is a schismatic and a sinner who sets up another chair against the chair of St. Peter, from which emanate the rites belonging to that venerable community. 9. And this was well understood by the most illustrious bishops of the Oriental churches. Thus, at the Synod of Constantinople, held A.D. 536, Memnus, bishop of that city, made publicly, with the approbation of the fathers, the following declaration. As for us, your charity knows that we follow the apostolic see and are obedient to it. We have in our communion all who are in communion with it, and all whom it condemns are alike condemned by us. And with even greater fullness and earnestness did St. Maximus, abbot of Scutari and confessor of the faith, say, speaking of Pyrrhus, the monothelite, if he wishes neither to be a heretic nor to be called one, let him not try to satisfy this or that person. For as all are scandalized by him when one is scandalized, so if he satisfy one, all shall be satisfied. Let him then hasten to satisfy all men by satisfying the see of Rome. For Rome, once satisfied, all men everywhere will hold him for a pious and orthodox person. Otherwise, it is in vain that he talks. He who thinks to persuade or to take in all those that are like me, and who refuses to implore the Most Holy Pope and the Most Holy Church of Rome, that is to say, the Apostolic See, which, by virtue of God made flesh, of the Holy Synods, the Holy Texts, and the Holy Canons, commands throughout all the earth all the Holy Churches of God, and has authority over them all with the power of binding and loosing. Once more, this is why John, Bishop of Constantinople, taking his part in what was soon to become the Eighth Ecumenical Council, declared that those who have separated themselves from the Church's communion, that is to say, those who are not in all things in accord with the Apostolic See, their names ought not to be pronounced in the celebration of the Holy Mysteries. Whereby he clearly intimated that he did not hold them for Catholics, all which is of such importance and of so great weight that whosoever shall have been adjudged a schismatic by the Roman pontiff must not usurp the name of Catholic, so long as he does not thoroughly acknowledge and obey the plenary power of the sovereign pontiff. 10. Now as the neo-schismatics are not in the smallest degree disposed towards such submission, they have, imitating in this the practice of recent heretics, taken refuge in a new pretext by pretending that the sentence of schism and excommunication passed upon them by our venerable brother the Archbishop of Tyana, delicate apostolic at Constantinople, was unjust, and consequently of no validity or force. They have therefore refused to submit to it, and have put forward as a reason that they could not do so, lest the faithful who have been deceived by their ministrations should be deemed heretics. Now these pretexts are altogether novel. The ancient fathers of the church never recognized or admitted them. For in the whole church every man knows that the see of St. Peter the Apostle has the right of loosing whatever is bound by the sentence of every pontiff, forasmuch as it has the right of judging all the churches, and it is not lawful for any man to judge contrary to its judgment. Therefore it was that when the Jansenist heretics dared to teach similar doctrines and pretended that the excommunication inflicted by the lawful prelate might be contemned under color that it was unjust, 
and consequently that each person might notwithstanding it do whatever he deemed it his duty to do our predecessor clement the eleventh of happy memory by his constitution unigenitus proscribed and condemned those propositions as being in no way different from those articles of john wycliffe which had been previously condemned by the synod of constance and by martin v in fact although it might happen that any man through human infirmity might be unjustly afflicted by the censures of his bishop yet it is of necessity as our holy predecessor st gregory the great teaches that he who is under the hand of the shepherd fears to be condemned even unjustly and does not rashly resist the judgment of his pastor lest being condemned even unjustly he who was not guilty might incur guilt by reason of the pride by which he was impelled to such resistance but if we ought to be in fear of rebellion even when we are unjustly condemned by our pastor what shall be said of those who being justly condemned because they have been rebellious against their pastor and against this apostolic see tear and rend to pieces by a new schism the seamless robe that is to say the holy church of jesus christ eleven but the charity with which priests above all are bound to encompass the faithful ought according to the precept of the apostle to proceed from a pure heart a good conscience and an unfeigned faith first timothy one five and when enumerating the virtues by which we ought to exhibit ourselves truly as the ministers of god he adds exhibit in yourselves charity unfeigned that is in the word of truth in fine jesus christ himself being god who is charity has plainly declared that we must hold for heathens and publicans those who hear not the church lastly our predecessor st gelasius replied to euphemius bishop of constantinople who had alleged similar reasons in opposition to him the flock ought to follow the shepherd who leads them to wholesome pastures and it is not for the shepherd to follow the flock when it wanders along roads that lead it to destruction for the people ought to be taught not to be followed and if they refuse to listen to us when we warn them of what is permitted and what is not we ought not to bend to their will twelve but the schismatics tell us that it is not a matter of dogma but of discipline that is in question for as it was discipline to which our constitution reversurus published july twelfth eighteen sixty seven had reference they therefore say they cannot be refused the name or the rights of catholics how futile and vain this subterfuge is we doubt not that you perfectly well perceive for they who audaciously resist the lawful prelates of the church and above all the sovereign pontiff who refuse to obey their commands and even contemn their dignity such men the catholic church has always held as schismatics and as these acts lie at the door of the armenian faction at constantinople none can deem them exempt from the charge of schism even if they had not been condemned by the chief of the apostolic authority in effect the church as the fathers teach is the people united to the priest and the flock adhering to its shepherd by consequence the bishop is in the church and the church is in the bishop and if any man is not with the bishop he is no more with the church moreover as our predecessor pius the sixth remarked in his letters apostolic in which he condemned the civil constitution of the clergy in france discipline is often so incorporated with dogma and so influences its preservation in all its purity that the holy councils have not hesitated on several occasions to separate by an anathema the violators of discipline from the communion of the church thirteen but the new schismatics have gone further for it is impossible for schism not to invent some heresy so that it may appear to have justly separated from the church they have not feared then to accuse us us and this holy see as if having overstepped the limits of our power we had by issuing certain regulations of discipline to be observed in the armenian church put our sickle into another man's harvest and in effect they maintain that the oriental churches are not bound to keep communion and unity of faith with us but that in all that relates to discipline they are in no wise subject to the apostolic authority of st peter now not only is this doctrine manifestly heretical 
since the definition and declaration of the vatican council concerning the force and nature of the pontifical power but in all times the church catholic has held this doctrine as heretical and rejected it as much so the bishops of the ecumenical council of chalcedon proclaiming in a glorious manner by their acts the supreme authority of the apostolic see humbly asked of our predecessor saint leo his approbation and even his confirmation of their decrees concerning discipline fourteen and in truth the successor of saint peter by the very fact that he is established in his place possesses of right divine the guardianship of the whole flock of christ to the end that in concert with the episcopate he may exercise the power of universal government but as for the other bishops the particular guardianship of their flock is given to them not of right divine but by ecclesiastical right not by the mouth of jesus christ but by hierarchical ordinance to the end that they may extend over the flock the ordinary power of government but if the right to make this appointment were denied to saint peter and his successors the prerogatives even of the most ancient churches would be shaken for if jesus christ willed that saint peter should have something in common with the other princes he has never given save through him that which he has granted to the others and in fact he it is who gave dignity to the see of alexandria where he sent them the evangelist disciple he it is who confirmed the see of antioch where he remained seven years although he had to quit it and as regards the decrees that were passed at the council of chalcedon concerning the see of constantinople we have the testimony of the emperor marcion and of the bishop of constantinople himself anatolius who confessed that to these decrees the approbation and confirmation of the apostolic see was absolutely necessary sixteen thus then unless we are to discard the church's constant and perpetual tradition abundantly confirmed by the testimony of the fathers the neoschismatics for all that they proclaim themselves catholics cannot in any wise persuade themselves that they are entitled to the name and if the cunning craftiness of heretical trickery were not sufficiently evident and well known we should be unable to comprehend how the ottoman government could consider as catholics those whom it knows to have been by our judgment and authority separated from the catholic church in effect as the catholic religion may be practised in freedom and safety under the ottoman dominion according to the decrees of the most exalted emperor it follows that of necessity whatever is necessary for that religion as is the primacy of jurisdiction of the roman pontiff must be admitted and that to his judgment as head and universal and supreme pastor must be left the duty of deciding who is catholic and who not that is a principle which is recognized by all nations and the same must hold good if a mere human and private society were in question seventeen but these neoschismatics assert that they do not at all attack the institutions of the catholic church they say that they desire only one thing to defend the rights of their churches and of their nation nay those of his imperial highness the emperor which they accuse us of having violated so that in all the present troubles they are not afraid to throw the blame upon us and upon this holy see as once did the Achaean schismatics to our predecessor st gelasius and before them the arians to our predecessor liberius whom they accused to the emperor constantius of having refused to condemn st athanasius bishop of alexandria and to receive those heretics into his communion whereat one may feel sorrow but not surprise for as the most holy pontiff gelasius wrote to the emperor anastasius there is often a propensity in sick people to blame the physicians who would restore them to health by suitable remedies rather than abandon the appetites that are injurious to them as then such appear to be the principal pleas by which the neoschismatics conciliate the favor and obtain the esteem of the powerful for their detestable cause it is necessary in order that the faithful may not be led into error to treat of them at greater length than if it were simply a question of refuting their calumnies eighteen certainly we do not mean here to recall to memory the situation into which the catholic churches established in the east had come after that schism had prevailed and god had avenged upon the empire of the greeks by the overthrow of that empire the division which had been made in the unity of the church neither is it within our design to recall to mind 
how our predecessors labored as soon as ever it was possible for them to do so to bring back the wandering sheep to the one true flock of our lord jesus christ nevertheless and although the fruits have not equaled the labor several churches and diverse rites have by the mercy of god returned to catholic truth and unity it is these churches which the apostolic see taking them in their arms as newborn babes is occupied more especially in protecting in order to confirm them in the catholic faith and to keep them safe from every taint of heresy nineteen also upon the information that there were spreading in the east the impious doctrines of a sect that had already been rejected by the holy see and which tended before all things to pull down the primacy of the pontifical jurisdiction pius the seventh of happy memory being strongly moved by the gravity of the danger judged it good to provide against it at once lest in these conflicts and in the vain equivocations heaped up around these questions the true sense of the words transmitted by their ancestors should by little and little be effaced from the minds of faithful christians to that effect he caused to be addressed to the patriarchs and the oriental bishops the old formulary of our predecessor saint hermistas and at the same time he ordered them that so far as the jurisdiction of each of them reached they should prescribe to all bishops and to all priests of the regular and secular clergy having charge of souls to subscribe if they had not already done so the profession of faith required by pope urban the seventh the same thing was also to be exacted of those who were in future to be admitted to ecclesiastical orders or promoted to any sacred ministry twenty now some time afterwards that is to say in the year eighteen o six there was held at the monastery of carcaphus situated in the diocese of beirut a synod called the synod of antioch the acts of that synod were borrowed secretly and fraudulently from the synod of pistoia already condemned and including part textually and part in an equivocal adaptation some of the propositions of that synod of pistoia already condemned by the holy see of rome other propositions savored of jansenism and bianism were opposed to ecclesiastical authority were subversive of the church's constitution and militated against sound doctrine and the discipline sanctioned by the church all those decrees of the council of carcaphus were then unknown to the apostolic see printed in arabia in the year eighteen ten and they had stirred up numerous quarrels amongst the bishops when at length the synod was disapproved and condemned by our predecessor of happy memory gregory the sixteenth at the same time the pope ordered the bishops to borrow the rules of government and of doctrine from the other ancient synods long since approved by the holy see would to god that the synod having been condemned the errors with which it abounded had been put an end to for those perverse doctrines did not cease to spread themselves secretly in the east seeking the favorable opportunity when they should be able to come forth before the eyes of all men the rebellion which was unsuccessfully attempted twenty years ago the new schismatics have dared to accomplish twenty one now discipline being the bond of faith it was needful that the holy see in accordance with its right and its duty should apply itself to the defense of it in the performance of this most serious duty rome has never been wanting although through the untowardness of times and circumstances she has sometimes taken account of present necessities while awaiting the better times which god's mercy shall at length grant us for a time in fact at the instance of our predecessors leo the twelfth and pius the eighth supported by the catholic sovereigns of austria and france the most exalted ottoman emperor having recognized the separation which exists between catholics and heretics removed the former from under the civil jurisdiction of the latter and allowed them to appoint for themselves according to the civil custom of the country a chief or prefect at that period it was for the first time permitted to establish in all security at constantinople bishops of the armenian rite possessing ordinary authority it was permitted to build catholic churches of the same rite and to profess and practice publicly the catholic worship so that our predecessor pius the eighth of happy memory once erected at constantinople a primatial and archiepiscopal see of the armenians urged by his solicitude in order that catholic discipline might there opportunely and becomingly flourish anew
22. Some years subsequently, when it appeared to us opportune to do so, we erected episcopal sees suffragan to the primatial see of Constantinople, and then was established the method to be observed for the election of bishops. Subsequently provision was made by the authority of the sultan himself that the power of the civil prefect should not encroach on things sacred, which is completely opposed to the laws of the Catholic Church. This was settled by the imperial diploma of the 7th of April, 1857, given to our venerable brother, Antony Hassoun, then primate of that see. Lastly, when, at the request of the Armenians themselves, we had, by the letters apostolical, reversurus, united the primatial church of Constantinople to the patriarchal see of Cilicia, with the abolition of the former title, it seemed opportune and even necessary to sanction the principal heads of that discipline by the authority of this constitution. For that purpose, the patriarchal synod was assembled, which, by our apostolical letter, commissum, dated the 12th of July, 1867, we ordered to assemble as soon as possible, in order that it might labor with diligence to establish perfect order of discipline throughout the whole Armenian patriarchate. 23. But the enemy soon busied himself in sowing the darnel in the Armenian church of Constantinople, some people having raised the question of the civil prefecture, which they accused the new patriarch of having monopolized. From this controversy there soon arose great trouble, and the same patriarch was accused of having betrayed the rights of the nation, because he had received, as he was in Catholic duty bound to do, our constitution. From that time forward, all the councils, all the machinations, and all the sarcasms of the dissidents were leveled at that constitution. 24. Two things, before all others, were found fault with in that constitution, namely, its regulations about the election of bishops, and its decisions relating to the administration of corporate property. For the dissidents calumniously accused these regulations of being encroachments upon the rights of the nation, and even upon those of his imperial highness. Now although all that we have defined upon this double subject ought to be perfectly well known, yet we are pleased to say it over again, for there have always been and still are very many who speak in the vanity of their mind through the ignorance that is in them. And there are others who, like diviners and soothsayers, speak continually that which they know not. 25. We ordained that the patriarch should be chosen by the synod of the bishops, to the exclusion of laymen as electors, and even of clerics not invested with the episcopal character. We also forbade the person elected to take position of his office, in other words to be enthroned, before having received from the apostolic see the letters confirming him in his charge. As for the bishops, we ordained that they should be elected as follows. All the bishops of the province, assembled in synod, shall propose to the apostolic see three candidates chosen from amongst the ecclesiastics eligible. If it is impossible for all the bishops to come to the synod, the nomination shall be made by at least three diocesan bishops assembled in synod with the patriarch. The absent bishops shall send the threefold nomination in writing. That done, the Roman pontiff shall choose one of the candidates whom he shall place at the head of the vacant church. Lastly, we said that we did not doubt that the bishops would take pains always to propose worthy and suitable persons, so that we and our successors might never be compelled by the duty of our apostolic charge, ourselves to choose a candidate not proposed, and to place him at the head of the vacant church. 26. These regulations, if examined in a spirit free from partisan passion, will be seen to be in entire conformity with the holy canons and with the Catholic faith. As for the exclusion of laymen from the election of bishops, we must, if we would avoid asserting what is contrary to the Catholic faith, carefully distinguish between the right of choosing bishops and the opportunity afforded of rendering testimony as regards the life and manners of the candidates for election. The former pretension must be classed with the false maxims of Luther and Calvin, who went so far as to say that it was of right divine that the bishops should be chosen by the people. Now everyone knows that this false maxim was and is condemned by the Catholic Church, for never, either by right divine or by ecclesiastical right, 
have the people had the power of electing bishops or other ministers of the sacraments. 27. As to the testimony of the people in what concerns the life and manners of those who are to be promoted to the episcopate, since the Catholic bishops began to be driven from their sees by the violence of the Arians, who were favored by the Emperor Constantius, and installed their partisans in those sees, as St. Athanasius deplores, the necessity of the times constrained that the people should be called in to take part in the elections of bishops, in order that they might be stirred up to maintain and protect in his see the bishop whom they knew had been chosen in their presence. And it is true that this custom was practiced for some time in the church, but as there resulted from it continual discords, tumults, and other abuses, the people had to be kept away from the elections, and the church had to dispense with their testimony or their desires on the subject of the person to be elected. For, as St. Jerome remarks, often the judgment of the people and of the multitude is fallacious. When a priest has to be supported, every man tries to favor his own way of living, so that the nomination urged is not so much that of a good candidate as of a candidate who resembles yourself. 28. Nevertheless, we have willed that in the method of election to be observed there be allowed to the bishop's synod full liberty of making inquiry in the manner which may suit them best into the candidate's qualities, without excluding the people's testimony if that be agreeable to them. And, in point of fact, the acts transmitted to the Holy See attest that even after our constitution was published, this mode was employed by the Armenian bishops when three years since they had to elect a bishop for the country of Sebast and Tokat. But we did not think, and we still do not think it fitting, to act in the same manner at the election of a patriarch, and that both, because of his eminent dignity and because he is placed at the head of all the bishops of his country, and because it appears from the acts transmitted to the Holy See that elections of patriarchs in every oriental rite have always been made by the bishops alone, unless when the contrary was required by pressing and extraordinary circumstances, as, for example, when it afforded a means for the Catholics to support themselves against the power and violence of the schismatics to whom they were subjected. For then, in choosing for themselves another patriarch, they clearly manifested by the act itself their separation from the schismatics, and confirmed their true and sincere conversion to the Catholic faith, which is what took place at the election of Abraham Peter I. 29. But what very many persons bear impatiently, and what they complain of, is, on the one hand, that we have reserved to this holy and apostolic see the right and the power of choosing the bishop, either in the list of three nominations or out of the same, and on the other hand, that we have forbidden the bishop-elect to be enthroned before that his election shall have been confirmed by the Roman pontiff. Upon these two points they object to us the customs of their churches and the canons, as though we had departed from the practice of the holy canons. To all which we might reply with our predecessor St. Gelasius, who was assailed by the Acacian schismatics with the same calumny. They oppose to us the canons, he said, but they know not what they say, because it is they who violate them by refusing obedience to the first see of the church, which counsels them things wise and just. And in effect, it is those very canons which recognize the universal divine authority of St. Peter over the whole church, and it is they who proclaim, as was said at the Synod of Ephesus, that St. Peter lives now and always in his successors to exercise this judgment and authority. Also to those who thought that by the intervention of the Roman pontiff anything was subtracted from the privileges of the churches of the royal city of Constantinople, Stephen, Bishop of Larissa, was able to answer in confidence and with reason. The authority of the apostolic see which was granted by God our Savior to the Prince of the Apostles is above all the privileges of the holy churches, and all the churches of the world with one accord confess this. 30. Moreover, if you recall to your minds the history of your countries, you will therein find examples of the Roman pontiffs using that power whenever they have judged its exercise to be necessary for the safeguard of the churches of the East. Thus, the Roman pontiff Agapetus, by his own authority, deposed the bishop Antheus from the See of Constantinople. Thus also our predecessor Martin I entrusted his power for the East to John Bishop of Philadelphia, 
and in virtue he said of the apostolic authority granted to us of god by saint peter prince of the apostles he prescribed to the aforesaid bishop to appoint bishops priests and deacons in all the towns of the provinces then subject either to the see of jerusalem or to the see of antioch and if you refer to more recent times you will see that the bishop of mandan of the armenians was elected and consecrated by the authority of the apostolic see lastly our predecessors confided that care of the churches to the patriarchs of cilicia and it is by the good pleasure of the holy see that the administration of the country of mesopotamia has been committed to them all that is perfectly in conformity with the power of this supreme see of rome which the church of the armenians except during the lamentable times of schism has always recognized proclaimed and obeyed nor can any one be surprised at this when he sees enduring in its full vigor even amongst those amongst you who are still separated from the catholic faith the ancient tradition of that great bishop and martyr gregory in whom you justly glory as the illuminator of your nation of him whom st chrysostom calls a sun arising over the countries of the east and whose bright rays bore light even to the greeks when one sees we say still extant the tradition that he received his authority from the apostolic see whither he did not hesitate publicly to repair notwithstanding the fatigues of a long and arduous journey thirty one now after having long reflected on ancient affairs and recent facts we have been impelled by very grave and maturely weighed motives to take at length this decision and that not at any suggestion of others but of our own proper motion and certain knowledge indeed every one may understand that upon the regular election of bishops depends the eternal happiness and often the temporal felicity of peoples now considering the circumstances of time and place it is important to exert vigilance that the authority of instituting holy bishops should be restored in its integrity to the holy see from whence it emanates yet however it has seemed good to us so to temper this authority that there might be preserved to the synod of the bishops the power of electing the patriarch and that it should also appertain to the same synod to propose for our choice three fitting candidates for the vacancies this is what has been established by the constitution cited by us above thirty two moreover in order to stir up the lukewarm in this matter and to add a stimulant to those who are already filled with zeal we declared that we hoped that there would always be proposed to us persons fitting and worthy of so great an honour so that we should never be constrained to put forward into the vacancy another person than one of the candidates this point however had already been the object of the same precautions and of the same plan in the method established by us in eighteen fifty three now we have learnt that from these words moderate as they are occasion has been taken by some to suspect that the synod's nomination of bishops will be of no weight with us and will be perfectly illusory others have gone further and have taken these words as concealing a design to hand over to latin bishops the government of the armenians truly accusations so senseless do not deserve a reply for those only could have made them who are carried away by their imaginations and who have trembled for fear where there was no fear as for our right to elect a person not named in the ternary list we thought that we ought to pass it over in silence in order that in future its exercise might never be made incumbent on the holy see but the right and the duty even had we made no mention of them would have remained in their integrity for the rights and privileges that have been given to this holy see by jesus christ himself may be attacked but can never be overthrown and it is not in the power of man to renounce a right divine which he may often be obliged to exercise by the will of god himself thirty three moreover although things have been established in this manner for the armenians during more than twenty years and although during that period it has several times been necessary to elect bishops never up to the present time has it become necessary for us to make use of that power nor even more recently since the publication of the constitution reversurus have we received a list of three names out of which we have not been able to choose a bishop as to what we said that we would arrange anew 
so that the synod of bishops by conforming themselves to the laws prescribed by us might enable us never to have to elect a person not nominated the new schism which has rent the armenian church has been the obstacle which has prevented our doing this but we have confidence that the times will never be so calamitous that the roman pontiffs should be constrained to set over bishoprics candidates not proposed by the synod of bishops thirty four we have yet something more to add upon the subject of the prohibition by which the patriarchs cannot be enthroned previous to their confirmation by this apostolic see and first all the ancient documents attest that never was the election of patriarchs regarded as complete without the consent and confirmation of the roman pontiff secondly it is proved by the demand made for it by the emperors that this confirmation was always solicited by the patriarchs themselves thus to cite only a few examples in so clear a question anatolius bishop of constantinople who certainly had not deserved well of the apostolic see nay more Fuzius himself the first author of the greek schism solicited of the roman pontiff the confirmation of their election and employed for that purpose the intervention of the emperors theodosius michael and basilius so in the case of maximus bishop of antioch the fathers of chalcedon although they had declared null and void all the acts of the council or rather the latrocinium of ephesus which had substituted that bishop for dominus yet resolved to place him in possession of the see for the reason that the holy and most holy pope who confirmed the episcopate of the holy and venerable maximus bishop of antioch showed by his just judgment that he approved his merit thirty five and as to the patriarchs of these churches who having abjured schism returned within recent dates into catholic unity you will not find any who did not request confirmation of the roman pontiff and the roman pontiffs by their letters have confirmed them all and have done it in such a way that by the same act they instituted them and placed them directly at the head of their churches now it has happened that the holy see tolerating the practice by reason of the remoteness of the countries the perils of the journey and the dangers in which the tyranny of the schismatics of the same right often involved them the patriarchs elect used to exercise their authority before receiving their confirmation by the sovereign pontiff the same concession having been also made by dispensation in the west for the sake of convenience and of the necessity of the churches for those that were very remote but it is proper to remark that these causes have now ceased to exist for travelling is not attended with the same dangers as formerly and catholics by the good will of his highness the ottoman emperor have been withdrawn from the civil authority of the schismatics now no one can fail to see that thus provision can be with more security made for the preservation of the faith than in times when a person unworthily elected to so great a charge could ascend the patriarchal throne and at his will trouble the church before having received apostolic confirmation and certainly it is to be anticipated that causes of trouble may arise if the patriarch elect having been rejected by the apostolic see should have to quit his seat thus if the facts themselves be examined with even slight attention it is seen that all that was settled by our constitution was for the conservation and extension of the faith as well as for the true liberty of the church and to secure the authority of the bishops whose rights and privileges being founded supported and fortified upon the stability of the apostolic see have always been at the prayer of the bishops vigorously defended by the sovereign pontiff against heretics and ambitious men thirty six as to national rights as they are called we have no need to detain you long with our reply on that subject for if the question is only about civil rights those rights are attached to the power of the sovereign to decide about them in the manner that he shall judge to be most conducive to the welfare of his subjects but if the expression be extended to mean ecclesiastical rights no person can be ignorant that catholics have never recognized in the church in her hierarchy or in her regulations any of those national rights or rights of peoples in effect although nations and peoples from all parts of the world are brought together into the church god has so well united them in the unity of his name under the guidance of saint peter prince of the apostles and supreme pastor whom he has placed at the head of all that henceforward as said the apostle 
there is neither gentile nor jew barbarian nor scythian bond nor free but christ is all and in all colossians three eleven from whom the whole body of the church being compacted and fitly joined together by what every joint supplieth according to the operation in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in charity ephesians four sixteen for the lord not only has given to the nations and peoples no power whatsoever over the church but by the commandment which he has caused them to believe he has given the nations to the apostles that they should be taught therefore did saint peter declare solemnly in presence of the assembled apostles and ancients that god had chosen him and that by his mouth the ancients might receive the teaching of the gospel which they were to believe thirty seven it is also said that the rights of his imperial highness have been violated by us it is a gross calumny of which heretics have long made use invented first by the jews against the christ god it was very often employed by the pagans in addressing the roman emperors and then by heretics in addressing even catholic princes and would to god that it were not still employed by them in the same manner therefore it was that saint jerome wrote that the heretics adulate the royal power and so use it that they may impute to kings their own pride and in order that the king may seem to do what they are themselves doing they accuse before him the soldiers and preachers of the faith and order the teachers not to preach in israel lest they go against the will of the prince because it is bethel that is to say the house of god and they contrive it so that the false church shall be reputed as the house of the kingdom and the king a holy thing these unblushing calumnies might be sufficiently refuted by contempt and by silence so utterly foreign are they to the doctrines of the catholic faith to our manners and our institutions but regard must be had to the simple and ignorant that they may not be so unhappy as to think wickedly of us and of the apostolic see by reason of the calumnies of the wicked who by the accusations which they lay upon others seek to themselves an excuse for their own vices thirty eight the doctrine of the catholic church received from god himself and handed down by the holy apostles is that we ought to render to caesar the things that are caesar's and to god the things that are god's and therefore our predecessors have never neglected whenever need arose to inculcate the fidelity and obedience due to princes accordingly even as the administration of civil matters belongs properly to the emperors so the affairs of religion concern the priests only in these affairs must be included everything necessary for the establishment and maintenance of the exterior discipline of the church for as our predecessor pius the sixth of venerable memory taught it is a heresy to assert that the use of this power received from god constitutes an abuse of ecclesiastical authority the apostolic see has always labored to maintain strictly unbroken this distinction of powers and all the holy pontiffs have openly blamed the interference of secular princes in things ecclesiastical an interference called by saint athanasius a new spectacle and an invention of the arian heresy it is sufficient to cite amongst them basil of caesarea gregory the theologian john chrysostom and john damascene this last declares plainly that no man shall persuade him that the church ought to be governed by the edicts of the emperors but that on the contrary she is ruled by the decrees of the fathers be they civil decrees or not therefore it is that the fathers of the ecumenical council of macedonia in the cause of Phocius, bishop of tyre proclaimed with equal plainness with the assent of the emperor's ministers themselves that against the rules no pragmatic that is no imperial edict shall prevail but that the canons of the fathers shall have all authority and at the enquiry of these same ministers whether the holy council passed this decree with reference to all the pragmatics made in prejudice of the canons all the bishops answered all the pragmatics are to cease the canons are to subsist and let this be done by you thirty nine there are two points in which it is asserted that the imperial rights have been violated by us namely as to our having regulated the mode of election and institution of the holy bishop 
and as to our having forbidden the patriarch to alienate ecclesiastical property without advice from the apostolic see. 40. But what is there that belongs more strictly to things ecclesiastical than the elections of bishops? We nowhere read in the sacred writings that they were committed to the will of the prince or of the people, while the fathers of the church, the ecumenical councils, and the apostolic constitutions have always recognized and decided that they appertain to the ecclesiastical authority. If, then, in the question of the institution of a pastor of the church, the apostolic see regulates the mode of election, how can it be said that the rights of his imperial highness are violated? His highness exercises his own power, not the rights of another. The authority of the holy bishops over the people committed to them is eminent and venerable, but there is nothing in it which the civil government need fear, because that government will have in it not an opponent, but a supporter of the legitimate rights of the prince. And if, by reason of human weakness, it should prove otherwise, the apostolic see itself would make every effort to remove a bishop who should withdraw from the fidelity and submission due to his legitimate prince. Nor is there any reason to fear that an enemy of a legitimate prince should slip into a see, for according to the church's law, a long enquiry takes place previously as to those who are to be promoted, that they may be ascertained to possess the virtues which the apostle requires in a bishop, that man would not possess them who should be found not to be an observer of the command of blessed Peter, prince of the apostles, be ye subject therefore to every human creature for God's sake whether it be to the king as excelling, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of the good. For so is the will of God, that by doing well you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not making liberty a cloak for malice, but as the servants of God. 41. And if, as has seemed to the Ottoman sovereign at Constantinople and to his successors to be advantageous, it be thought good also to entrust to the bishops and to other members of the clergy civil functions and a right of election, it is not on that account that the full and entire power of the church in their election can suffer any diminution. For it would be absurd that the things of heaven should be subordinated and subjected to the things of earth, and the spiritual to the temporal. Besides that, it would always be possible for his imperial highness, if he thought proper, to entrust to another the function of the civil power under the reserve for the Catholic bishops of the free and full exercise of their ecclesiastical power. It is quite well known that this has been done in other circumstances, and especially by a special firman of the very exalted emperor of the Turks in 1857. 42. As all things have already been signified officially in our name and by our command to the sublime Porta, our venerable brother, the Bishop of Thessalonica, our legate extraordinary at Constantinople, it is evident, right and proper, to abstain from sifting over again these calumnies and trivial accusations, unless it were desired to address those who are adversaries and care more for their party than for truth. 43. But we have been greatly surprised to learn that on the occasion of the law established and confirmed by us on the subject of the sale of church property, we not only meant to usurp imperial rights, but even to claim for ourselves the property belonging to the Armenian churches. Ecclesiastical property belongs as certainly to churches as civil property to citizens, and it is not so much by the canons as by natural right itself that to everyone is assured the possession of his own. The administration of that property, which in the early ages of the church was left to the discretion and conscience of the bishops, has been by decrees of later councils regulated by laws determining the mode of management and the causes of lawful alienation, whereby the ancient powers of bishops have been circumscribed and committed to the prudent judgment of the council, or even of superior bishops. But as it has appeared that sufficient provision had not been made for the safekeeping of church property, either on account of the infrequency of councils, or for some other reason, the authority of the Holy See has had to interfere, and by it the regulation has been established that church property shall not be sold without the consent of the sovereign pontiff. 44. 
this regulation was held to be of such weight and importance and so needful for their interest that it was long ago made a rule that newly elected bishops archbishops and even patriarchs should be bound under the obligation of an oath to observe this rule the oath has been taken even by patriarchs of the oriental rite in reference to the property of their mensa ever since their church returned back to the catholic truth in unity as documents preserved in our apostolic archives attest and there is not one of those patriarchs but has promised an oath to observe the aforesaid law the same has been and is done every day by the bishops of the latin rite in every country kingdom or republic without those powers ever making complaint that their rights were violated by the practice and in fact by these laws the sovereign pontiff usurps nothing arrogates nothing he simply makes a point either of deciding after enquiry and with regard to the advantage of the churches what a bishop ought to do in any particular case or of giving to the bishop himself the power of deciding as a father of a family would act with his children as to our having in our constitution extended to our other ecclesiastical brethren the rule already imposed upon patriarchs with regard to the property of their mensa not to put it up to sale without the assent of the apostolic see no man who judges reasonably will suppose that we acted without grave reasons of which we know that we must give account to god suffice it to know what every man of sense will without difficulty understand that so the safety of the churches and the safekeeping of church property has been more readily and effectively secured and that without prejudice to the lawful rights of any man our constitution aforesaid forty five how the rights of his imperial highness have been as they say violated by our decrees we freely avow that we cannot in any wise understand so far are we from having intended such a result for if it cannot be said that the power which the patriarchs and bishops enjoy even in the turkish empire in the administration of church property is prejudicial to those rights no more can this be said of the power exercised according to its duty and its right by the apostolic see in determining by its authority the mode in which sacred prelates ought to use such property for edification and not for destruction it is manifest that we have thus provided for the conservation of that property and that this regulation will be most useful in the churches established in the east when passions shall have calmed down every one will acknowledge it and posterity if these laws are strictly observed will experience the advantage of them and as the sultan has by his decrees affirmed the liberty of these churches and has signified to us that he exercises his patronage over them with great benignity we doubt not that after serious examination of the facts and rejection of the calumnies heaped up by adversaries he will view rather with satisfaction than regret measures that must conduce to their manifest benefit forty six no less calumnious is the objection recently imagined and maliciously accepted by the oriental dissidents who have actually treated the roman pontiff the vicar of jesus christ as a foreign power interfering in the exterior affairs of states and the governments of peoples a thing they say that must be put a stop to once for all in order that the rights of his imperial highness may be protected from invasion and that every avenue must be closed up so that other princes may not be encouraged to commit similar encroachments forty seven it is easy to understand how false and contrary to good sense and to the divine economy of the catholic church are all such suppositions first it is false that the roman pontiffs have ever exceeded the limits of their power and interfered in the civil administration of states and that they have usurped the rights of princes if the roman pontiffs are exposed to this calumny because they make regulations for the election of bishops and the sacred ministers of the church and about the causes or other affairs which concern the ecclesiastical discipline called exterior then of two things one either men ignore or else they resist the divine and immutable organization of the catholic church it has ever been and ever will remain stable and cannot be subject to change especially in those countries where the proper liberty and security of the catholic church has been assured by the decrees of the head of the state in fact as it is of faith that the church is one and that the roman pontiff is her head and the father and teacher of all christians 
he cannot be called a foreigner to any christians or to any of the particular churches of christians at least unless it be asserted that the head is foreign to the limbs the father to the son the master to the scholars the shepherd to the flock forty eight moreover those who hesitate not to call the apostolic see a foreign power rend the unity of the church by that mode of speech or furnish a pretext for schism since they thereby deny to the successor of blessed peter the rights of universal pastor and by consequence fail in the faith due to the catholic church if they are of the number of her sons or they assail the liberty that is her due if they do not belong to her for our lord jesus christ has manifestly made it a duty for the sheep to know and hear the voice of the shepherd and to follow it and on the contrary to fly from the stranger for they know not the voice of strangers confer john ten five if then the sovereign pontiff be reputed extern that is a stranger to any particular churches that church will also be a stranger to the apostolic see and consequently to the catholic church which is founded on the words of the lord to peter they that separate from that foundation do not retain the divine and catholic church but they are striving to make a human church which being held together only by the human tie of nationality as they say is not any longer bound together by means of its priests firmly attached to the see of peter and cannot share in its solidity nor be any longer in the universally formed and indissoluble unity of the catholic church forty nine all these things venerable brethren and dear sons we have judged it fitting under the critical circumstances of the moment to write to you you who are sharers in the same faith with us in the justice of our god and saviour jesus christ in order to strengthen your uprightness of mind in the midst of this trouble for you are beholding amongst yourselves the accomplishment of that which the holy apostles of god long ago foretold namely that there should come in the last days men of deceit and of lies walking according to their own lusts watch then lest you be carried away in another gospel than that which has called you to the grace of christ and this other gospel is that of the contentious men who are troubling you and who wish to change the gospel of christ for they truly wish to change the gospel of christ they who strive to shake the foundation on which jesus christ has built his church and who deny or make vain the universal charge to feed the sheep and the lambs given to the blessed peter in the gospel in truth god permits and allows that these things should come to pass man's free will still remaining in order that when the peril of the truth proves your hearts and minds the unshaken faith of those who are tried may shine with a splendid light but you ought following the precept of the apostle to avoid those that advance daily in evil and not under any pretense to admit to your society those who communicate with such men as you have nobly and courageously done already so as to keep the catholic faith unsullied in your hearts fifty and let no man attempt to deceive you as was the practice of the ancient schismatics by pretending that it was not a question of religion but of morals or that the apostolic see was not dealing with the cause of communion and of the catholic church but was complaining of the private grievance of having seemed to be contemned by them for those that are in error never cease to spread such assertions and others like them to the end that they may deceive the simple for it is already manifest by their declarations and their published writings that it is the primacy of jurisdiction attached to this apostolic see in the person of blessed peter by our lord jesus christ which is openly attacked when the right of exercising it over the churches of the oriental rite is assailed our constitution aforesaid may have afforded the occasion or the pretext for turbulent or ignorant men to propagate their error but it is not the cause of it now the apostolic see in so grave an affair does not vituperate or reproach but defends the faith and the genuine communion in order that those who seem to resist it with scorn to-day it may if they return in a true spirit of penance to the integrity of the faith and catholic communion receive back in the plenitude of its charity if they shall have obeyed with their whole heart the paternal rules in use in such cases and to the end that the most merciful god may vouchsafe to grant us this grace which we have humbly asked of him so long in the lowliness of our heart we desire and we wish 
that you also would pray to this effect. 51. Finally, venerable brethren and dear sons, strengthen yourselves in the Lord, and in the might of his strength take the armor of God, that you may be able to stand in the evil day, opposing to all adversities the shield of faith, and counting not your life dearer than yourselves. Remember your forefathers, who shrank not from encountering exile, prison, and death itself, in order to keep for themselves and for us the true Catholic faith. For they well knew that those are not to be feared who kill the body, but he who can cast both body and soul into hell. Cast, then, all your solicitude at God's feet, for he careth for you, and will not suffer that you be tempted beyond your strength, but with the temptation will send help, so that you may be able to resist. Then shall you rejoice in him, although now you have to be a little sad on account of the various temptations that assail you. But thus shall be made the trial of your faith, which is much more precious than gold tried in the fire, and it shall be accounted to you for praise and honor and glory in the day of the revelation of Jesus Christ. In the name of the same God our Savior, we entreat you that your words and your acts may be one, that you may be perfect in the same heart and in the same mind, being careful above all things to keep the unity of the faith in the bond of peace. And may the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. In his name, and by his authority, we give you, from our inmost heart, to you, venerable brethren, and dear sons who persevere in the communion and obedience of this holy see, our apostolic benediction. Given at Rome at St. Peter's, the sixth day of January of the year 1873, and of our pontificate the 27th, Pope Pius the Ninth. End of Encyclical Letter Quartu Supra on the Church in Armenia by Pope Pius the Ninth. Encyclical Letter Etsi Multa on the Church in Italy, Germany, and Switzerland by Pope Pius the Ninth. Pope Pius the Ninth, Venerable Brethren, Health and Apostolic Benediction. Although many grievous and bitter sufferings from the beginning of our long pontificate have fallen to our lot through various causes which we have unfolded in our encyclical letters from time to time, yet in these last years the number of our sorrows has so increased that were we not upheld by the mercy of God, we should be almost overwhelmed by them. Of late, indeed, matters have reached such a pass that death itself seems better than life amid such storms, and with eyes lifted up to heaven we are fain to cry, it is better for us to die than to see the evils of the saints. Ever since our city of Rome, by the will of God, has been taken away by force of arms, and has passed under the sway of men who despise law, who are enemies of religion, who confound all things both human and divine, hardly a day has passed without inflicting some new wound on our heart, already suffering from repeated injuries and wrongs. There ring still in our ears the cries of religious men and women who have been driven from their homes in poverty and scattered hither and thither by hostile hands, as is done where revolution triumphs. Just as, according to Athanasius, the great Anthony used to say, the devil hates all Christians, but he cannot endure good monks and virgins dedicated to Christ. We have now seen what we thought could never come to pass, namely the suppression and abolition of the Roman university, which had been established, according to the words of an ancient author writing on the Anglo-Saxon school in Rome, that young church students from distant parts might be educated in Catholic faith and doctrine, lest in their own lands they should be wrongly taught, or in a way contrary to Catholic unity, 
and that they might go back strong and steadfast in the faith. Thus, while by foul means we are by degrees deprived of all ways of ruling and governing the universal church, it is clearly manifest how very far from the truth is that which has been asserted, namely, that the liberty of the Roman pontiff in the exercise of his spiritual ministry and in his relations with the Catholic world has been no wise diminished by the loss of our city. Nay, it becomes clearer every day how truly we have so often insisted that the sacrilegious usurpation of our territory has had for its especial object the subversion of the pontifical authority and the destruction, if possible, of the Catholic religion itself. It is not, however, the object of our letter to write to you on the woes of our city and of the whole of Italy. We would rather pass in silence over our own sorrows, if, by the mercy of God, we could assuage the bitter griefs which so many of our venerable brethren, their clergy and people, are undergoing in other lands. You are well aware, venerable brethren, that certain of the cantons of the Swiss Federation, not at the suggestion of non-Catholics, some of whom have condemned the act, but at the bidding of those busy members of secret societies who have now everywhere possessed themselves of power, have overturned the order and undermined the foundations of the Church of Christ, contrary to every rule of justice and in spite of their publicly pledged word. For according to solemn covenants passed by the laws and authority of the Federation, the religious liberty of the Catholics ought to be maintained inviolate. In our allocution of the 23rd of December, 1872, we lamented the wrongs inflicted on religion by the governments of those cantons, both in making decrees concerning the doctrines of the Catholic faith in showing favor to apostates, and in forbidding the exercise of episcopal power. Our just complaints made by our envoy before the federal council were altogether overlooked nor was greater regard shown to the repeated remonstrances of the bishops of switzerland and of the catholics of every class and fresh wrongs put the last stroke to the injuries already inflicted after the forcible banishment of our venerable brother gaspar bishop of hebron and vicar apostolic of geneva so glorious for the sufferer and so disgraceful to those who put it into execution the government of geneva on the twenty third of march and the twenty seventh of august of this year enacted two laws of the same tenor as the decree of october eighteen seventy two which was condemned by us in the allocution before mentioned. That government has claimed the right of reforming the constitution of the Catholic Church in the canton according to the radical pattern, and of subjecting the bishop to the civil power in the exercise of his proper jurisdiction and the administration and delegation of his authority to others, forbidding him to dwell in the canton limiting the number and boundaries of the parishes, laying down the form and conditions of the election of parish priests and their assistants, and the manner of their resignation or suspension, assigning to laymen the right of nomination, and the temporal administration and inspection of ecclesiastical affairs generally. Moreover, parish priests and their assistants without permission withdrawn at pleasure of the government were forbidden to exercise their functions 
to accept any dignities higher than that conferred upon them by the election of the people, and were also forced to take an oath in terms involving actual apostasy. It is clear that laws of this kind are not only null and void by reason of want of power in the lawmakers, as being laymen and non-Catholics, but also as regards their provisions that they are so contrary to the doctrines of the Catholic faith and to the ecclesiastical discipline enjoined by pontifical constitutions and the ecumenical council of Trent, that they ought to be altogether rejected by us. We, therefore, as required by our office, do, by our apostolic authority, solemnly reject and condemn them, declaring the required oath to be unlawful and sacrilegious, and that all those who in the canton of Geneva or elsewhere, having been elected according to the tenor of the same laws or others like them, by the votes of the people and confirmation of the civil power, shall venture to take upon them ecclesiastical functions, do ipso facto incur the greater excommunication especially reserved to this holy see and other canonical penalties, and that they are to be avoided by the faithful according to the divine command, as strangers and robbers who come not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. These are sad and sorrowful events, but deeds still more sorrowful have taken place in five of the seven cantons which form the diocese of Baal, namely Soleur, Bern, Baal Campagne, Argau, and Zurich. In those parts also laws have been enacted concerning parishes, the election and discharge of parish priests and their assistants, subversive of the government and divine constitution of the church, and subjecting the church to the secular and schismatical power. These laws, and especially the law of the 23rd of December, 1872, passed by the government of Soleur, we denounce and condemn and order to be considered as so denounced and condemned. After our venerable brother Eugenius, Bishop of Baal, in his just indignation and apostolic fortitude had rejected certain articles, proposed in the meeting or so-called diocesan conference to which there came delegates from the five aforesaid cantons, having a just reason for rejecting them as injurious to episcopal authority subversive of hierarchical government and openly favorable to heresy for this cause he was banished from his bishopric expelled from his house and violently driven into exile no kind of wrong and injury was left undone to lead into schism the clergy and people of the five aforesaid cantons. The clergy were forbidden to hold any intercourse with their banished pastor. Orders were given to the cathedral chapter of Baal to proceed to the election of a vicar capitular or administrator, as if the see were actually vacant the chapter however vigorously protested and spurned such unworthy action in the meantime by a decree of the civil magistrates of bern sixty-nine parish priests of the canton of jura were forbidden to exercise their functions and deprived of their office for the only reason that they had openly testified that they acknowledged only our venerable brother Eugenius as their lawful bishop and pastor, and would not treacherously sever themselves from Catholic unity. The consequence is that the whole of that district, which had constantly preserved the Catholic faith, and which had been united to the canton of Bern 
on the condition of keeping the exercise of religion free and inviolate has been deprived of mass and the rites of baptism marriage and burial in spite of the complaints and remonstrances of the faithful by the highest injustice reduced to the necessity either of receiving schismatical and heretical pastors thrust upon them by civil authority or of being deprived of all assistance and ministry of their priests we thank god for upholding and strengthening with the same grace that sustained the martyrs that chosen part of the catholic flock which manfully follows their bishop setting up a wall for the house of israel to stand in battle in the day of the lord and without fear treading in the footsteps of the head of martyrs jesus christ meeting ferocious wolves with the meekness of lambs and cheerfully and patiently fighting for the faith this noble constancy of the faithful in switzerland is imitated in a manner worthy of all praise by the clergy and faithful people of germany following the bright examples of their bishops they have been made a spectacle to the world to angels and to men who from every side look up to them clad with the breastplate of catholic truth and in the helmet of salvation valiantly fighting the battle of god their courage and invincible fortitude is the more admired and praised as day by day the persecution raised against them in germany and especially in prussia rages more and more bitterly beside many grievous wrongs inflicted last year upon the catholic church the prussian government has subjected to the civil power by cruel and unjust legislation altogether alien from its former conduct the entire instruction and education of the clergy in such manner that it belongs to the said power to inquire into and to decide in what manner church students are to be taught and trained to the sacerdotal and pastoral life and proceeding further it gives to the same power the right of examining and judging in respect to collating to all ecclesiastical offices and benefices and even of depriving sacred pastors of office and of benefice moreover in order to subvert more speedily and completely the ecclesiastical government of the church and the order of hierarchical obedience instituted by christ our lord himself many obstacles are interposed by the same laws to hinder the bishops in providing with timely measures by canonical censures and pains for the salvation of souls for the soundness of doctrine in catholic schools or for the obedience due to them from their clergy for according to the tenor of those laws the bishops are not permitted to exercise these functions save only at the pleasure of the civil authority and according to the rules laid down by the same finally that nothing should be wanting to the entire suppression of the catholic church a royal tribunal for ecclesiastical affairs has been instituted before which bishops and sacred pastors may be cited both by private men who are their subjects and by public magistrates there to receive judgment as criminals and to be coerced in the exercise of their spiritual office thus the holy church of christ to which the necessary and full liberty of religion had been guaranteed by the solemn and reiterated promises of princes and by public pacts and conventions is now in mourning in those regions stripped of its every right and exposed to hostile powers which threaten it with final destruction for this new legislation reaches to the point of rendering the life of the church 
impossible. No wonder, therefore, that in that empire the former religious peace should be broken up by laws of this kind, and by the other councils and acts of the Prussian government full of hostility to the church. Wherefore, if any one would throw the blame of these perturbations on the Catholics of the German Empire, it would be altogether without warrant. For if it be imputed to them as an offence that they do not acquiesce in those laws, in which with a safe conscience they cannot acquiesce, for a like reason, and in like manner, the apostles and martyrs of Jesus Christ are to be accused, who choose rather to undergo the most cruel punishment and death itself, than betray their proper office and violate the laws of their most holy religion, in obedience to impious commands of persecuting princes. Of a truth, venerable brothers, if no other laws than the laws of a civil empire existed, and laws indeed of a higher order which it is a duty to obey and sin to violate, if, moreover, these same civil laws could constitute a supreme rule of conscience, as some impiously and absurdly contend, the primitive martyrs, and they who afterwards followed them in shedding their blood for the faith of Christ and the liberty of the Church, would be rather worthy of blame than of honour and praise. Nay, it would not even have been possible, in the teeth of laws and against the will of princes, to preach and propagate the Christian religion and to found the Church. The faith, however, teaches and human reason demonstrates that there exists a twofold order of things, and at the same time two powers are to be distinguished on the earth, the one natural, which provides for the tranquillity of human society and secular affairs, the other, the origin of which is above nature, supreme over the city of God, that is, the Church of Christ, divinely instituted for the peace and the eternal salvation of souls. And the offices of twofold power are in wisdom ordained, that the things of God should be rendered to God, and that, in obedience to God, the things of Caesar should be rendered to Caesar, who is therefore great because he is less than heaven for he himself belongs to him to whom belong the heavens and every creature. From this divine command the church assuredly has never turned aside, for it has always and everywhere laboured to impress on the minds of the faithful the obedience which they ought inviolably to maintain towards sovereign princes and their laws in secular things and it has taught with the apostle that princes are not a terror to the good work but to the evil commanding the faithful to be subject not only for wrath's sake because the prince bears the sword as an avenger in wrath for him who does evil but also for conscience sake because in his office he is the minister of god this fear of princes the church itself restrains to evil deeds, and excludes it expressly from the observance of the divine law, being mindful of that which the blessed Peter taught to the faithful, Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or a railer, or a coveter of other men's goods, but if as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. Since these things are so, you will easily understand, venerable brothers, with what sorrow of mind we must have been affected when we read in a letter lately sent to us by the Emperor of Germany in person an accusation not less cruel than unlooked for against a part, as he himself says, of his Catholic subjects 
and especially against the catholic clergy and bishops of germany of which accusation this is the cause that they fearless of bonds and tribulations and not counting their life more precious than themselves have refused to obey the aforesaid laws with the same constancy with which before they were passed they had protested by denouncing their injustice which was unfolded in grave luminous and solid expostulations amidst the applause of the whole catholic world and of not a few even of non-catholics before the sovereign his ministers and the supreme legislature of the kingdom for that cause they are now accused as of the crime of treason as of consenting and conspiring with those who are endeavouring to overthrow all orders in human society without regard to innumerable and notable proofs which evidently bear witness to their unshaken faith and allegiance to their sovereign and their fervent patriotism towards their country yea and we ourselves are asked to exhort those catholics and sacred pastors to observe the aforesaid laws which is to ask that we also ourselves should lend our help in oppressing and scattering the flock of christ but trusting in god we are confident that the most serene emperor when he has better ascertained and weighed these things will reject a suspicion so empty and incredible against his faithful servants and will no longer endure that their honour should be assailed by so foul a calumny and that an unmerited persecution should be continued against them we should indeed have gladly passed over in this place the letter of the emperor if it had not been made public by the official journal in berlin altogether without our knowledge and in a manner certainly unusual together with another letter written by our hand in which we appealed for the catholic church in prussia to the justice of the most serene emperor the things which we have thus far recounted are before the eyes of all wherefore while religious and virgins dedicated to god are deprived of the common liberty of citizens and are exiled with cruel harshness while public schools in which catholic youth are educated are day by day further withdrawn from the wholesome teaching and vigilance of the church while societies founded for the nurturing of piety and even the seminaries of the clergy are dissolved while the liberty of preaching the gospel is hindered while it is prohibited in certain parts of the kingdom to teach the elements of religious education in the mother tongue while the priests are forcibly taken away from the parishes over which they were set by the bishops and the bishops themselves are deprived of their revenues coerced by fines and menaced by threats of imprisonments while catholics are disturbed by vexations of every kind is it possible that we should receive into our mind that which is laid before us namely that neither the religion of jesus christ nor the truth is called in question nor is this the end of the wrongs which are inflicted upon the catholic church for to this must be also added the patronage which has been openly taken up by the prussian and the other governments of the germanic empire in behalf of those new heretics who call themselves old catholics by the abuse of the name which would be truly ridiculous if it were not that so many monstrous errors of that sect against the chief principles of the catholic faith so many sacrileges in divine worship and in the administration of sacraments so many gravest scandals 
so great a havoc of souls redeemed in the blood of christ did not rather draw abundant tears from our eyes the attempts indeed and the aims of these unhappy sons of perdition appear plainly both from other writings of theirs and most of all from that impious and most impudent of documents which has lately been published by him whom they have set up for themselves as their so-called bishop for they deny and pervert the true authority of jurisdiction which is in the roman pontiff and the bishops the successors of the blessed peter and the apostles and transfer it to the populace or as they say to the community they stubbornly reject and assail the infallible teaching authority of the roman pontiff and of the whole church and contrary to the holy spirit who has been promised by christ to abide in his church for ever they audaciously affirm that the roman pontiff and the whole of the bishops priests and people who are united with him in one faith and communion have fallen into heresy by sanctioning and professing the definitions of the ecumenical vatican council therefore they deny even the indefectibility of the church blasphemously saying that it has perished throughout the world and that its visible head and its bishops have fallen away and that for this reason it has been necessary for them to restore the lawful episcopate in their pseudo bishop a man who entering not by the gate but coming up another way has drawn upon his head the condemnation of christ nevertheless those unhappy men who would undermine the foundations of the catholic religion and destroy its character and endowments who have invented such shameful and manifold errors or rather have collected them together from the old store of heretics are not ashamed to call themselves catholics and old catholics while by their doctrine their novelty and their fewness they give up all mark of antiquity and of catholicity truly with a stronger right against them than in former days by the mouth of saint augustine against the donatists the church which is spread abroad among all nations which christ the son of the living god has built upon the rock against which the gates of hell shall not prevail and with which he to whom all power has been given in heaven and upon earth has promised that he will remain all days to the end of the world cries out to the eternal spouse why do those who have gone from me murmur against me why do those who are lost declare that it is i who have perished announce to me the fewness of my days how long shall i be in this world tell it to me for the sake of those who say that she was and now she is not for the sake of those who say that the scriptures have been fulfilled the nations have believed but the church has apostatized and perished from all the nations and it was answered nor was the voice an empty one in what words was it announced behold i am with you until the consummation of the world that is moved by your words and your false opinions the church asks of god to make known to her the fewness of her days and she finds that the lord has said behold i am with you until the consummation of the world here you will reason thus of us it is said that we are and shall be until the end of the world let christ be asked and this gospel he says shall be preached in the whole world in testimony to all nations and then shall the end come therefore until the end of the world is the church among all nations 
may heretics perish may they perish as they are and be found to become what they are not but these men going on more boldly in the way of iniquity and perdition as by a just judgment of god it happens to heretical sects have wished also to form to themselves a hierarchy as we have said and have chosen and set up for themselves as their pseudo-bishop a certain notorious apostate from the catholic faith joseph hubert reinkins and that nothing might be wanting to their impudence for his consecration they have had recourse to those jansenists of utrecht whom they themselves before their falling away from the church regarded with other catholics as heretics and schismatics nevertheless this joseph hubert dares to call himself a bishop and incredible as it may seem the most serene emperor of germany has by a public decree named and acknowledged him as a catholic bishop and exhibited him to all his subjects as one who is to be regarded as a lawful bishop and as such to be obeyed but the very rudiments of catholic teaching declare that no one can be held to be a lawful bishop who is not joined in communion of faith and charity to the rock on which the one church of christ is built who does not adhere to the supreme pastor to whom all the sheep of christ are committed to be fed who is not united to the confirmer of the brotherhood which is in the world and indeed to peter did the lord speak to one that he might by one establish unity to peter the divine authority has given a great and wonderful share of his power and if that authority has wished anything to be in common between him and other princes it is only through him that it has been given hence it is that from this apostolic see where the blessed peter lives and presides and dispenses the truth to all who seek it the rights of holy fellowship extend to all and it is certain that this same see is to the churches throughout the world as the head to the members and that if any one cuts himself off from it he becomes an outcast from the christian religion since he is not in the same bond of union hence the holy martyr cyprian speaking of the schismatical pseudo-bishop novation denied to him the very name of christian as being separated and cut off from the church of christ whoever he is and whatever he is he is not a christian who is not in the church of christ though he boast himself and talk of his wisdom and eloquence in proud language he who has not retained either brotherly love or ecclesiastical unity has lost even what he before possessed since the one church has been divided by christ into many members throughout the whole world and also one episcopate has been overspread therein by the manifold unity of many bishops that man in spite of the tradition of god and in spite of the closely compacted unity of the church is endeavouring to make the church human he therefore who maintains neither the unity of the spirit nor the brotherhood of peace and severs himself from the bonds of the church and from the fellowship of the priesthood can possess neither the power of a bishop nor the honour unity and peace of the episcopate we therefore who have been placed undeserving as we are in the supreme see of peter for the guardianship of the catholic faith and for the maintenance of the unity of the universal church according to the custom and example of our predecessors and their holy decrees 
by the power given to us from on high, not only declare the election of the said Joseph Hubert Rankins to be contrary to the holy canons, unlawful, and altogether null and void, and denounce and condemn his consecration as sacrilegious, but by the authority of Almighty God, we declare the said Joseph Hubert, together with those who have taken part in his election and sacrilegious consecration, and whoever adhere to, and follow the same, giving aid, favor, or consent, excommunicated, under anathema, separated from the communion of the church, and to be reckoned among those whose fellowship has been forbidden to the faithful by the apostle, so that they are not so much as to say to them, God speed you. From these facts, to which we have referred in brief rather than at large, you are well assured, venerable brethren, how grave and full of danger is the condition of Catholics in those countries of Europe which we have mentioned. Neither are matters more favorable, or the times more peaceful, in South America, where some countries are so hostile to Catholics that their governments seem rather to deny in deeds than to profess the Catholic faith. There, for some years, bitter war has been stirred up against the Church and its institutions, and against the rights of this apostolic see. Matter would not be wanting were we to enlarge upon this subject, but since on account of its grave nature it cannot be lightly touched upon, we shall take another occasion to treat at length of it. Some of you may, perhaps, be surprised, venerable brethren, that the war which is carried on at this time against the Catholic Church extends so far and wide. But whoever is acquainted with the character, the aims, and purposes of the secret societies, be they Freemasons or by whatever name they are known, and compares them with the character and extent of the strife which throughout nearly the whole world is waged against the Church, cannot hesitate to assign the cause of our present calamities to the craft and conspiracy of the same secret societies. From them is made up the synagogue of Satan, which is marshalling its forces and preparing to engage hand to hand against the Church of Christ. From their first beginnings they have been denounced to the kings and to the nations by our predecessors who have watched over Israel. Again and again have they condemned them, nor have we ourselves failed in this our duty. Would that the supreme pastors of the church had been more firmly believed by those who could have warded off so terrible a plague. But the secret societies, winding along by crooked ways, never ceasing their task, beguiling many with their cunning craft, are now bursting forth from their hiding places, and boasting themselves to be all-powerful. These sinful associations, having greatly increased the number of their adherents, fancy that they have now attained their ends and all but reached the goal set before them. Succeeding in this object, after which they have so long hankered, the possession of the chief power in many places, they are now boldly using the strength and power they have acquired that the church of God may be reduced to the most grinding slavery, that it may be uptorn from its foundations and defaced in the divine marks with which it shines conspicuous. In a word, that shaken, shattered, and overthrown by many blows, it may, if possible, be utterly blotted out from the world. Since these things are so, do you, venerable brothers, do your best to strengthen the faithful committed to your care against the snares and canker 
of these secret societies and to save from destruction those who have unfortunately joined them do you especially disprove and show up the errors of those who from bad faith or through deceit do not shrink from asserting that these secret assemblies have for their only object social progress and advantage and the practice of mutual benevolence explain to them and fix deeply in their minds the pontifical decrees on this matter and show that they refer not only to the masonic societies in europe but to those that exist in america and throughout the countries of the world to conclude venerable brethren since we have fallen on times not only of suffering but of meriting much let us take especial care as good soldiers of christ not to despair as in the midst of the storm we have a sure hope of future calm and a glorious peace for the church and trusting in the assistance of god let us cheer ourselves our toiling clergy and our people with the noble words of chrysostom many waves and storms threaten us but we are not afraid of being overwhelmed for we stand upon the rock though the sea rage it cannot melt the rock though the waves arise yet they cannot sink the bark of jesus there is nothing mightier than the church the church is stronger than heaven itself heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away what words are these thou art peter and upon this rock i will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it if you do not believe in words believe in deeds how many tyrants have tried to oppress the church how many gridirons how many furnaces how many wild beasts how many swords have been prepared against her how much have they accomplished nothing where are her foes they are forgotten where is the church she shines more brightly than the sun her foes have perished her children are immortal if when there were few christians they were not overcome how when the whole world is full of holy religion will you be able to overcome them heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away disturbed therefore by no danger and no fear let us continue steadfast in prayer and with one mind let us endeavour to appease the anger of heaven provoked by the sins of men so that at last in his mercy the almighty may arise and command the winds that they be still meanwhile in testimony of our especial affection we lovingly impart to you all venerable brothers to the clergy and all the people committed to your care our apostolic blessing given at rome from st peter's on the twenty-first day of november in the year of our lord eighteen seventy three in the twenty-eighth year of our pontificate pope pius the ninth end of encyclical letter etsi multa on the church in italy germany and switzerland by pope pius the ninth encyclical letter victum a nobis on the church in austria by pope pius the ninth encyclical of our most holy father pius the ninth to the cardinals archbishops and bishops of the austrian empire dear sons and venerable brethren health and apostolic benediction scarcely had we in our letter of the twenty fourth of november in last year announced to the catholic world the grievous persecution which had been commenced against the church in prussia and in switzerland when a fresh trouble was prepared for us 
by the news of other wrongs threatening the church, which, like her divine spouse, may every day breathe forth that complaint, ye have added yet more to the pain of my wounds. And these wrongs trouble us all the more, inasmuch as they are inflicted by the government of the Austrian nation, which, during the great epochs of Christian states, contended valorously for the Catholic faith in the closest alliance with this holy see. It is true that, a few years hence, there were issued, in that monarchy, decrees in contradiction with the most sacred rites of the Church, and with treaties solemnly concluded, decrees which we, in conformity with our duty, had to condemn and declare to be null and void, as we did in our allocution of June the 22nd, 1868, addressed to our venerable brothers, the Cardinals of the Holy Roman Church. But today there are presented for the approbation of the Reichsrat new laws tending openly to bring the Catholic Church into most pernicious slavery to the arbitrary will of the secular power, contrary to the divine ordinance of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the Creator and Redeemer of the human race assuredly founded his church as a visible kingdom on earth, and he not only endowed it with the supernatural gift of an infallible teaching for the propagation of holy doctrine, and with the priesthood for the divine service and sanctification of souls by the sacrifice and the sacraments, but he also gave to it a proper and plenary power to legislate, to judge, and to exercise a salutary constraint in all things which stand in relation to the real aim and end of the kingdom of God upon earth. Now, forasmuch as this supernatural power of ecclesiastical government, being based on the ordinance of Jesus Christ, is equally distinct from and independent of the secular dominion, this kingdom of God on earth is a kingdom of a perfect society, self-regulating and self-governing, according to its own laws and its own jurisprudence, by its own rulers, who watch to render an account of souls, not to the secular sovereign, but to the Prince of Pastors, Jesus Christ. He instituted the pastors and teachers, and they, in their spiritual charge, are not subject to any secular authority. Therefore the sacred rulers are in duty bound to rule, and therefore it is the laity's duty, according to the precept of the Apostle, to obey them and to be subject to them. And therefore the Catholic people have the sacred right not to be impeded by the civil government in the exercise of that their divinely ordered and sacred duty of obeying the Church's doctrine, discipline and laws. Dear sons and venerable brothers, you recognize with us that the text of the laws now under consideration in the Reichsrat of Austria involves and exhibits a grave violation of that divine constitution of the Church and an intolerable subversion of the rights of the Apostolic See, of the Holy Canons, and of all Catholic people. In fact, by virtue of these laws, the Church of Christ, in almost all her relations with, and acts in reference to, the faithful, is judged and considered as in complete subordination and subjection to the superior authority of the secular power. And this is openly stated, and, so to speak, asserted as a principle in the preamble in which the object and intention of the new laws is set forth. It is also expressly declared that the secular government, in virtue of its unlimited power, possesses the right of making laws as well upon ecclesiastical as upon secular questions, and of watching and ruling over the church as over all the mere human societies that exist within the empire. Accordingly, the secular government arrogates to itself the right of judging and teaching above the constitution and rights of the Catholic Church and above her high superior direction, and it exercises the same partly by its laws and by its acts, and partly by different ecclesiastical persons. From thence it follows that the will and power of the civil government take the place of the religious authority established by divine ordinance for the direction of the church and the edification of the body of Christ. Against such usurpation of the sanctuary, the great St. Ambrose has well said, They tell us that Caesar can do all things, and that everything appertains to him. 
but go not so far as to imagine that thou possessest imperial rights over that which is consecrated to god exalt not thyself but submit thyself to god it is written that which is god's belongeth unto god and that which is caesar's to caesar to the emperor belong the palaces to the priest the churches moreover as to these new laws and the preamble of grounds for their enactment they are in truth of the same nature and the same character as the prussian laws and they are pregnant with the same evils to the church catholic in the austrian empire although at first sight they may appear moderate as compared with the prussian laws we do not mean to examine each article of these laws in detail but we can by no means pass over in silence the cruel offence already offered to us and to this apostolic see as also to yourselves dearly beloved sons and venerable brothers and to the whole catholic people of that empire by the presentation of such laws the concordat concluded in the year eighteen fifty five between us and the illustrious emperor confirmed by that same catholic monarch with a solemn promise and promulgated throughout the whole empire as a law of the empire is now brought before the chamber of deputies with a declaration that it is completely invalidated and annulled without any previous negotiation with the apostolic see nay more with public slight of our most just representations would they ever have dared publicly to do such a thing in those days when the faith was held in esteem but now at this sad epoch men undertake and men carry into execution once more well beloved sons and venerable brothers do we protest before you against this public violation of the concordat and we do the more severely blame this outrage committed against the church inasmuch as it is the definition of the teachings of the faith as published and confirmed by the ecumenical council of the vatican that is insidiously put forward as the cause and the pretext of the breaking of the concordat and of the other laws connected therewith those catholic dogmas are impiously styled novelties and changes in the articles of the faith and in the constitution of the church there may be a few persons in the austrian empire who reject the catholic faith for these unworthy inventions but the illustrious monarch of that empire with the whole of the imperial family hold and profess it the immense majority of the people hold and profess it and it is on such a people that laws are about to be imposed which are based on inventions such as these thus without our knowledge or consent the convention which we had concluded with the most noble emperor in the interest of the salvation of souls and for the advantage of the state has been torn up a new form of right has been put forward as a pretext and a new power has been conferred on the civil government in order to authorize it to put its hand on things ecclesiastical and to order and arrange the affairs of the church at its own discretion with these projected laws the way is now open to bind with heavy chains and to paralyze the inviolable liberty of the church in the tenure and administration of her property for the salvation of souls for the government of the faithful for the religious direction of the laity and of the clergy for the promotion of christian life towards evangelical perfection perversion of discipline is being introduced favor is shown to apostasy sects are encouraged to unite and conspire under the protection and safeguard of the laws against the true doctrines of christianity in reality a great task would be incumbent upon us were we to undertake to mention the nature and number of the evils which are to be apprehended so soon as these laws shall come into force but dear sons and venerable brothers it is impossible that they can deceive you or elude your sagacity for almost all functions and benefices ecclesiastical and even the discharge of pastoral duties are hereby placed in such subjection to the secular government that the prelates of the church supposing that they submit themselves to these new regulations which is far from being possible would no longer be able to administer according to the salutary regulations of the church those dioceses for which they must render a strict account to god but they would be compelled to discharge those duties and even to retain them 
at the dictation and arbitrary will of those who are at the head of the state. Furthermore, what can be expected of those projects of law which are entitled Touching Religious Communities? Their fatal bearing in their hostile intent are so evident that no one can misapprehend the truth that they are contrived and framed for the destruction and ruin of the religious orders. Finally, the danger threatening the total loss of their property is so great as to be scarcely distinguishable from a public sale and squandering. Notably, the government will place all that landed property at its own disposal, according to the regulations of the new Act, and will assume the right and power of partitioning the said property, letting it on lease, and paring it down by taxation until a miserable income and benefit remaining from it to the religious will be with reason regarded not as an honour to the church, but as a cloak to cover robbery and wrong. Dear sons and venerable brethren, as the laws which the Chamber of Deputies of the Austrian Reichsrat is now discussing are framed with the intent and based on the principles which we have now stated, you doubtless see clearly the dangers that now threaten the flock entrusted to your watchfulness. Evidently, the unity and peace of the church are placed in hazard, and men are striving to wrest from the church that liberty which St. Thomas of Canterbury well called the soul of the church, without which she has no strength against those who endeavour to usurp the possession of the sanctuary of God. This expression has been explained by another invincible defender of the same liberty, St. Anselm, in the following terms. God loves nothing in this world so much as the liberty of the church. Let those who would rather tyrannise over the church than serve her consider themselves as without doubt the enemies of God. God wills his spouse to be free and not in servitude. This is why we stir up and enkindle your pastoral vigilance and the zeal with which you are animated for the house of the Lord in order that you may struggle to escape the danger that is approaching you. Take great courage to sustain the conflict in a manner worthy of your virtue. We, on our part, are assured that you will not do less, either in courage or in energy, than those honoured brethren who elsewhere, amidst the most bitter persecution, have become, in the midst of obloquy and persecution, a spectacle, while they endure with joy for the church's liberty not only the spoiling of their goods but even in bonds sustain the conflict of suffering finally all our hopes are placed in god not in our own strength the cause at stake is the cause of god who by his word that cannot fail has given us that warning and instruction in the world ye shall have persecutions but be of good cheer I have overcome the world. We then, who in virtue of our apostolic charge, in which the grace of God strengthens our weakness, have been placed in the post of leader during this war now waged against the church, a bitter war, and one full of sad incidents, we say and quote to ourselves what St. Thomas of Canterbury long ago expressed in the following terms, which suit admirably our own days and our own dangers. The conflict which the enemies of God wage against us is a conflict between them and God. Let us, therefore, desire of them nothing else than that which the eternal God, when he became flesh for his church, left to her in his everlasting covenant. Lift up yourselves, then, with us in faith and in the love of Christ for the protection of the church, and with the authority and wisdom with which you are endowed, come to the assistance of mankind, for no earthly good can be sufficient for them so long as the Church of God enjoys not her liberty. We have the more confidence in you inasmuch as the cause at stake is the cause of God. As far as concerns ourselves, be assured that we very much prefer to suffer temporal death than to put on the badges of a sorrowful servitude. The issue of this conflict has this significance for posterity that the church is ever afflicted? No, God preserve her from that, but that she ever rejoices in her own liberty. But, as you have to bend all your efforts to anticipate, by your authority, your wisdom, and your zeal, the dangers that threaten you, 
you will recognize that nothing could be more opportune and more useful than to deliberate in common council what are the best means of attaining most certainly and most effectually the desired object so long as men attack the church's rights it is our duty to protect the faithful but the wall of defence will be so much the more secure and the defence itself so much the more powerful as your efforts shall be more unanimous and more adapted to the end and as the measures demanded by the situation shall be framed and carried out with greater zeal that is why we exhort you to meet as soon as possible and after deliberation in common to fix on a line of conduct decided and approved by all such as may enable you conformably with your official duty to combat with common accord the evils that threaten and energetically defend the liberty of the church our exhortation is necessary in order that we may not appear to have neglected our duty in a question of such importance for we are convinced that even without such exhortation you would have discharged your duty also we have not yet resigned the hope that god will turn away the existing evils that which encourages this hope is the devotion and faith of our well-beloved son in christ the emperor and king francis joseph whom we have earnestly adjured in our new letter of this day never to tolerate in his vast empire that the church should be subjected to an ignominious enslavement and his catholic subjects to the greatest of afflictions but as the number of the church's assailants is great and every assault is eminently dangerous you can at least persevere calmly may god vouchsafe to guide your decisions and support you by his powerful protection to the end that you may be able happily to resolve on and to carry into operation all that conduces to the glory of his name and the salvation of souls as the sign of that divine protection and of our especial good will we affectionately accord to all and to each of you dear sons and venerable brothers as also to the clergy and faithful entrusted to your vigilance our apostolic benediction given at rome at st peter's this seventh day of march in the year eighteen seventy four in the twenty eighth year of our pontificate pope pius the ninth end of encyclical letter vix dum a nobis on the church in austria by pope pius the ninth encyclical letter omnem solicitudinem on the greek ruthenian rite by pope pius the ninth encyclical of the holy father on the affairs of poland and russia to our venerable brothers josef sembratovich archbishop of leopold halies in kamenz of the ruthenian rite and to the other bishops of the same rite being in grace and communion with the apostolic see pious pope the ninth venerable brothers health and apostolical benediction from the very first years of our long pontificate we have exerted our solicitude and all our efforts to promote the spiritual welfare of the oriental churches and we have solemnly declared that the particular catholic liturgies ought to be religiously preserved and retained in their full integrity and also that they have been held in high esteem by our predecessors we have in fact as proof of this the remarkable teachings given by clement the eighth in his constitution magnus dominus of the year fifteen ninety five and by paul v in his brief of december tenth sixteen fifteen and above all to mention no others by benedict the fourteenth in his encyclical letters the mandatam of the year seventeen forty three and the late sunt of the year seventeen fifty five now as there has ever existed a most intimate connection and union between liturgical discipline and dogmatic doctrine therefore it is that the holy see as infallible teacher of the faith and wise guardian of the truth whenever it perceived any dangerous or unbeseeming right to have crept into the oriental church has at once condemned such right and prohibited its use on the other hand the care with which as we have said you have preserved the ancient liturgies has been no hindrance to certain rites being borrowed from other churches and adopted amongst those of the oriental church of such rites gregory the sixteenth of happy memory wrote to the catholic armenians your ancestors loved them 
either because they thought them fitting and beautiful or they adopted them at various periods as a mark of distinction between themselves and the heretics and schismatics therefore as the same sovereign pontiff teaches it is necessary strictly to observe the rule which enjoins that except for very grave reasons and such as have been approved by the holy see no innovation should ever be made in the rites of the sacred liturgy without consulting the holy see not even under pretext of re-establishing ceremonies that may appear more in conformity with the liturgies approved by the same see now these principles of law have been wisely prescribed for all the churches of the oriental rite and as has been declared several times on occasion especially in the before-mentioned brief of paul v they form the rule of the liturgical discipline of the ruthenians whom the roman pontiffs have always dealt with in a particular spirit of benevolence and on whom they have heaped especial favors and no sooner has it become apparent that any danger threatened them and that their faith was exposed to grave peril than the apostolic see failed not to raise its voice without a moment's delay in order to avert so great a calamity still sounding in our ears are the words of our predecessor gregory the sixteenth of happy memory uttered by him at a time when the ruthenian nation was as every one knows in a most calamitous state in consequence of which we have this day to deplore the fact of about three hundred thousand of these same ruthenians being driven from the pale of the catholic church the aid of this apostolic see was not withheld from the ruthenian nation when long and grave controversies were agitated not without detriment to christian charity in the ecclesiastical province of leopold on account of the diversity of discipline and of rank and on account of the mutual relations existing between the ecclesiastics of the latin rite and those of the greek rite controversies which by means of a convention or agreement proposed by the bishops of each rite and sanctioned by a decree of the sacred congregation of propaganda for oriental affairs dated sixth october eighteen sixty three were happily smoothed over and suppressed but the sad state of things in which the same province and particularly the neighboring countries to the diocese of Kelm, are at present now claims once more all our vigilance and all our solicitude in effect it has been reported to us that a miserable controversy has been raised with rash boldness about liturgical matters amongst the catholics of the greco ruthenian rite and that certain personages notwithstanding the clerical orders with which they were invested have attached themselves to her doctrines and presumed to dictate and in accordance with their own caprice to reform the sacred ceremonies of which some were rightfully received by immemorial usage and the others solemnly ratified by the sanction of the council of zamosk which received the approbation of the apostolic see but what afflicts us most and causes the deepest grief to our heart is that which we have learned of the sad state of things now oppressing the diocese of Calm in effect the bishop of that diocese whom we instituted but a few years since and who is still connected with that diocese by the spiritual tie is gone and a certain pseudo administrator whom we long since adjudged unworthy of the episcopal dignity has not feared to usurp ecclesiastical jurisdiction and to overturn everything within that church and above all to confuse and disturb of his own authority the liturgy canonically approved filled with sadness we have still before our eyes the circular letter of the twentieth october eighteen seventy three by which that unhappy pseudo administrator dares to make innovations in the performance of divine service and in the sacred liturgy doubtless for the purpose of introducing the liturgy of the schismatics into the catholic diocese of Kelm, the better to impose upon the simple and ignorant and the more easily to lead them into schism the said pseudo administrator is not ashamed to support his cause by quoting certain constitutions of the apostolic see and fraudulently to abuse their ordinances which he interprets erroneously in his own sense now no one can fail to see that all the rules laid down as to liturgical matters in the aforesaid circular letter are holy null and void and we ourselves do by virtue of our apostolic authority declare them so to be in effect the aforesaid pseudo administrator is wholly and entirely destitute of any ecclesiastical authority whatsoever inasmuch as neither the lawful bishop before his departure from the diocese nor subsequently the apostolic see ever conferred any such authority upon him 
it is therefore certain and evident to all men that he entered not into the sheepfold by the door but by some other way and that he ought consequently to be regarded as an intruder it is true that the sacred canons of the church ordain that the ancient oriental rites lawfully introduced should be retained because our predecessors the roman pontiffs have thought it proper after mature examination to approve or to permit those rites in so far as they are not contrary to the catholic faith imperil not the salvation of souls nor derogate from ecclesiastical dignity but at the same time these very canons solemnly declare that it is not permitted to any person of his own accord and without previously consulting the holy see to put in practice even the slightest changes in liturgical matters and this is abundantly proved by the apostolic constitutions herein before cited and it is an argument devoid of any force to pretend as has in this matter been done for the purpose of imposing that these various liturgical innovations have been attempted in order to purify the oriental rite and to bring it back to its pristine integrity for in effect the liturgy of the ruthenians cannot be any other than that which was either instituted by the holy fathers of the church or sanctioned by the canons of councils or introduced by lawful usage always with the approbation express or tacit of the apostolic see and if in the course of time some variations may have occurred in the said liturgy they assuredly were not introduced without the roman pontiffs being consulted and they were above all intended to deliver these rites from every defilement of heresy or of schism and thus to give expression to the catholic dogmas with more exactness and clearness and so secure the integrity of the faith and promote the good of souls therefore it is that under the treacherous pretext of purifying the rites and bringing them back to their integrity no other end was really sought than to lay snares for the faith of the Athenians of count whom men of perdition are striving to force from the pale of the catholic church and to deliver over to heresy and schism nevertheless amidst all the severe afflictions from every quarter which press upon us one thing sustains us and rejoices us it is the remarkable and most heroic spectacle lately given before god before angels and before men by the ruthenians of the diocese of Calm when they refused obedience to the iniquitous orders of the pseudo-administrator and preferred to endure all sorts of evils and even to encounter loss of life itself rather than to sacrifice the faith of their fathers and to abandon the rights which they had received from their ancestors and which they had resolutely declared they would preserve intact and entire as for ourselves we do not cease by all kinds of supplication to implore god that he who is rich in mercy would in his great goodness cause the light of his grace to penetrate the hearts of all who contrary to all justice now afflict the diocese of count and that he would at the same time grant his powerful protection to the afflicted but faithful catholics who are now bereft of all spiritual aid and direction and that he would hasten the coming of that happy time when much desired peace shall be restored and as for you venerable brethren who with so much earnestness and such signal zeal have accepted the pastoral charge confided to you of the ruthenians we do thereupon earnestly exhort you in the lord that you would religiously preserve the liturgical discipline approved by the apostolic see or introduced after the same see had been informed of it and had made no objection thereto we enjoin you wholly to interdict all innovation and not to omit to recommend to parish and other priests even under pain of the severest penalties should you deem it necessary the exact observance of the sacred canons concerning this matter and especially those of the synod of zamosk there is in effect an important question at stake the salvation of souls for the unlawful innovations are causing the greatest peril to the catholic ruthenians in their faith and in their religious unity you ought therefore to spare no care or pains and never to desist from trying by all means to quell completely the moment they make their appearance all the troubles which depraved men have stirred up in those parts in regard to liturgical matters and we have confidence that by the help of god's grace you will in no wise fail to accomplish those duties with energy and at the same time with gentleness 
and in order that it may so come happily to pass we do very affectionately grant you in the lord our apostolic benediction for yourselves venerable brethren and for the flock which each of you has in his charge given at rome at st peter's this thirteenth of may eighteen seventy four in the twenty eighth year of our pontificate pious pope the ninth end of encyclical letter omnem solicitudinem on the greek ruthenian rank by pope pius the ninth encyclical letter gravibus ecclesiae the jubilee of eighteen seventy five by pope pius the ninth the jubilee of eighteen seventy five encyclical of our most holy lord pius the ninth by divine providence pope to all patriarchs primates archbishops and to all ordinaries of places having favour and communion with the apostolic see and to all the faithful of jesus christ pope pius the ninth venerable brothers and dear sons health and apostolic benediction gathering resolution from the great troubles of the church and from the great evils of the age and from the need there is of imploring the help of god we have never throughout the course of our pontificate omitted to stir up christian people to appease the divine majesty and to obtain the mercy of heaven by holiness of life by works of penance and by the devout offering up of supplications to this end we have on many different occasions and with apostolic bounty opened to the faithful the spiritual treasury of indulgences in order that with true penance and souls purified by means of the sacrament of reconciliation and cleansing of the stains of sin they might with greater confidence approach the throne of grace and make themselves worthy of having their prayers accepted by god amongst other circumstances we desired above all things that on the occasion of the holy ecumenical council of the vatican that important work should be so undertaken as to conduce to the benefit of the universal church and should be assisted before god by the prayers of the whole church and although the celebration of the council has been suspended through the troubles of the time we did nevertheless for the good of the faithful ordain and decree that the indulgence then published in the form of a jubilee should remain in force validity and continuance so long as the council should last but the course of these unhappy times goes on and we are now at the year eighteen seventy five the year which marks the end of the sacred period which by the pious custom of our forefathers and by the decrees of the roman pontiffs has been devoted to the celebration of the solemnity of a universal jubilee with what respect and religious devotion the jubilee was observed in the peaceful days of the church when its regular celebration was allowed the monuments of history ancient and modern can attest it was in fact always regarded by all christian people as a year of salvation and of expiation as a year of grace and redemption of pardon and indulgence during which men resorted from all parts of the world to our city to the sea of peter where the most abundant benefits of reconciliation and of grace were offered to all the faithful for the salvation of their souls and they were invited to the practice of the duties of piety even in the present century has been witnessed this pious and holy solemnity a jubilee was proclaimed by our predecessor leo the twelfth of happy memory in the year eighteen twenty five 
and the benefit was accepted with such ardent zeal by all Christian people that the same pontiff was enabled to rejoice at the incessant concourse of pilgrims during the entire year to this city and at the admirable splendor of religion of piety of faith of charity and of all the virtues which shone forth therein would to god that in this day our own condition and the state of civil and religious affairs would allow us happily to celebrate at least this once with ancient rite and according to the custom of our ancestors this solemnity of the great jubilee which became due in the year eighteen fifty of our century and which we were then obliged on account of the affliction of the time to omit but it has pleased god to permit that those great difficulties by which we were prevented from publishing the jubilee so far from having vanished have increased from day to day nevertheless considering all the evils with which the church is afflicted all the efforts made by her enemies to snatch from souls their faith to corrupt sound doctrine and to spread the poison of impiety considering the many scandals caused in all places to believers in jesus christ considering the general corruption of morals and the sad overthrow of all rights both human and divine an overthrow both widely spread and abounding in ruins which goes to destroy in the mind of man even the sense of right and reflecting as we do that under this great accumulation of evils it becomes more than ever our apostolic duty to take care that faith religion and piety are made strong and prosperous and that the spirit of prayer is extended and increased to the end that such as fall away may be stirred up to penitence of heart and reformation of manners and that the sins which have drawn down god's anger may be redeemed by works of holiness which is chiefly the fruit of the celebration of the great jubilee we therefore have judged that we ought not to suffer christian people under present circumstances at least in so far as the condition of the time would allow to be deprived of so salutary a benefit by means of which their souls might be strengthened and they might then go forward with ever increasing zeal in the path of justice might be cleansed from their faults and might with more and more profit to themselves obtain the favor and pardon of god let then the whole church militant of jesus christ receive the words in which with a view to her own exaltation and the sanctification of christian people and to the glory of god we decree proclaim and publish the great and general jubilee for the whole of the year eighteen seventy five now ensuing and by reason of this jubilee we of our own free will and that of the holy see do suspend and declare to be suspended the indulgence above mentioned which was granted in form of jubilee on the occasion of the vatican council and we open wide the heavenly treasure formed of the merits of the sufferings and of the virtues of jesus christ our lord and of his virgin mother and of all the saints which the author of men's salvation has committed to our stewardship wherefore trusting in the mercy of god and in the authority of his apostles blessed peter and paul and in virtue of the supreme power of binding and loosing which notwithstanding our unworthiness god has committed to us 
we do concede and grant mercifully in the lord faculty of gaining once in the year the aforesaid plenary indulgence of the year of jubilee with the remission and pardon of all their sins to all the faithful of jesus christ and to each one of them as well as to those who dwell in our mother city or who come there as also to those who reside out of this city to whatsoever part of the world they may belong and who live in the favour and obedience of the apostolic see provided that being truly penitent having confessed their sins and being strengthened by the holy communion those resident in this city do visit at least once each day during fifteen days either consecutively or at intervals being either natural days or ecclesiastical days that is to say from the first vespers of one day to the twilight of the following the basilicas of st peter st paul st john lateran and st mary major and that those resident out of rome shall similarly visit during fifteen days either consecutive or non-consecutive days as above mentioned the cathedral or greater church and three other churches of the same city or place or of its suburbs which shall be appointed for that purpose by the ordinaries of those places or by their vicars or other representatives so soon as these our letters apostolic shall have been brought to their knowledge and there shall piously pour forth their prayers for the prosperity and exaltation of the catholic church and of this apostolic see for the extirpation of heresies and for the conversion of all sinners for the peace and unity of all christian people and for our intention and we hereby permit that this indulgence be applicable by way of suffrage to the souls which being united to god by charity shall have departed this life and that it be available for them travellers by land and by sea as soon as they shall have reached their home or shall have stopped at any other place may validly gain the said indulgence according to the conditions prescribed above and by visiting the requisite number of times the cathedral or greater church or the parish church of their home or stopping place and we do by the tenor of these presents also grant and permit the aforesaid ordinaries of each place to dispense with the prescribed visits in the case of consecrated religious women and young girls and other women cloistered in convents or living in other houses of piety or in religious communities also to anchorites and hermits and all other laymen and ecclesiastics as well secular as regular confined in prison or prevented by bodily infirmity or by any other cause from performing the visits in the manner prescribed and also to dispense with communion in the case of children not yet admitted to their first communion and instead of those visits and of that sacramental communion to prescribe for such persons respectively either by themselves or by the regular heads or superiors of those persons of either sex or by prudent confessors other works of piety charity and religion moreover to chapters and congregations as well of seculars as of regulars to sodalities confraternities universities or colleges of whatever kind the members of which shall visit such churches processionally we do in like manner by the tenor of these presents concede and indulge that they may and can 
according to their own prudent discretion, reduce those visits to a lesser number. And moreover, to the said nuns and to their novices, we do grant license and faculty of confessing for the purpose aforesaid to such confessor as they themselves may prefer amongst those approved by the ordinary of the place where their convents are established and appointed to receive the confessions of nuns, and to all others of the faithful of either sex, as well lay people as secular ecclesiastics, and to the religious of every order, congregation, and institute whatsoever, we do concede license and faculty that they may, for the purpose aforesaid, choose to themselves any priest as confessor, either a secular or a regular, of any, even of a different order and institute, so that he may be a person whom the actual ordinaries in whose cities, dioceses, and territories such confessions are to be heard, shall have similarly approved for the purpose of hearing the confessions of lay persons. And with the same authority and the same bounty of apostolic liberality, we grant and concede to those confessors within the said space of the year on behalf of all those persons of both sexes who sincerely and seriously intend to gain this present jubilee and with that intention come to confession in order to fulfill the other necessary conditions the power and authority to absolve pro hoc vice and in foro conscientiae only imposing on them a salutary penance and the other requisite conditions from excommunication and from suspension and from other ecclesiastical sentences and from all censures whether canonically incurred or actually pronounced and inflicted by the judge for any cause whatsoever even in the cases reserved to the ordinaries of places and to us or to the apostolic see and also cases by special form reserved to certain authorities and to the sovereign pontiff or to the apostolic see and not understood as included in other grants how large soever they may have been as also all sins and transgressions however heinous and of however great enormity even those reserved to the said ordinaries as aforesaid and to us and to the apostolic see and moreover by the same authority and in the amplitude of apostolic benignity we give concession and indulgence to consecrate into other pious and salutary works any vows whatsoever, even those taken under oath and reserved to the apostolic see, always excepting vows of chastity, of religion, and of obligation which have been taken before a third person, and those which affect prejudicially a third person, as also those called penal vows or preservatives against sin unless the commutation for the time to come be adjudged to be a preservative against the commission of sin not less effectual than was the original matter of the vow and also validly to dispense jubilee penitents being in holy orders and even being regulars from occult irregularity contracted only in the exercise of those orders and from all inflictions by their superiors on account of the violation of censures only we do not however intend by these presents to grant dispensation from any other irregularity either occult or public or from any defect or disgrace, 
or any other incapacity or inability in whatever manner contracted or to grant any faculty of dispensing it to the aforesaid cases or of rehabilitating and of restoring to the original status even in foro conscientiae nor to derogate from the constitution published with opportune declarations by our predecessor benedict the fourteenth of happy memory and beginning sacramentum penitentiae under date the calends of june in the year of our lord's incarnation seventeen forty one being the first year of his pontificate nor lastly do we intend that these presents should or could be of any avail for such persons as have been by us and by the apostolic see or by any prelate or judge ecclesiastical by name excommunicated suspended or interdicted or in other way whatsoever declared or publicly denounced as having fallen under sentences and censures unless within the time of the year aforesaid they shall have made satisfaction and if need be shall have come to agreement with the parties in their case moreover if after the commencement of this jubilee any persons having the intention of gaining it shall have been prevented by death from fulfilling the prescribed number of visits we desiring graciously to favor their pious and prompt intention do will that they being truly penitent and having confessed their sins and received the holy communion shall participate in the aforesaid indulgence and remission just the same as if they had actually visited the said churches on the prescribed days but if any persons after having by virtue of these presents obtained absolutions from censures or commutations of vows or the dispensations aforesaid shall change that serious and sincere purpose also required for the gaining of the jubilee and consequently for the performance of the other works necessary for gaining it then although such persons can scarcely be deemed free from the guilt of sin in regard to this matter nevertheless we decree and declare that such absolutions commutations and dispensations obtained by them with the before-mentioned disposition do remain in force we also will and decree that the present letter shall be in all respects valid and in force and shall have and obtain their full effect wheresoever they shall be published and put in execution by the ordinaries of places and that they shall be fully available for all the faithful abiding in the favor and obedience of the apostolic see whether they reside in such places at the time of such publication or shall resort thither after a journey by sea or by land and this notwithstanding indulgences not to be granted ad instar and other apostolic constitutions and constitutions enacted in general provincial and synodal councils notwithstanding any ordinances and general or special reservations of absolutions or relaxations and of dispensations notwithstanding any oaths of the mendicant and military orders of every kind of congregations and of institutes notwithstanding any statutes confirmed by apostolic approval or in any other manner notwithstanding any laws usages customs privileges indults and letters apostolical granted to the same orders notwithstanding especially 
those in which it is expressly forbidden to the members of any such order or congregation or institute to make their confession to a priest not a member of their own religious body and although to effect a valid derogation of all these things and of their whole tenors there ought to be made a special specific express and individual mention of them or some other precise form ought to be employed for that purpose we nevertheless hold all such tenors as recited all necessary forms as exactly observed pro hoc vice only and for the purposes aforesaid only we do make full derogation all things whatsoever to the contrary notwithstanding but while we in the discharge of our apostolic office and according to the solicitude with which we must feel towards the universal flock of christ propose this salutary opportunity of remission and of obtaining grace we must also address all patriarchs primates archbishops bishops and others ordinaries of places prelates or others having local ordinary jurisdiction in default of bishops or of prelates exercising authority regularly and being in favour and communion with the apostolic see earnestly beseeching and imploring them in the name of our lord jesus christ the prince of all pastors that they would announce this great benefit to the people committed to their charge and would exert themselves to the utmost that all the faithful may be reconciled to god by penance and may turn the grace of the jubilee to the profit and advantage of their own souls it will therefore be your principal care venerable brethren first by public prayers to implore the mercy of god to the end that he would pour his light and grace into the minds of all and then with suitable instructions and admonitions to lead the christian people to become partakers of the fruits of the jubilee and correctly to understand what is the power and nature of the christian jubilee to the gain and advantage of souls for as much as in it in a spiritual manner by the power of christ our lord all those good things are abundantly accomplished which the old law the messenger of things to come brought every fiftieth year to the jewish people at the same time let it be fittingly explained what is the effect of an indulgence and what all those things are which must be performed in order to the beneficial confession of sins and the holy reception of the sacrament of the eucharist and since not only the example but also the labors of the church's ministry are very greatly needed in order that the desired fruit of sanctification may be borne by the people of god do you venerable brethren now at this time especially not neglect to kindle with energy the zeal of your priests and it would conduce very much to the general good if they whenever it is possible would set the christian people an example of piety and religion and by the help of spiritual exercises would renew the spirit of their holy calling so that thereafter they may more profit to the saving of souls they may engage in the discharge of their pastoral duties and in the holding of missions amongst the people great are the evils of this present age much reparation must be made for them and much is the good that remains to be done taken then the sword of the spirit which is the word of god bestow all your care that your people may be led to detest the enormous crime of blasphemy 
by which there is nothing so sacred but at the present time it is outraged and that your people may know and do their duty in keeping holy the festival days and in observing the laws of fasting and abstinence according to the precepts of god's church and may thus escape the punishments which the neglect of these things has called down upon countries and let your zeal and earnestness be equally vigilant and unfailing in upholding the discipline of the clergy and in providing for the right education of clerics and by every means in your power come to the rescue of imperiled youth as you well know how great are the dangers to which it is exposed and how terrible is the ruin to which it is liable so bitter was this species of mischief to the heart of our divine redeemer that he said whosoever shall scandalize one of these little ones that believe in me it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea st mark chapter nine verse forty one and nothing is more worthy of the season of the holy jubilee than that works of all kinds of charity should be carried out more zealously than common and therefore it will be befitting your zeal venerable brethren to promote the relief of the poor so that sins may be redeemed by almsgiving the numerous advantages of which are set forth in holy scripture and to the end that fruits of charity may be permanent and become more firmly established it will be very opportune for charitable aid to be contributed towards the support or formation of those pious institutes which are deemed at this season to conduce in the greatest degree to the benefit of souls and bodies if the intentions and earnest exertions of you all are concentrated on these objects the certain result must be that christ's kingdom and his justice will receive great advancement and heaven in its mercy will in this acceptable time in these days of salvation pour forth great abundance of heavenly gifts upon the children of predilection in conclusion we direct our words to all the children of the catholic church without exception and we do with fatherly affection exhort you collectively and individually so to avail yourselves of the opportunity afforded by this jubilee for obtaining the forgiveness of your sins as if you were sincere and earnest in the work of your own salvation now if ever it is absolutely necessary dearly beloved children to cleanse your conscience from dead works to sacrifice the sacrifices of righteousness to bring forth the fruits worthy of penance and to sow in tears that we may reap in joy god's majesty intimates clearly enough what he requires of us for as much as now for a long while the reason of our wickedness we have lain under his upbraiding under the breathing of the breath of his anger now therefore as men are wont whenever they are in any very great need to send ambassadors to neighboring nations to ask for succor let us do better let us send an embassy to god let us implore his succor let us betake ourselves to him with our whole heart in prayer in fasting and in almsgiving for by how much god is nearer to us by so much are our enemies driven the farther off from us 
St. Maximus Tarinensis, Homily 91. But above all things, listen ye to the apostolic voice, for we are ambassadors to you from Christ. You who labor and are heavy laden, who have erred from the way of salvation, and are bowed down under the yoke of evil passions and of the devil's slavery. Do not despise the riches of the goodness and the patience and long-suffering of God. And while such abundant and easy means are afforded you of obtaining salvation, do not by your obstinacy render yourselves inexcusable before god your judge do not treasure up to yourselves wrath against the day of wrath and of the revelation of the just judgment of god return therefore ye backsliders to your own heart be reconciled to god the world is passing away and its concupiscence cast away the works of darkness put on the armor of light cease to be the enemies of your own souls that you may secure for them peace in this world and in the world to come the eternal recompense of the just such is our prayer such are the things for which we shall not cease to implore the lord most merciful and all the children of the catholic church being united with us in these prayers we are sure that we shall obtain all these good things from the father of mercies meanwhile let the apostolic benediction which with great love and from our inmost heart we now in the lord impart to you all venerable brethren and to you beloved sons and to all members of the catholic church be an earnest of all graces and all heavenly gifts conducing to a happy and salutary result of this holy work given at rome at st peter's the twenty-fourth day of december in the year eighteen seventy four being the twenty-ninth year of our pontificate pope pius the ninth end of encyclical letter gravibus ecclesiae the jubilee of eighteen seventy five by pope pius the ninth encyclical letter quod nunquam on the church in prussia by pope pius the ninth encyclical of his holiness to the prussian episcopate to our venerable brethren the archbishops and bishops of prussia pious pope the ninth venerable brethren health and apostolical benediction remembering as we do the stipulations concluded between this apostolic see and the prussian government in the twenty-first year of the present century for the benefit and welfare of the catholic cause we should never have thought possible that which has actually and most lamentably come to pass in your country venerable brethren to that repose and peace which a church of god was enjoying amongst you there has succeeded a grievous and unlooked-for tempest but the other day there were proclaimed laws militating against the rights of the church and inflicting by their operation severe punishments on many of her faithful and conscientious servants both amongst the clergy and lady to those laws there have since been added others tending to the total overthrow of the church's divine constitution and the destruction of the sacred rights of the episcopate for these laws attribute to lay magistrates the power of depriving the bishops and other ecclesiastical authorities of their dignity and of their episcopal jurisdiction these laws have moreover placed numerous and enormous difficulties in the way of those called to exercise lawful authority pending the absence of the pastors who rule the flocks these laws empower the chapters of the metropolitan churches 
Contrary to the canon law to elect vicars capitular at the time when the see is not vacant. To mention no other points, do not these laws authorize even the mayors of towns to appoint in the place of bishops men who are not even Catholics, and to confer upon such men ecclesiastical property destined for the support of the clergy and of the churches? Unhappily you, venerable brethren, know but too well the mischief, the vexations, and evil treatment occasioned by these laws themselves and by the manner of their execution. We say no more on the subject, because we are unwilling to augment the grief of you all by reminding you of these sad events. But we are unable to keep silence on the subject of the evils that have afflicted the dioceses of Fosen-Yesen and Paderborn. Our venerable brethren, Mitislas, Archbishop of Posen and Yesen, and Conrad, Bishop of Paderborn, are still most unjustly declared to have forfeited their sees and are deprived of their episcopal authority. Their dioceses, too, remain bereft of the blessed direction of their excellent pastors and are overwhelmed with distress and trouble. It is true, indeed, that when we remember the words of our Lord, we ought rather to congratulate than to pity those two venerable brethren just named. Blessed shall you be when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. St. Luke chapter 6, verse 22. Those venerable brethren have not been terrified at the imminent danger, nor at the punishments with which they were threatened. Not only have they defended the church's rights, and caused her precepts to be respected, but they in common with the other pastors of your country have held it an honor to receive an unjust judgment and to allow themselves to be punished with penalties appropriate only to criminals. Thereby they have afforded the most brilliant example of virtue and have given edification to the whole church. Although we owe to them rather our loudest praises than tears of pity, nevertheless the lowering of the episcopal dignity, the blows struck at the liberty and at the rights of the church, the persecutions inflicted on the bishops above named and on all their colleagues, require that in virtue of our apostolic power given to us by God, we should raise our voice in denunciation of those laws and against the bad actions which they have done and which they are causing to be done, and that we should defend against impious violence with all energy and the divine authority the liberty of the church now trodden underfoot. In fulfillment of the duty of this apostolic see, we do publicly declare by this present encyclical to all whom it may concern, as also to the whole Catholic world, that these laws are null, because they are utterly opposed to the divine constitution of the Church. For it is to the men of power of this world that the Lord has made subject the bishops of his Church in all that concerns his sacred service, but to Peter, to whom he committed his sheep and lambs, the Gospel of St. John, chapter 21, verses 16 and 17. Therefore, no temporal power, however exalted, has the right to despoil of their episcopal dignity those who have been appointed by the Holy Ghost to govern the Church. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 28. To this sad state of things must be added the following fact, which is unworthy of a noble nation, and which, as we may well expect, will be, even by non-Catholics, who are yet impartial observers of events. These laws are excessively harsh and threaten with the severest punishments those who disobey them. They have the armed forces on their side, and they place peaceable and inoffensive citizens in the unhappy and pitiable situation of men who are oppressed by irresistible power, merely because their conscience bids them to resist these laws. One would say that such laws are made for slaves constrained to obey by terror, not for free citizens, of whom may rightly be expected a reasonable obedience. From what we have now said, it must not be imagined that those are excusable who, through fear, obey man rather than God. But especially guilty are the sacrilegious men who dare to take possession of churches and to perform ministrations therein relying on the support of the secular arm. Such persons shall not escape the justice of God. On the contrary, 
We do hereby declare that all those sacrilegious persons and all who shall in time to come commit similar crimes by usurping an ecclesiastical mission shall in virtue of the canon law be smitten de facto and de jure with the greater excommunication. We exhort the pious faithful not to assist at any mass celebrated by those men, nor to participate in the administration of any sacrament by them, and to avoid their company and their conversation to the end that the evil leaven may not spoil the good peace. Amidst these tribulations, your courage and perseverance have afforded us great consolation under our sorrow. The rest of the clergy and the faithful have imitated you, venerable brethren, in the painful conflict in which you are engaged. So great has been their firmness in safeguarding Catholic rights and duties. So praiseworthy has been the conduct of each one that they have drawn upon themselves the eyes of all men, even of those who are most remote, and have won their admiration. How could it be otherwise? As great as is the misfortune of soldiers who have lost their commander, so great is the glory of that bishop who sets an example to his brethren in the faith. Alas that we are unable to afford you some alleviations in your troubles, but renewing and affirming once more our protest against all that is being done contrary to the constitution of god's church and to her rights protesting also against the violence so unjustly resorted to in your regard we assure you that our counsel and our instructions suited to the circumstances shall never be denied you let those who are your enemies know that you commit no offence against royal authority and do nothing to its prejudice when you refuse to render to Caesar that which is God's, for it is written, We ought to obey God, rather man. Let them know that every one of you is resolved to pay tribute to Caesar, and to obey him in all things appertaining to the civil government, and that not by constraint, but for your conscience's sake. Therefore, be of good cheer. Go on as you have hitherto done, fulfilling all your duties and obeying the law of God, and great shall be your reward because you shall have exercised patience and been unwearied in suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. Look unto him who has gone before you in tribulation far greater even than those which you have endured, and who was made subject to the pain of death, an ignominious and cruel death, in order that those who believe on him might learn to shun the favors of this world, and not to be dismayed at its terrors, to love tribulations for the love of the truth, and to fear and fly from the allurements of the earth. He it is who has placed you in the front of the battle, and he will grant you the strength that you need for the conflict. In him we place all our hopes. Let us submit to his will and implore his mercy. You see that what he foretold has already come to pass. Then trust in him. He will give you all that he has promised. In the world ye shall have tribulations, but I have overcome the world. With faith in that victory to come, we humbly pray the Holy Ghost to grant you his peace and grace. In token of our special favor, we grant you with all our heart, and to the whole of your clergy, and all the faithful under your charge, our apostolic benediction. Given at Rome at St. Peter's, the 5th day of February, in the year 1875, and of our pontificate, the 29th, Pius Pope IX. End of Encyclical Letter Quod Nunquam on the Church in Prussia by Pope Pius IX